Hippolyta disturbs the universe. Right there's your problem. This teleporter isn't plugged in. Orothea blew. Jupiter was up. Hippolyta squatted in a snow-covered pasture, distracting herself from the cold by picking up the bright dot between the constellations of Cancer and Gemini. Mars was up too, she knew, in Aquarius, near the western horizon, though hidden from her by the wooded hillside at her back. Just as well. She wouldn't want the Martians to see her like this. Back in the car, she sat with a heater running and flipped through issue number 11 of the interplanetary adventures of Orithea Blue. Horace had created the comic after Hippolyta suggested that it might be nice to read a science fiction story about a woman for a change. Orithea Blue, graduate of the Howard Astro Technical College, class of 2001, and the solar system's best troubleshooter, zipped from planet to planet in her trusty Buick space wagon. Called in to repair faulty telescopes or malfunctioning computers, she inevitably found bigger problems, unrest between the fire and shadow tribes of Mercury, political intrigue on the moons of Saturn, a cousin of the Loch Ness Monster, rampaging in Mars's Grand Canal. In this latest issue, Orothea, headed home to Earth for the holidays, decided to stop at the Marshall Fields on Ceres to do some last-minute Christmas shopping for her son. But Megajoule, the robot overlord of Titan, still smarting from the defeat Orothea dealt him in issue number seven, sent his minions to ambush her. A wild chase through the asteroid belt ensued, in which the question was not, will Orothea survive? She was a crack space pilot, skilled at thinking in three dimensions, while Megajoule's robots could scarcely tell left from right. But will she get to the store before the toy department closes? Hippolyta had a good chuckle over one page, devoted entirely to a close-up of Orothea's shopping list. Whatever else might change in the future, the tastes of twelve-year-old boys were seemingly immutable. Who'd have guessed they'd still have matchbox cars in the twenty-first century? Well, she thought, Horace has been good this year, and she still had a few days to make his Christmas wishes come true. Hers first, though. Setting the comic aside, she picked up the other book from the passenger seat, this one titled A Survey of Astronomical Observatories of North America. Hippolyte had found it during her last visit to the Winthrop House. She'd been in the orrery room, about to flip the switch that started the planets turning, when a hidden drawer in the orrery's base had sprung open. Most of the observatories in the survey were familiar to her. But at the back of the book, Hippolyta discovered a handwritten addendum. Hiram Winthrop Observatory, Warlock Hill, Wisconsin. Underneath this was a set of 64 three-digit numbers, neatly arrayed in eight rows of eight. Beneath that was the legend T. Hiram. In addition to the survey, the hidden drawer contained a pair of keys. One looked like a typical house key, but the other was rod-shaped, about six inches long with a loop at one end. Coincidentally, a lot like the key Orothea Blue used in the ignition of her space wagon, Hippolyta showed the book and the keys to Letitia and asked if she could take them. You planning on driving out to Wisconsin? Letitia said. I'm going to Minneapolis next week, said Hippolyta, but I could make a detour on my way back. Letitia cocked her head to one side and appeared to think it over. Hippolyta heard a knock under the floor. Yeah, okay, Letitia said. But you be careful, she added. It might have been Mr. Winthrop's observatory when they built it, but God knows who they've got running it now. I'll be careful, Hippolyta promised. Her father had introduced her to astronomy. He hadn't meant to. When he'd brought home the telescope in December of 1928, a Christmas present to himself, he justified the expense by claiming it was really for Hippolyta's brother, Apollo, to get him excited about science and boost his poor grades. But Apollo's only interest in the sky was that balls sometimes fell out of it. Nine-year-old Hippolyta stepped up. She started following her father to the roof of their Harlem apartment building and accompanying him on longer expeditions to the countryside. The latter took place about once a month. He'd borrow a car from a friend and they'd drive 50 miles upstate to a small farm owned by another friend, Mr. Hill, a Negro so light-skinned he was practically white. Arriving at the farmhouse after dark, they'd say hello to Mr. Hill and his wife Gretchen, and then after a brief chat and maybe some pie, the Hills would go to bed 
and Hippolyta and her father would go out into the fields. There, away from the city's lights, she got her first look at the true night sky. Her father would aim the telescope, while Hippolyta consulted an ephemeris, calling out directions to whatever celestial object they had chosen as their quarry. Mars was her father's favorite. He told her about Percival Lowell, a white man from Boston who become convinced that the lines he saw on Mars's surface were canals. Lowell's fellow astronomers had been skeptical, but he'd inspired more than a few science fiction writers, and Hippolyta's father's sympathies lay with the writers. Unfortunately, their little two-inch aperture telescope wasn't powerful enough for him to see the canals for himself. He'd stare at the featureless red disk it showed him and try to make lines appear through sheer force of will, which was maybe not so different from what Lowell had done all the while speculating aloud about Martian stargazers who might be looking back at him. Hippolyta was more intrigued by Lowell's other astronomical obsession. Mysterious disturbances in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune had led astronomers to posit the existence of a trans-Neptunian body. Lowell had searched for the so-called Planet X until his death, but it remained undiscovered. Hippolyta decided that she would find Planet X. Her father indulged her letting her aim her telescope at random patches of sky, like a fisherman casting for a minnow in a vast ocean. It was hopeless, of course. As she learned at the library, planet hunting required specialized equipment. To track down Planet X, she'd need not just a bigger telescope, but one that could take photographs, and another device, called a blink comparator, that could flip between photos of the same star field taken on different nights to reveal whether anything moved. Lacking the money to buy these things, or the wherewithal to build them, Hippolyta's only recourse was to become a professional astronomer, which she assumed was a reasonable goal. Compared to her brother's intention to be the first Negro pitcher for the Yankees, it wasn't even all that ambitious. In October, the stock market crashed. By December, her father's friend had lost his job and sold his car, ending their trips upstate. Hippolyta continued to stargaze from the roof, but she often did so alone. Her father was having his own job troubles and had to hustle extra hours to make ends meet. And then, on March 14, 1930, the morning paper brought word that Clyde Tombaugh, a junior astronomer at the Lowell Observatory in Arizona, had found Planet X. Hippolyta was torn between excitement and disappointment, but as the news sank in, the latter emotion predominated. Her father did what he could to console her. Paper says they don't have a name for it yet, he pointed out. I bet they'd be open to suggestions. Hippolyta's mother, making oatmeal at the stove, perked up at this. Never much given to flights of fancy, since the stock market crash, she'd been trying extra hard to inculcate a more practical outlook in her children. Bernard, she warned. Her husband ignored her. You could write a letter to the observatory, he told Hippolyta. Like any would-be discoverer, Hippolyte had, of course, given plenty of thought to what her planet's name should be. In keeping with convention, it should be drawn from classical mythology. And it should connote darkness and cold and remoteness. After much consideration, she narrowed it down to two possibilities. Pluto, god of the underworld, and Persephone, his queen. She wanted to choose Persephone because it seemed unfair that Venus should be the only girl planet but the name was less suitable otherwise. Persephone, born a nature goddess, had lived in warmth and light until Pluto raptured her down into Hades, and even then she spent only part of each year in the underworld, whereas Pluto, like Planet X, resided always in darkness and always had. Pluto, then. Pluto was the name. Hippolyta wanted to stay home from school to write her letter, but her mother wouldn't hear of it. Instead. She wrote it in class that day. Three hundred words on why Planet X should be called Pluto. She begged an envelope from the school office and addressed it to Mr. Clyde Tombaugh, care of the Lowell Observatory, Flagstaff, Arizona. Her father was waiting for her outside the school after last bell. Before Hippolyta could ask why he wasn't at work, he said, Have you got it? She nodded and showed him the letter. We won't tell your mother about this, all right? She nodded again and took his hand, and they walked together to the post office. Two more months passed. Her father got a new job across the river in Hoboken, 
from which he returned home only on the weekends, and sometimes not even then. Her mother remained in Harlem, but started leaving the apartment earlier and coming home later. Apollo made Apollo's breakfast and saw her off to school. They no longer got the morning paper, so Hippolyta was at the library when she first read the news that Planet X had been given its official name. When she saw what the name was, she let out a whoop that got her shushed by two librarians. But her elation was short-lived. The newspaper article gave credit for the name not to Hippolyta Green of Harlem, but to Venetia Burney of Oxford, England. Hippolyta was puzzled. She'd known other people would be writing to the observatory, and because Pluto was a logical name, it wasn't surprising that someone else had thought of it too. But England? How had a letter sent from across the Atlantic Ocean reached Arizona before one mailed from New York City? Then, reading on, she understood. Venetia Burney wasn't just any girl. Her great-uncle Henry Madden was the Eton College professor who'd named the moons of Mars, and her grandfather, Falconer Madden, was the former head of Oxford's Bodleian Library. It was Falconer who'd arranged to have Anisha's suggestion forwarded to the Lowell Observatory. By telegram. By telegram. So Hippolyta's effort had been for nothing. Despite her haste, her letter had probably still been sitting in the Harlem post office when Venetia's telegram, which she hadn't even written herself, had jumped to the head of the line. Hippolyta tried to focus on the one bit of good news. According to astronomers' preliminary calculations, the existence of Pluto still did not fully account for the irregularities in the orbits of Uranus and Neptune, which meant there could be other trans-Neptunian bodies waiting to be discovered, waiting to be named. She maintained her composure until late that evening, when her mother returned home from work. Hippolyta's mother had forgotten all about Planet X, but Hippolyta still remembered her skepticism about the letter-writing idea, and the sudden thought of that, and of what her mother might say now. What did you expect to happen? Open the floodgates. Hippolyta started bawling. Her mother, barely through the apartment door, and not having spoken a word yet, looked over in alarm. What? she said. What's wrong? For several minutes, Hippolyta didn't answer, only wept while her mother held her and stroked her hair. Finally, Hippolyta choked out a few words between sobs. I'm going to find the next one. I'm going to. All right, baby, her mother said, still mystified. You'll find the next one. Of course you will. Warlock Hill was located in the rugged expanse of forest and farmland between La Crosse and Madison, outside the village of Amesboro. Hippolyta passed through Amesboro around ten o'clock and found most of the villagers asleep. The only building with lights still on was one that, from the sign above the door, she took to be a white Freemason's temple. The turnoff for Warlock Hill was marked private, the point underscored by a chain stretched across the access road. Beyond the chain, the road was unplowed, but a walking path had been shoveled out of the snow. Hippolyta pulled her roadmaster in beside the Chevrolet truck already parked there. She took the survey and the keys and reached into the glove box for a flashlight and the thirty-eight George insisted she bring with her on her cross-country expeditions. She left Orothea Blue on the passenger seat to mine the car. Outside, she stood looking up, savoring the moonless night. Rather than turn on the flashlight, she let her eyes adjust and then stepped over the chain and began to follow the path by the glow of the Milky Way. The road curved, and she saw a wooden shack up ahead, spilling lamplight onto the snow. She kept walking, the crunch of her bootsteps masked by the sound of a nearby stream, until she could see in through the shack's front window. There were two white men inside, sitting in chairs drawn up to a pot-bellied stove, while a kerosene lantern and an empty gin bottle shared the table in the corner behind them. The men didn't look like astronomers. Farmers, maybe, recruited in this off-season to serve as night watchmen. Poor ones, both asleep, one with his head tilted so far back she could see nothing but beard stubble, the other hunched forward, chin on chest and eyes closed, on the verge of toppling face first into the stove. Hippolyta decided not to disturb them. Just a quick look around, she told herself, fingering the keys in her pocket, in and out while the country folk were abed and then home to the city with no one the wiser. 
she started walking again, before she could lose her nerve. The first time Hippolyta visited an observatory, uninvited in the middle of the night, was at Swarthmore College in 1938. She wasn't a student. Even if there had been money for college, majoring in astronomy would not have been a practical option. For a while, she tended a fantasy of becoming an astronomer without a college degree. Clyde Tombaugh had done that, winning his job at the Lowell Observatory on the strength of his amateur observations of Mars and Jupiter. But when she confided her ambition to a guide at the Hayden Planetarium, he dismissed it with four simple words. You are a negress, he said. Hippolyta's nine-year-old self wouldn't have taken no for an answer, but with adolescence, she'd undergone a drastic change. She'd sprouted up seemingly overnight, becoming a giantess as well as a negress, and the increase in mass had brought a corresponding increase in inertia, a willingness to accept often without protest, the limits placed upon her. Visiting relatives commented on how withdrawn Hippolyta had become, though they guessed wrong about the cause, her grandmothers and aunts muttering worriedly about boy trouble. Hippolyta in those days might have been game for some boy trouble, might have done something very stupid, but the boys she knew were intimidated by her size and either mocked or ignored her. One other side effect of her growth spurt was that she learned how to sew. What mechanical talent she had, a talent that in another life might have been applied to grinding telescope lenses, was directed, in this one, to making clothes that would fit her. After Hippolyta finished high school, her mother sent her to Washington, D.C., to work in her Uncle Jasper's tailor shop. Jasper had a Ford Phaeton that he insisted Hippolyta learn to drive, so that she could run errands for him. At first, she went along with this, as she did with everything else, but once she got out on the open road, she realized driving was something she actually enjoyed, something she might even develop a passion for. In short order, Hippolyta had her license, and after proving she could be trusted behind the wheel alone, she began prevailing on her uncle to lend her the car for personal use as well, which he agreed to do, provided she paid for her own gas. Hippolyta ended up spending a lot of money on gasoline. One February weekend, she drove up to see her parents, Hippolyta's father was still in Hoboken, working as a chauffeur for a man named Arnold Silberstein. Mr. Silberstein's daughter, Myrna, had just started her second semester at Swarthmore, and there was a box of books she'd forgotten to take with her. Mr. Silberstein had been planning to have Mr. Green drive the box down, but on hearing that Hippolyta would soon be headed back south, he asked if she wouldn't mind making the delivery instead. Hippolyta arrived at the campus well after dark. She left the books with a matron at Myrna's dormitory and was walking back to the car when she spied the dome of Swarthmore's Sprawl Observatory. She changed course. At first, she just meant to get a closer look at the outside of the building, but upon finding the entryway open and unguarded, she went inside. She climbed the stairs to the second floor and went down a hall to a door marked Stellar Observation. From within came the sound of a motor and the rumble of the dome rotating. She was trying to work up the courage to knock when the door opened on its own. A gangly white boy in horn-rimmed glasses looked out, seeming bemused to find her there. Delbert Shaughnessy, he said. Excuse me? Delbert Shaughnessy, the boy said. Our new lab partner. You're not him? Hippolyta just stared until the boy stopped grinning and blushed with embarrassment. Sorry he said. That was rude. I'm Tom. Tom Appleton. Hippolyta Green, Hippolyta said. Hello, Hippolyta. Are you here to see the telescope? I'd like to, she said cautiously, not convinced he was done teasing her. If, if it's not against the rules. It probably is, Tom Appleton said. But I won't tell if you won't. You picked a good night for it, he added, confiding. We're looking at Pluto. In a heartbeat, she was nine years old again. Pluto? Really? Looking for it, I should say. We're having trouble finding it. That's why I was hoping you were Delbert. Cancer, Hippolyta told him. Pluto is in cancer. It's supposed to be, he agreed, and stepped back smiling. Come in, please. Looking over his shoulder at two other boys, he called out, Arthur, Eugene, good news, the cavalry is here. Hippolyta would never forget that night, 
sifting the heavens for Pluto, the great difficulty in finding it lay in knowing that you had done so, knowing which of the faint points of light in the target star field was not a star, but a world, a frozen orb reflecting the sun's rays. It took multiple sessions with a blank comparator and some confused discussion with her new colleagues. I'm pretty sure it's that one. That one. No, that one. But, in the end, Hippolyta was able to look through the telescope and say with confidence, Hello, Planet X. Nice to finally meet you. It was a magical moment. And in the comic book version of Hippolyta's life, it changed everything. Reality was different, of course. When, a month later, she contrived to return to Swarthmore, she found the doors of the observatory building locked, and before she could track down Tom Appleton, whose phone number she'd been too shy to ask for, she was stopped by a campus security guard who threatened to have her arrested for trespassing. So that was that. Hippolyta went back to her uncle's tailor shop, where she would work for several more years, and then came George, and Horace, and the rest of her life. She continued to look at the stars, most often through the windshield of a car, but it would be a long time before she saw Pluto again. Then, just a couple of years ago, she'd gone out to California on a research trip for the Safe Negro Travel Guide and found herself adrift in the foothills of the Palomar. The check-in clerk at the motel where she'd planned to spend the night said he had no room for her. He'd left the vacancy light on by mistake. The clerk at the motel across the road professed a similar oversight. Hippolyta was debating whether to sleep in her car or just push on to San Diego when she saw a sign for the Palomar Observatory. Remembering Tom Appleton for the first time in ages, she got the crazy idea to drive up and see whether Palomar's astronomers needed any help and surprised herself by acting on it. Halfway up the mountain, she encountered a stranded astrophysicist, Yervant Azarian, whose own car had developed carburetor trouble. He accepted Hippolyta's offer of a ride and proceeded to test her bona fides, asking if she could name the eleven moons of Jupiter in the order they'd been discovered. Hippolyta replied that it was a trick question. A twelfth Jovian moon, still unnamed, had been discovered just months before by the Mount Wilson Observatory. Azarian was satisfied. He escorted Hippolyta into the dome, where the world's largest telescope was kept, and allowed her a glimpse of that night's quarry, Bode's Nebula. Since then, Hippolyta had made a hobby, during her travels, of staging impromptu visits to other observatories she happened to be in the vicinity of. She wasn't always welcomed. The guards at Mount Wilson had turned her away twice, but she hadn't been arrested, and none of the astronomers she'd met had called her a negress. She hadn't been to the Lowell Observatory yet. She told herself she was saving it for a special occasion. Really, she was building up her courage, and in the meantime, she'd begun cultivating another fantasy, that these observatory visits weren't just whimsical side trips, but steps on a path leading towards... Well, she wasn't sure exactly. But something. A wanderer in darkness, she followed an eccentric orbit, each new disturbance angling her closer to some long-awaited rendezvous. She could only hope that when the moment came, she'd be wise enough to know it and brave enough to act. A footbridge took her across the stream, and then she was climbing Warlock Hill. She had to use her flashlight here. Trees blocked the stars, and the field stones set into the hillside to serve as steps were slick and uneven. She counted sixty-four stones before emerging onto the hilltop, a flat, round clearing with a dome at its center. A concrete dome. Hippolyta's brow furrowed as the flashlight beam played over the structure. She could see no opening through which a telescope might be aimed, nor any means by which the dome could be rotated. Finding the way in was easy enough, as here, too, a path had been shoveled through the snow. She followed it clockwise around the dome to where a door was set into the concrete. Hippolyta used the first of her keys. She shone her flashlight inside and saw a short flight of concrete steps leading up to a metal walkway with handrails. A power switch was mounted just inside the doorway. The walkway was raised above a pool of shiny black liquid that filled the base of the dome. Lights ringed the pool, illuminating the dome's interior surface, which was as smooth and blank as its exterior. The walkway led to a central platform with some sort of control console. Beyond the platform 
The walkway continued, extending about three-quarters of the way across. Fixed to the end of it was a vertical rectangular frame that seemed to have been coated with the same dark shiny fluid that was in the pool. Hippolytus stepped carefully along the walkway. She didn't know what the substance in the pool was. Her frozen nose could detect no odor, chemical or otherwise, but she guessed it would not be good for swimming in. She examined the console. Arrayed on its face, in eight rows of eight, were sixty-four windows, each displaying the number 001, the individual digits stamped onto separate metal reels. To the right of the number array were a small round hole and a single large button. Hippolyta tried pressing the button first. The console emitted a loud, sterile click, but nothing else happened. She got out the rod-shaped key and inserted it into the hole. It fit perfectly. She slotted it all the way home. The lights flickered. From beneath the platform came a whir of machinery starting up, the sound broadening and deepening to a bass hum that produced a standing wave on the surface of the pool. Gradually, the hum faded, settling into a barely audible register. The lights flickered again and dimmed, and then the whole dome just disappeared, leaving Hippolyta exposed on the open hilltop. No, the dome was still there. What she was seeing was a projection, a live panorama from outside. There was Jupiter, and there was the path she trod through the snow. She turned her attention back to the console. A red glow emanated from around and between the metal reels, illuminating the numbers. Hippolyta focused on the lower rightmost window in the array. She touched a finger to the one, giving it a light downward nudge. The reel ticked over to two. She looked up. The view was unchanged. She thought, now try the button. This time when she pressed it, there was a deep thrum of vibration from beneath the pool. The dome went black, and for a moment she could see nothing but the red glow from the console. Then the projection came back up, and she found herself in a starry void. The hilltop had vanished. Hippolyta craned her head around, looking for familiar constellations and not finding any. Two stars did stand out, not because she recognized them, but because they were close enough to appear to her as tiny disks, one blue, one orange, set like mismatched eyes just a few degrees apart. Twin stars. Near the base of the dome was a third object, a small, irregularly shaped asteroid, tumbling slowly but visibly, each moment's rotation exposing a new portion of its surface to the light of the twin stars. Hippolyta laughed and clapped her hands. If only her father could see this. She turned again to the console, calculating. If each of the 64 number settings went from 000 to 999, that would put the sum total of possible combinations at 10 to the 192nd power. Hippolyta tried to think what word, ending in Ilion, you'd use to describe that figure, came up with 60 trillion and burst out laughing again. Sixty trillion celestial panoramas. But they couldn't really all be different. Could they? Hippolyta reached out and ticked the two in the lower right window over to three. Then, seized by a giddy abandon, she began changing numbers at random. She pressed the button again, and... Thrum! She was skimming an ocean of blue clouds, mountainous azure thunderheads rising all around her, while above... Through a thinner haze, she glimpsed another unfamiliar sun and the broad bands of a ring encircling the planet. It was beautiful. It was also frightening, especially the view straight ahead and down, the frame at the walkway's end, now looking very much like a doorway through which she might dive or fall into a turbulent sea whose depths were lit by titanic lightning flashes. In a sudden terror of vertigo, Hippolyta reached for the console array, changed a single number, and hit the button again. Thrum! Bright light. A scorched landscape of black rock was tinged red by an enormous sun cresting the horizon in front of her. Hippolyta put up a hand to shield her eyes, then spread her fingers to peer at an optical illusion. The edge of the sun intersected the doorframe at the end of the walkway, highlighting a discontinuity in the image.
the portion of the projection that fell within the frame appeared to be closer somehow. Hippolyta shivered, the winter air inside the dome conflicting with the hellish vision that surrounded her. She thought about the snow lying on the ground outside and asked herself what would happen if she were to toss a snowball through that open frame. Would it splatter against the wall of the dome, spoiling the illusion? Or would it flash into steam as it encountered the heat of an alien star? Interesting experiment. Hippolyta might even have tried it, if the next thought hadn't occurred to her. You don't open a doorway just to chuck out snowballs. Doors are for walking through, which implied a place to walk to, a destination where a human being could stand without asphyxiating or being turned into a charcoal briquette. Of course, with 60 trillion destinations to choose from, it could take an eternity of trial and error to find one that wouldn't kill you. Hippolyta would have liked nothing better than to stay here and sample those myriad worlds. But she didn't have much time, so she decided to cheat and look up the answer in the back of the book. Working quickly, she set the dials. She took a last look at the scorched planet of the Red Sun, about to be lost to her forever, she realized, since she had not copied its address down. Then she pressed the button. Thrum. Out of the momentary blackness, a great spiral galaxy appeared. It hung in a night sky before her and was reflected like a brilliant, many-armed moon in the surface of a dark ocean whose waters lapped the shore of a white sand beach. Hippolyta went to the end of the walkway and stood staring through the open frame. Then she leaned sideways, steadying herself against the handrail. No simple illusion, this. When she looked around the doorframe, she could see the unbroken panorama projected against the curb of the dome a few feet away. But when she looked through the frame, the beach was right there, and no mere projection, but a seemingly three-dimensional space into which a single step would carry her. Right there. And yet also, obviously, elsewhere. She could see the night surf breaking on the beach, but she couldn't hear it. The air she drew in and expelled visibly from her mouth was still Wisconsin air, winter air. The air on the beach. She couldn't say how she knew this, but felt certain it was so. The air on the beach would be warmer. She stretched out a hand. As it passed within the frame, she felt a tingling against her palm that quickly became unpleasant. She reached further, encountering increasing resistance and pain, and finally drew back, having meanwhile intuited a new piece of information. This doorway didn't allow half measures. You couldn't just stick a finger or a toe through. You had to commit. Step boldly. Sure, Hippolyta thought, glancing at the dark pool beneath the walkway. And the next thing that happens is you fall in the muck and probably break a leg in the bargain. Because it's a trick. It has to be. But I won't tell if you won't, she said, and stepped through the doorway. The air on the beach was warmer. The salt breeze blowing in over the gently plashing surf felt like late spring or early fall. The shoulder season, Hippolyta thought, tourist cabins would be a bargain, provided you could find someone to rent to you. She breathed deeply, the sea air differently scented than that of her native Atlantic, but containing sufficient oxygen. She didn't grow dizzy or faint. The sand felt strangely springy, Hippolyta looked down and bounced experimentally on the balls of her feet. It wasn't the sand, she realized. It was her. She was lighter. Not much. Unlike Orothea Blue on Mars or Ganymede, she did not go bounding into the air. Just enough to feel it in the tendons of her ankles as they flexed. Gravity turned down a notch. Smiling, Hippolyta stretched out her arms, went up on tiptoe, and executed a graceful half-pirouette. To face, behind her, a seven-by-three-foot rectangle cut out of the fabric of reality through which could be seen the chilly interior of the dome on Warlock Hill. The doorway on this end was framed by thin bars of light that cast a faint glow on the sand. She walked around it, curious to see what it looked like from the backside. Not like much. Though the glowing frame was visible from every angle, when viewed from behind, it was an empty frame. The same beach inside and outside the lines. She circled back around to the front again, watched Wisconsin rotate back in the view out of nowhere. 
Okay, she said, nodding. Next, she surveyed her wider surroundings. The beach fronted on a high rocky cliff, atop which Hippolyta could make out a line of trees, their leaves shining silver in the light from the galaxy. To her left, the cliff ran straight as far as she could see. The strip of beach in front of it, unbroken, save for a single boulder, a dark lump on the sand in the middle distance. But to her right, just a couple of hundred yards away, a ridge of rock extended finger-like from the cliff, forming a high promontory that cut down across the sand to the water. The side of the ridge was marked by a gray zigzag that registered instantly as a staircase, and up top, she could see two buildings. One, set back near where the ridge joined the cliff, appeared to be a single-story flat-roofed structure. The other, located at the very end of the promontory overlooking the water, was dome-shaped, and while it was difficult to make out details, Hippolyta would have sworn she detected the bulge of a telescope hatch. Just a quick look around, she thought. In and out. But what happens? Looking back through the doorway to Earth, she made herself ask the question, what happens if, while you're up here, somebody comes and turns the machine off? You wake up, she answered. Because this is a dream. Obviously. The warm sea breeze caressing her cheek, begged to differ on that point. She ignored it. The staircase bolted to the side of the ridge, was enclosed in metal bars, and there was a gate at the bottom. The gate wasn't locked, but the latch was a complicated affair, requiring two more or less human hands to operate. Wondering what sort of intruders this was meant to keep out, she recalled the ocean-dwelling squidmen of Europa from Orithia Blue No. 5. If it was squid men, Hippolyta thought, she should be okay. They respected pistol fire. A buzzer sounded on the ridge above her as she pulled the gate open. She stepped through quickly, shut the gate, and listened. Nothing now but the surf. Despite the reduced gravity, the steps rattled disconcertingly beneath her feet as she ascended. She sprinted up the last flight and stopped to catch her breath on the top landing. Now she could see the dome clearly. It was an observatory. She guessed the other building was a residence, a guest house for planet-hopping astrophysicists. There was no sign of life in either structure. To exit the top of the staircase, she had to pass through two more gates, set in opposite sides of a ten-foot-wide cage. This reminded Hippolyta of the booby-trapped airlock the Corsairs of Neptune had used to knock out Orthea Blue in issue number four. But she was well past the point of no return now, so she said a quick prayer and entered the cage. The inner gate wouldn't open. She'd bent to get a closer look at the latch when she heard crackling and felt invisible fingers teasing her hair. She looked up. Blue sparks were dancing around a series of coils suspended from the top of the cage. That can't be good, Hippolyta thought, and then her head filled up, appropriately enough, with stars. When Hippolyta came to, she was lying on a cot in a small lamp-lit room. Her first thought was that she was back in Wisconsin, in the guard shack. But the ceiling and walls that surrounded her were metal, not wood, and the figure sitting watch on her was a Negro woman with iron-gray hair and a face deeply seamed with wrinkles. The old woman had the survey in her lap, open to the page with the numbers, and she was holding Hippolytus 38. Eyes on the gun, Hippolyta sat up, she felt lightheaded, but there was no pain and no obvious bumps or bruises from the fall she must have taken. She swung her legs over the side of the cot. The old woman spoke. Stand up before I give you leave, and your brains will be all over that wall behind you. She said it calmly, not threatening, but as though making a simple observation about how the universe, this corner of it anyway, worked. All right, said Apollyta, and folded her hands in front of her. Who are you? My name's Hippolyta Berry. You work for him? Who? Hippolyta said. Winthrop. Hiram Winthrop. No, I... Don't you lie to me. The old woman snatched up the open book, presenting it face out like a warrant. This writing is in his hand. I don't know whose hand that is. I found the book in the Winthrop house, but... So you were in his house? So you work for him? No, Hippolyta said. It's called the Winthrop House, 
but Hiram Winthrop is dead. My friend Letitia Dandridge lives there now. It's her house. You're friends with a white woman named Letitia Dandridge? She's not a white woman. A colored woman owns the Winthrop house? And she sent you here? No one sent me. I came out to see the observatory on my own. Why? What would possess you to do that? She dropped the survey back into her lap and thrust the gun forward. I told you not to lie to me. Wait, said Hippolyta. Just wait. I can explain. Years ago, when I was a little girl, my father brought home a telescope. Well, the old woman said when Hippolyta had finished, I don't suppose anyone would make up a tale like that. You got one thing wrong, though. Mr. Winthrop did send you. No, I told you he's dead. Yeah, I got that. But I'm talking about his spirit. Hippolyta must have looked skeptical, for the old woman suddenly narrowed her eyes. Oh, what? You're too smart to believe in ghosts? Flying across the universe, though, that's logical. I'll tell you something else, too. You're too late again. This planet? Mr. Winthrop already named it. Hippolyta glanced at the book, feeling a sudden, absurd pang of disappointment. T. Hiram, she guessed. Terra Hiram. Hiram's world. The old woman nodded. Then she said, You can get up now. My name's Ida. You hungry? Ida asked her. No, thank you. I'm hungry, Ida said. They come out to a larger room with a dining table and chairs, a counter and sink along one wall, and windows that looked out towards the dome at the end of the promontory and down at the beach. The room and pretty much everything in it was fashioned out of the same grayish metal. Studying the wall behind the chair she sat in, Hippolyta could see seams where big metal plates had been fitted together, like jigsaw pieces. This house was built from a kit, I'd explained. Portable Explorer's Cottage or some such. It's got an instruction manual. What I'd really like to see, though, is the box the parts came in. She turned to an appliance resembling a miniature oven that rested on the counter beside the sink. It had a swing-down door on the front and a control panel featuring an eight-digit number window, a green light, and a button, which Ida pushed. There was a chunk of a lock engaging, and the green light turned red. A bass note sounded. After about half a minute, the noise ceased. The red light turned yellow, and the door unlocked. Ida opened it and lifted out a gray metal pan, its top sealed with foil. She carried the pan to the table and peeled the foil off, releasing a puff of steam. Hippolyta leaned forward. The pan was filled with some sort of sweet-smelling white sponge cake. Angel food? she guessed. Manna, said Ida, sitting down. That's what the manual calls it. Supposed to have all your daily requirements. It's kept me alive anyway. She reached in and tore off a hunk of the cake and popped it in her mouth. Hippolyta picked up the foil sheet that had sealed the pan. Impressed on it was a series of eight digits. Zero, 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 one. Every number's something different, Ida told her. It's all food, but the manual doesn't have any menu description beyond number one, so you don't know what you're going to get until you get it. And the box has a regulator that only lets you run it once every four hours. She indicated the yellow light. So if you conjure up something nasty, you either have to choke it down or wait. Mary, she liked to stay up nights and play the food lottery. I kept hoping she hit the number for hot chocolate. Hippolyta looked over at the food maker. Do you know how it works? There's a big round tank in the utility room with pipes running in and out of it, Ida said. The manual calls it the prime matter vessel and stresses how you must never, ever, ever try to break it open. The prime matter, I gather that's something like the dirt God made Adam out of right before he breathed life into it. She tore off another hunk of manna. Tasted dirt? Who's Mary? Hippolyta asked. 
We worked together at the Winthrop House, Ida said. There were six of us, James Storm, who was Mr. Winthrop's chauffeur, Gordon Lee, the cook, Mr. Slade, the handyman, and me, Mary and Pearl, the maids. It was Pearl who ran off with Mr. Winthrop's son. Mr. Winthrop knew they'd been getting together and didn't care, but the thought of them living as man and wife, that was a horse of another color. He gathered up the rest of us and demanded to know where they'd gone off to. He promised Pearl wouldn't be harmed, but we all knew that was a lie, and no one spoke up. So Mr. Winthrop called in some men from his lodge, and they bundled us into cars and drove us out of the city. I thought they were taking us into the woods to torture us. That's how my brother Roy died, in Kentucky. But Mr. Winthrop had something else in mind. He brought us to the hilltop and took us into that bunker or way station or whatever you call it and opened a portal to this world, herded us through it and set us on this rock. Then he made us go there. She pointed out the window at the observatory. Made us look through the telescope at this smudge of light on the edge of infinity. That's the Milky Way, he said. Earth is there along with everyone and everything you've ever known or loved. It's so far away, if you try to walk back from here, the stars would all burn out before you even made a start. God himself would die of old age before you made it home. Well, we were all good and scared by that point. I could see Mr. Slade, in particular, was anxious to share what little he knew about Pearl and Mr. Winthrop's son. But Mr. Winthrop had laid some sort of enchantment on us to keep us from acting up while he frightened us. Mr. Slade wanted to talk, but he couldn't. None of us could. Not without Mr. Winthrop's leave. I know you're ready to cooperate now, Mr. Winthrop said, but I think some of you might still have it in mind to mislead me. And since you've already wasted enough of my time, I'm going to leave you here to stew for a few days first. I wondered about that. For a man who didn't want his time wasted, it seemed like a complicated way of going about things. He could have just tortured us. But I suppose a planet is like any other vanity. Not worth having it if you don't take every chance to show it off. So, he left us here. To stew. But meanwhile, something must have happened in Chicago. Because he never came back to finish questioning us. Nobody else came either. When was this? Hippolyta asked. 1935, said Ida. July the 18th. That's the day Mr. Winthrop brought us here. You happen to know what date he died? Hippolyta shook her head. I know it was a long time ago, but I don't know exactly when or how. I can guess at the how. If it happened the way I think it did, Mr. Braithwaite must have done him in. Ida watched Hippolyta carefully as she said this but Hippolyta had never heard the name Braithwaite before. Samuel Braithwaite, Ida continued after a moment. He and Mr. Winthrop were partners. In what business, I couldn't say exactly. But then something soured between them, and by that summer they were feuding. I suppose it was the distraction of the feud that let Pearl and Mr. Winthrop's son slip away like they did. I remember, about a week before they ran off, I overheard Mr. Winthrop on the phone talking about banishing Mr. Braithwaite. Banish. That's the word he used. Thinking about that later, it occurred to me that maybe he meant to bring Mr. Braithwaite here, to trap him, and that maybe that was the real reason he'd brought us here. She smiled grimly. White man's exile, complete with servants. But if that was Mr. Winthrop's plan, Mr. Braithwaite must have gotten the better of him. I suppose Pearl got the better of him, too. You want to think of it that way. She looked down at the table, her smile fading until only grimness remained. I hope it was worth it. I truly do. Then she shrugged away the thought and looked up again. What year is it now? 1954? Yes, Hippolyta said. November? December. The 21st. December 21st, Ida said. I'll have to redo my figures. We kept a careful count of the days, she explained. But this world, 
doesn't turn as fast as Mother Earth. High noon to high noon is closer to twenty-five hours here, and I'm pretty good at math, but fractions always trip me up. She shook her head and sighed, then broke out in a smile, a happy one this time, as another thought struck her. December 21st, almost Christmas. Mary would have liked that. Hippolyta said nothing to this, but Ida saw the question in her eyes. It's all right. You can ask me. So Hippolyta did. What happened to Mary? And the others? A stout, twelve-foot-high double fence stretched out across the width of the promontory, where it joined the cliff. This barrier, Hippolyta guessed, was not so much booby-trapped as flat-out lethal, the red light on the control box just inside the gates, a cyclopean eye, vowing doom to would-be trespassers. In the open space between the fence and the cottage, four crosses had been erected. They were made from branches bound with lengths of some fibrous stuff, like palm fronds or strips of sawgrass. Three of the crosses had been driven directly into the thin layer of sandy soil that covered the ridge. The fourth was set on a cairn of stones that was large enough to contain an actual body. That's Mary, Ida said of the cairn. Gordon, we buried at sea, and none of us could bring ourselves to handle what was left of James. James was the first to go. Mr. Winthrop warned us that the beach was dangerous, but James thought that was just to scare us. He said there had to be a way to open the portal from this side. Our second day here, he was down on the sand looking when Scylla got him. Scylla, said Hippolyta. Gordon was next, Ida went on, on day thirty-four. After the shock of what happened to James wore off, he got fidgety. He wanted to explore, out there. She gestured at the pale trees lining the cliff. He'd go out each morning for an hour or three. At first he brought back souvenirs, stones, bits of wood, these strange flowers one time. Mr. Slade put an end to the souvenirs. He said we couldn't know what might be deadly to pick up, but he couldn't get Gordon to stay put. Then one day, Gordon didn't come back. It was getting late afternoon, and I decided we better go look for him. Mr. Slade refused to go. Mary didn't want to go either, but she was afraid to be left alone with Mr. Slade, so she came with me. We picked up Gordon's trail and tracked him a couple of miles down that way, to a part of the cliff that juts out right over the water. We found him lying on his back, next to this nest, I guess. He was dead, for sure, but the critter that killed him looked like it might still be alive, and it was wrapped around his head like a cowl. We didn't want to leave him like that, but even if we'd found the strength to carry him back here, we knew Mr. Slade wouldn't let us through the fence with him. So Mary and I said a prayer, and then I grabbed Gordon's wrists, and she grabbed his ankles, and we tossed him off the cliff into the ocean. We came back and told Mr. Slade that Gordon was dead. Mr. Slade got hysterical, screaming about how he didn't deserve to be in this fix and enough was enough. From now on, he said, we're just going to sit tight and wait for Mr. Winthrop, and when he gets back, you're going to tell him where his son and that bitch went. If I have to help him beat it out of you, I will. Well, he didn't scare me. He was a little man. Even Mary could have whipped him in a fair fight. But I knew we'd have to take care just the same. We'd all begun to suspect that Mr. Winthrop might not be coming back, and I could see if Mr. Slade ever completely lost hope, he'd be in to murder us in our sleep. So I watched Mary's back, and she watched mine, and we went on like that through day 87. Day 88, a storm blew in. We'd had showers and squalls before, but this was different. Black cloud, sheets of rain, booming thunder. The manual said the house was proof against lightning, despite being metal, but we were all on edge. For dinner that night, Mary decided to play the lottery. She got Mr. Slade to pick the number. I guess she was hoping if it was something nice, he'd take it as God's grace and be a bit less unpleasant. But it wasn't nice. Ida shuddered at the memory. 
Mary had dialed up some foul dishes before, but this was the first one that was still moving. She clenched the fingers of one hand, as though gripping an object the size of a plum. They were grubs. Fat, white, hairy things. Killed my appetite. Mary's too. She'd try a bite of almost anything, but not that. Mr. Slade, though. He started laughing. He laughed the way a man laughs when he finally grasps that hell is a real place. The way my brother laughed the night he died. He picked up one of those grubs and bit into it and chewed with his mouth open, laughing all the while. Then he stood up. So quick he knocked his chair over and picked up the pan to throw it. I think he meant to dump it on one of us, but he couldn't decide whether he hated me or Mary more, so he threw it between us and scattered those vile things all over the floor. That got me mad. I knew who was going to get stuck with the cleanup, so I jumped up too, ready to wrestle Mr. Slade to the ground. But he didn't come at me. He went over to the window and stood there with his back to us. Lightning flashed. Mr. Slade started laughing again. Thank God, he said. My God, thank God, there's a light on the beach. Mary and I went over to look, but you couldn't see two feet in that storm. Just wait, Mr. Slade said. And the lightning came again, and still there was nothing. But Mr. Slade was out of his mind by then. I'm going home, he said. You can stay here and die. I'm going home now. He went out into the storm. We didn't try to stop him. It wasn't Christian, but all I could think in that moment was good riddance. Lightning came again, and I caught one glimpse of him, starting down the stairs to the beach. Then he was gone. Mary helped me clean up and went to bed. I sat up all night, watching to see if Mr. Slade would come back. But morning came, and there was no more sign of him. And then? It was just the two of us, enduring. Ida leaned forward to place a hand on the cairn. We got on okay. We always had. And it's not so bad here, if you're careful not to get killed. I used to tease Mary. She's originally from Savannah, and she's always wanted a house by the ocean. Got your wish, I'd say. She gets so mad. It's just like home. The beach is right there and I'm not allowed to go swimming. Ida laughed and patted the cairn again. She had chest pains, though. All that weird food, it wasn't good for her heart, and she was nervous a lot of the time, worried that Jesus wouldn't be able to find her here. But he did, finally. Day 4,932, that's the morning Mary didn't wake up. Ida looked at Hippolyta. 1949, I want to say June 26th, though I guess that's wrong. Five years ago, Hippolyta said. And you've been alone since then? Better me than her, Ida said. Alone never bothered me much. I can still talk to Mary all I want to. Jesus and my brother, too. And I've got Mr. Winthrop's observatory to keep myself occupied. She grinned. I'm sure he didn't intend that. But it's got its own manual and a book for recording observations, and I made good use of both of them over the years. She looked at Hippolyta again, her expression both assessing and conspiratorial. So, she said, would you like to see my telescope? The galaxy had begun to set, the lowest of its arms dipping like an oar beneath the ocean horizon. The drowning octopus, Ida said, as they walked towards the end of the promontory. That's what Mr. Winthrop called it in his notes. Said it was blue-shifted, which means it's coming this way. I didn't tell Mary that, though. I knew she'd only worry. What about this star system? Hippolyta asked. Is it one star or more? Does this planet have any moons? How many other planets are there? There's one sun. Ida told her. It's brighter than Earth's. One moon, too, 
but smaller and farther away. As for planets, there's four others Mr. Winthrop knew about. Six now. You discovered two planets. Winthrop was on the trail of the fifth one, Ida said. I used his notes to find it. Named it Ida, to spite him. The sixth one, though, Pearl, she was all mine. She's up now, Ida added, pointing back at the sky above the cliff. She's got her own little moon you can spy through the telescope. Should be able to see it tonight. They reached the dome. Ida had her hand on the observatory door when she suddenly turned and looked down at the beach and cursed. What's wrong? said Apollota. But even as she spoke, she saw it too. Down on the sand beside the glowing portal, another light had appeared. A kerosene lamp carried by one of a pair of white men dressed for Wisconsin winter. The lantern bearer was looking in their direction, but with the lamp flame shining in his eyes, Hippolyta doubted he could see more than a vague silhouette of the promontory. Meanwhile, his companion, armed with a rifle, was gazing at Winthrop's octopus as if he meant to shoot it down. Hippolyta met Ida's accusing stare. They aren't with me, she said. Just be still and keep your voice down, Ida told her. What if they come up the stairs? Hippolyta whispered. Do you need to? They aren't going to make it to the stairs. Scylla's on to them. Scylla. The boulder, Hippolyta realized. While she and Ida had been visiting, the boulder had moved down the beach and now rested no more than twenty feet from the portal. Closer up, it looked more like a giant cannonball than a rock. The man with the rifle had noticed it, too. He approached it, switching his gun to one hand and making a fist of the other, as though intending to rap on the side of the black sphere, which was as tall as he was. But he was still no more than an arm's length away when the sphere suddenly burst open like an orange turning inside out, dark rind splitting to reveal a wriggling white pulp. Dozens of pale tentacles shot out, wrapping around the man's limbs, torso, neck, and head, and yanking him forward to be swallowed whole before he could cry out. By the time his companion realized something was wrong and turned around, the sphere had closed up again. The lantern-bearer held his lamp up high and called out a name. Thinking his friend had gone home to Wisconsin, he stepped to the portal and peered at the control room. Hippolyta almost shouted a warning, but Ida grabbed her wrist and hissed, Be still! Then the man hoisted his lamp again and started for the sphere. Scylla was slower on the draw this time. The man actually had time to turn and run. The tentacles that reached for him were thick, ropey things that squirmed over the sand and seized his ankles, slamming him face down on the beach. He screamed as Scylla reeled him in, a desperate, plaintive cry that echoed off the cliff. Then the sphere snapped shut, cutting off the sound and sending an object like a mossy stone tumbling down to the water. The oil from the lamp, which had been smashed by a pinwheeling arm, continued to burn for another moment. Then all was peaceful once more, the beach's dark stillness disturbed only by surf, starlight, and the soft glow of the portal back to earth. You need to leave, Ida said. Back inside the cottage, Ida slid the leftover manna, pan, foil, and all, into a slot beneath the counter marked matter recycle. I expect there will be other men coming after those first two, she said. Before they get here, you have to go back and shut the door. Throw away the key. She fed the survey and T. Hiram's celestial address into the slot as well. I'm not going back down on that beach, Hippolyta said, and then blinked, stunned by her own words. What it would mean if she really couldn't go back. Horace, she thought. Scylla's had her supper, Ida said. If it goes the way it did with James, she'll wander off now and be sick a while. We don't digest well. She rinsed her hands in the sink and held them up to a wall-mounted blower to dry them. I'll walk you down. Make sure you get through the portal, okay? You're not coming back with me? The blower shut off, but Ida remained facing the wall. You have a child, she said. Yes. You love her? Him, Hippolyta said. Yes. 
then you should understand. I'd like to see Pearl again. Find out what's become of her. If Hiram Winthrop were dead dead, I might risk it. But if he's still looking for his son from beyond the grave, I need to keep my distance. But Winthrop knows where you are. He knows where he left me, Ida said, turning around. He won't know I'm still here unless you tell him. He might send someone else, I suppose. But if you're the best he could manage in nineteen years, I should be fine for whatever time I've got left. It's my planet now. Or it will be, she added, giving Hippolyta a look she didn't care for. Once you're gone. I'd have vanished for several minutes into the back of the cottage, returning with Hippolyta's coat and a worn canvas shoulder bag. I'm going to keep your revolver, she said, in case I get other visitors. Hippolyta made no objection, but felt a tingle of unease settle between her shoulder blades when Ida indicated she should lead the way. They descended the stairs. As predicted, Scylla had moved off, becoming a barely discernible speck in the distance. Still, Hippolyta was wary, stepping onto the beach as she would onto a minefield. They made it to the portal without being eaten. Ida reached into the bag and brought out a parting gift for Hippolyta, a gray metal box about five inches on a side, its hinged lid secured with strips of sawgrass. For your silence, Ida said. Hippolyta felt that uneasy tingle again. She thought, you didn't know Christmas was coming, but you just happened to have a present lying around? Who for? It's all right, she told Ida. You don't need to bribe me. Take it, Ida insisted, shoving the box into her hands. It was heavy for its size, and whatever was inside must have been snugly packed. As Hippolyta fumbled to hold on to it, she could feel no telltale shifting of contents. Don't open it now, Ida said. After. Once you've shut the portal and got rid of the key and are safe away. You'll understand. Ida, Hippolyta said. You don't have to stay here. You can... No! Ida dipped her hand into the bag again, came up with a thirty-eight. You go back. You go, and when that door's shut, you're just a dream I had gesturing with a gun. Now get! And still, Hippolyta might have tried to convince her. But just then, Scylla made a ghastly retching noise up the beach. The sound galvanized Hippolyta into motion. She pivoted on the sand and half-stepped, half-leapt through the doorway. Sudden shock of winter cold. The increase in gravity staggered her, and if not for the railing to lean against, she would have fallen. She steadied herself and turned around to find Ida staring at her from several feet and trillions of miles away. The old woman was waving, not saying goodbye, urging her to get on with it. Hippolyta stumbled back to the control console, but with her hand on the key, she hesitated, mouthing the words broadly so that her lips could be read from across the universe. She said, Ida, are you sure? Are you absolutely Ida brought the gun up. Despite the sound barrier between them, Hippolyta would have sworn she could hear the hammer cocking. She yanked the key from its slot. The dome went dark, and the almost imperceptible background hum ceased. Then as the lights came up, there was a new sound. The tick, tick, tick of tiny metal reels as each number window reset itself to zero, zero, one. Hippolyta looked at the key in one hand, and the box in the other, and thought about tossing them both into that black pool. Instead, she pocketed the key, and holding the box to her chest, turned and started for home. Clouds had covered the sky above Warlock Hill in her absence. She emerged from the dome into pitch darkness and made her way carefully down the hillside. She crossed the footbridge and was passing the empty guard shack when her flashlight gave out. She continued blindly following the path, ducking her head against the falling snow that blew into her eyes. She came to the chain sooner than she expected to and would have tripped over it in the dark. But suddenly, she could see again. 
she looked up into the glow of headlights. A second Chevy truck had pulled up behind the first, and three more white men had gotten out. One of them, by looks another moonlighting farmer, had the front passenger door of Hippolyta's roadmaster open and was leaning in to check the glove box. The other two, who stood idly by while the car was searched, were more refined sorts, silver-haired patricians in long dark coats. It was one of the dark coats who first noticed Hippolyta. You there, he shouted, brandishing a pistol. The other dark coat drew a gun as well, while the farmer popped his head up out of the car. Don't shoot! Hippolyta dropped the flashlight and Ida's gift box and put her hands up. Who are you? The first dark coat demanded. What are you doing here? Don't shoot, Hippolyta repeated, keeping her hands raised. She stepped over the chain. Gripping her collar like a leash, the dark coat shoved her up against the roadmaster and stuck his gun in her face. Who the hell are you? I'm just trying to get home, Hippolyta told him. Please, mister, I took a wrong turn and I'm just trying to get directions back to the highway. She could see he didn't believe her. At the same time, he was obviously having trouble conceiving why else she would be here. Whatever sorts of trespassers these people were worried about, she didn't fit the description. The farmer hopped the chain and picked up the box that Hippolyta had dropped. He held it by his ear and shook it, then used a buck knife to cut away the sawgrass binding the lid shut. Wait a minute, Hippolyta said. Shut up, said the man with the gun in her face. The farmer lifted the lid of the box and squinted at the little black sphere stuffed inside it. For your silence, Hippolyta heard Ida say, and she thought, Oh, Ida, you didn't have to do that. I wouldn't have told anyone. And yet she did understand. Not only the lengths to which a mother might go to protect her child, but the impulsive acts to which a heart, disturbed by years of longing, might be prone. The farmer, who understood nothing, stuck his face up close to the sphere and sniffed it. What is that? said the second dark coat. The farmer shrugged and prodded the sphere with the tip of his knife. The sphere exploded out of the box, turning itself inside out as it flew up, little tentacles reaching towards startled blue eyes. The farmer's feet shot out from under him, and he flipped onto his back, clawing at the creature, which it flattened and stretched itself over his face in an attempt to devour his head. Jesus Christ! The dark coat loosened his grip on Hippolyta and pivoted towards the stricken farmer, in the process, aiming the gun away. Hippolyta braced herself against the car and shoved him hard. He lost his grip on her entirely and stumbled headlong into the other dark coat, the two of them coming together with a loud double pop and falling entangled in a heap. They rolled apart, their jaws went slack, and they looked up, unblinking, as though transfixed by some astronomical wonder. Meanwhile, the farmer, smothering, went into convulsions, beating his arms and legs frantically against the snow. He was still doing it, but slower, when Apolta got in her car and drove away. Horace? she said three days later. Have you seen that comic book you gave me? Horace, sitting contented among his spoils at the foot of the Christmas tree, looked up at her. Which one? The new Orthea Blue, number 11. No. You took it on your trip, remember? And you didn't take it out of the car since I got back? Horace shook his head. What's wrong, Mom? I'm worried I might have lost it, Hippolyta said. You read it, though, right? Horace took a quick inventory of his presents. The matchbox cars, the big box of art supplies, the remote control Robert the Robot. You must have. I did, she said. I liked it. Hippolyta forced a smile, telling herself, registration papers still in the glove box, nothing else missing from the car. Maybe it's not what you're thinking. I just feel bad, that's all. It's okay. He picked up the Matchbox London bus and swooped it through the air like a double-decker spaceship. I can draw you another copy if you like. That'd be nice, Hippolyta said. Tell me something, though. That first copy you gave me, what name did you use on it? Since learning that Dr. Seuss had been born Theodore Geisel, Horace had been experimenting with professional pseudonyms. George didn't care for the practice, pointing out that Barry 
was a good name that deserved to be honored, but Hippolyte had supported Horace's right to sign his work as he wished. Thank God. H.G., Horace told her, short for Horace Green. The initials, a nod to both his mother's maiden name and the author of War of the Worlds, the same as on all the Orothea Blues. Right, Hippolyta exhaled softly in relief. Right, of course. And you're sure? I think so. Horace looked at her curiously. Why does it matter? It doesn't. She smiled again, reassuringly, but Horace continued to stare at her until George came in from the kitchen, bearing three steaming mugs on a tray. So, George said, who wants hot chocolate? Jekyll in Hyde Park I knew myself, at the first breath of this new life, to be more wicked, tenfold more wicked, sold a slave to my original evil, and the thought, in that moment, braced and delighted me like wine. Robert Louis Stevenson The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde New Year's Day Ruby woke up white. Her luck had been running bad since Christmas, and she figured she still had a blow or two coming. But she certainly hadn't expected this. Not that she had any right to complain. She did ask for it. The trouble started on Christmas Eve. Ruby was working for Demarski Catering, serving drinks at a party at a big house up in Ravenswood. The manager that night was Catherine Demarski, Ruby's least favorite. The youngest of the five Demarski siblings, Catherine loved having the chance to boss other people around, and she never used a kind word where a mean one would do. Worse, in Ruby's estimation, she was lazy, always disappearing when things were busiest. It was during one of Catherine's absences that the owner of the house approached Ruby with a special assignment. A guest had gotten sick in one of the second-floor bathrooms, and he wanted it cleaned up. Wiping up vomit wasn't part of Ruby's job description, but neither was saying no to the host, so she went and found a rag in a bucket. She was searching for the bathroom when she startled Catherine Demarski in an upstairs hallway. What are you doing up here? Catherine demanded. Ruby showed her the bucket and explained her mission. We'll get to it, Catherine said, and then you get your ass back downstairs. Ruby's eyes went flinty at the word ass, but she held her tongue and did as she was told. The next morning she attended Christmas services and went out to eat with some of her friends from church. That afternoon she was supposed to work another catering function, but when she came home to get ready, the police were in her apartment. They told her that a pair of pearl earrings had been stolen from the master bedroom during the party last night, and they had it on good authority that Ruby had taken them. They handcuffed her and made her wait in the hall while they tore her room apart. Then they took her to the station, where she was interrogated by a detective Moretti. He was very unhappy to be working on Christmas and made sure Ruby knew it. Ruby kept her own feelings to herself and focused on keeping her answers short and consistent. She only lied once when the detective asked her if she didn't take the earrings, who did? Ruby said she had no idea. Around 6 p.m., the detective locked Ruby in a holding cell, told her to reflect on her sins, and left. A couple of hours later, a good Samaritan let her out to use the toilet and offered her a chance to make a phone call. But she didn't see the use in calling anybody. And, despite being innocent, she was embarrassed. She didn't want anyone to know she was in custody. She spent Christmas night in the holding cell. Detective Moretti never came back. In the morning, a different detective came up to the bars and asked Ruby if she was ready to confess yet. She repeated that she hadn't done anything. The detective shrugged, opened the cell door, and told her she was free to go. For now. But don't disappear, he added. Ruby went home to clean up her apartment. At first, she was nervous, wondering if Detective Moretti was going to burst in and haul her back to the station for more questions. But by the time she got everything back in order, she was just angry at the way she'd been treated. The next morning, she was outside Demarski Catering when Catherine's brother Leo drove up. He wasn't pleased to see her. What the hell are you doing here, Ruby? He said. You know you're fired, right? I want my paycheck, Ruby said. Well, you're not getting it. My dad signs the paychecks, and he's not going to sign one for you. 
The cops were at his house on Christmas morning. Yeah, they were at mine too, Ruby said. I know. He offered to go with them to knock a confession out of you. And if he catches you here, he should thank me for keeping my mouth shut. I didn't say a word about your sister. What about my sister? You figure it out. No, Leo said. That's bullshit. I didn't take the earrings, Ruby said. But she's the one who said I did, right? And you were there. Think about how she sounded when she said it. He did. She watched him push the thought away. Kathy's a good girl. I don't care what kind of girl she is. I just want my money. Bad enough I lose my job without being robbed in the bargain. Leo got out his wallet and took some cash from the billfold. Here. Ruby counted it. You owe me another twelve dollars, she said. Jesus, Ruby, just take it and be grateful. Grateful? That's all you're going to get, okay? This isn't right, Leo. It is what it is, he told her. Now will you please get out of here before my dad comes and beats the shit out of you? It is what it is. Life isn't fair, Ruby. You need to understand, Ruby. Lord, how she tired of hearing that. Life wasn't fair. But still, it would be nice if, just once in a while, someone else had to do the understanding. Self-pity wouldn't pay the rent. That same day, she was out looking for work. A house cleaning service in Kenwood was hiring, and a number of downtown hotels were looking for maids and dining room staff. But they all wanted references, and the manager at one of the hotels said that because of a recent rash of thefts, they'd also need to run her name by the police. In the evening, she called around to see if anyone needed a sitter. No one did. Not even the Barrys, who usually liked to go out on the holidays. We were going to that New Year's party at your sister's place, George told her. But now Hippolyta's not feeling up to it. I hope she's not too sick, Ruby said. Not sick at all. Just moody, George said. She and Letitia didn't have a fight, did they? Not that I heard. But Letitia and I haven't talked much lately. After another long and frustrating day answering help-wanted ads, she came home to find an invitation to the Winthrop House New Year's Eve party on her door. Ruby, Letitia had written, I know you're probably working, but we'll be going till dawn, so you should come by. Charlie Boyd's cousin, the good-looking one, will be there, and he asked about you. P.S. I spoke to Mr. Winthrop, and he promised not to make the house jump while you're here. Ruby stood shaking her head at this. Letitia, now exacting promises from the ghost who tried to evict her. Letitia in her mansion, bought with money she hadn't lifted a finger to earn. It is what it is. Come New Year's Eve, Ruby was still unemployed. So after dinner, she made herself up and put on her good dress. She had the cab drop her at the corner of Letitia's block, in front of the closed-up tavern. Rather than proceed directly to the party, she lit a cigarette and stood smoking and shivering in the cold thinking about the last night she'd spent in this neighborhood. Tonight, the Winthrop house was all lit up, its brilliance accentuated by the darkness of the houses across the street. One house still had a for sale sign on its lawn. The new owners of the others were presumably at the party. Ruby knew she ought to join them before she froze, but instead, she took shelter in the tavern doorway and finished her smoke. She was reaching into her purse for another cigarette when the door opened behind her, and a white man emerged from the pitch-dark interior. Ruby stepped away quickly, but the man was untroubled by her presence. After locking the door behind him, he turned to her smiling and touched a finger to the brim of his hat. He was young, Ruby saw, well-groomed and a sharp dresser. And cute. Evening, he greeted her. He glanced down the block of the Winthrop house, from which the sounds of a dance band could be heard. On your way to the party? I'm invited, Ruby said. Still not a hundred percent sure I'm going. What about you? Not invited, unfortunately. Just passing through the neighborhood. She nodded at the tavern. This your bar? It is now. My father owned the property, he explained. He died last summer. I've been meaning to come and take a look at the place. Definitely cute, Ruby thought. And it had been a while. So where you going now? He shook his head. I don't have any plans. You want to come to the party with me? I'd love to, 
he said, smiling. But only if you want to go. Well, Ruby said, there is that. Can I make a suggestion? There's a club I know in Uptown called Wittershins. We could go there. She thought it over. Going to the north side with the white man she'd just met was probably a terrible idea. But when the alternative was the Winthrop house, this Wittishens, it's not a haunted club, is it? He laughed. Alcoholic spirits only, I promise. All right, then, she said. I'm Ruby. Ruby Dandridge. Caleb Braithwaite, he replied, offering her his arm. It's nice to meet you, Ruby. A Sherpa? Yeah, you know, Ruby said. Like on Mount Everest? I know what a Sherpa is, Braithwaite said laughing. I've just never heard anyone say they'd like to be one before. Well, you said dream job. When that man made it to the top of the mountain last year, the paper had a picture of the Sherpas carrying his gear for him, and you could see all these other mountains in the background where they were climbing. I thought that'd be something, to get up every day and go to work with a view like that. She shrugged. I know it's silly, but I don't think it's silly. A little hard on the ankles, maybe. I've never had a job that wasn't that, Ruby replied. But for that view, it'd be worth it. They'd taken a break from dancing, retiring to a private table on the balcony. Below, other couples still on the floor moved slowly to cabin in the sky, while a big clock set up behind the bandstand ticked away the last minutes of 1954. Ruby was on her third cocktail, pleasantly buzzed and having fun. She liked Caleb Braithwaite. Under other circumstances, she'd have been suspicious of a man who spoke so little of himself while asking so many questions about her. But tonight, she decided to enjoy being the center of attention. If his show of interest had an ulterior motive, she could guess what that was, and didn't mind. What about you? she said. You have a dream job? I'm working on it. Ruby waited for him to say more. When he didn't, she adopted a teasing tone. Is it a secret? It's a new situation, he told her. Being able to choose my own destiny, I mean. Most of my life, that wasn't the case. This got something to do with your daddy? Everything to do with him, Braithwaite said, nodding. He was a very powerful man who didn't like to be contradicted, even when he was wrong. And of course, as his son, I was expected to obey without question. I had my own feelings about that. But for years, there wasn't anything I could do. He was stronger than I was. He shrugged, frowning, and then, as he had several times already, turned the conversation back to her. Do you get along with your father? I did, when he was home, Ruby said. I was closer to Mama, though. She passed last year. Emphysema. I'm sorry. Ruby looked down at her drink. I do miss her. Some days, she said. She could be hard, too, though, especially when she wanted something from you. What did she do for a living? Talked to dead people? Ruby smiled, knowing how much Mama would be irked by that description. You know, a spiritualist. She worked out of a beauty salon, the two L's. Mama was the second L. Eloise, her best friend, Ella Price, she put up the money to open the business, so she got to be the first tale. It was a package deal, Ruby explained. The storefront was an old photographer studio. Ladies would come in, get their hair and nails done, and then after, they got to go in the dark room for a session with Mama. And the more they spent on beauty treatments, the longer the session. That sounds like a great business plan. Yeah, they did all right for a while. Then after she got sick... Mama tried to get me to come in and take over for her, but I wouldn't. We were fighting about that up to the day she died. Why didn't you want to do it? Because you're afraid of ghosts? Because I don't like lying to people, Ruby said. Mama did have powers. She could read your mind, but not like a psychic, more like the way my daddy did at the poker table. Not that she even had to read minds at the two L's. A woman sits down to get her hair done. All you need to do is listen. And by the time she gets out of the chair, you know exactly what she's worried about and who she wants to hear from on the other side. The rest is just parlor tricks. Mama would have taken exception to this description, too, Ruby knew. Had done, many times, furiously insisting that she didn't trick people. 
She helped them. Godly work, and true. But Ruby had seen more than one version of Mama's act. Before the two L's opened, she'd used to conduct seances at home. Most of her clientele were neighborhood people, but now and then she'd get a white customer who'd heard about her from an employee. For these folks, she'd put on a show. She would alter and throw her voice and crack her toe and ankle joints to simulate ghostly rapping. A ruler, hidden up her sleeve, gave her leverage to make the table jump even as her hands rested innocently atop it. Afterwards, Mama would laugh and joke about how gullible these people were. White folks' belief that Negroes were magically gifted struck her as the most absurd form of superstition. Sorcery was in the Bible, which meant it was real. But to Mama, it was self-evident that like every other kind of power, it would be concentrated in the hands of the mighty. A real magician would almost surely be a white man, most likely the sort whose ancestors went around in powdered wigs. Fair logic. But, Ruby had to ask, weren't Mama's colored clients equally gullible? Maybe Mama could make a distinction between strangers she took advantage of and friends and acquaintances she helped, but Ruby didn't know how to draw that line and refused to learn, no matter how angry Mama got. And Mama got very angry towards the end, calling Ruby an ungrateful child, a foolish child, too, passing up the chance to assume her mother's vocation. She'd come to nothing in this life, being such a fool. Fine, Ruby said, throwing it back at her. Let me come to nothing. At least when I go to meet Jesus, I won't have to explain why I cheated people in his name. A change in the music woke Ruby to the fact that she'd been staring at the table, not speaking. Sorry, she said. But Braithwaite shook his head and said, Don't apologize. Again, she waited for him to say more maybe offer some smooth assurance that he understood what she was feeling. But he only looked at her, his expression of concern making her think that maybe he did understand. A little. Ruby finished her drink and stood up. Come on, she said, reaching for him. Dance me into the new year. Walking back to the car at two in the morning, they stopped to kiss on a deserted street corner, then continued on, Ruby laughing and leaning drunkenly on Caleb Braithwaite. Braithwaite's Daimler was parked under a street lamp in front of a line of dark storefronts. There were two white men there, one on each side of the car, bent down trying to see in the windows. The men straightened up as Braithwaite and Ruby approached, Ruby stiffening as she realized the man on the curbside was holding a pistol. The gunman tilted his chin at Braithwaite. This your car, chief? Yes, Caleb Braithwaite said. It's mine. Ruby clutched his arm, silently begging him not to play the hero, but he detached himself from her and stepped forward, a cold grin on his face, as if the threat of deadly violence were a source of amusement to him. Ruby thought about running. Then, that notion joined by another, uglier one, that if the men shot Braithwaite, they might be too distracted to chase after her. But even as she was thinking this, her hand was in her purse groping for the knife she carried to defend herself. The gunman raised the pistol as Braithwaite came towards him. Keys, he said. Wallet. I won't ask twice. That's right, Braithwaite said. You won't. A look of surprise stole over the gunman's face, and Ruby thought the pistol must have jammed in the cold. What are you waiting for? The thug standing out in the street said. Shoot the fucker! But the gunman didn't fire. So the thug started coming around the car to deal with Braithwaite himself. Braithwaite put up a hand, palm out, and an invisible wrecking ball struck the thug in the gut, flinging him up and across the street to land in a boneless heap on the far curb. The gunman had both hands on the pistol now. Let me go, he pleaded, as if Braithwaite were the one with the weapon. Braithwaite carefully extracted the gun from the man's grasp, then stood weighing it in his hand for a moment. He nodded his head, and the gunman stumbled backwards. Run, Braithwaite said. The man turned and fled. Holding the gun at his side, Braithwaite raised his other hand, balled into a fist, and made a throwing motion with his arm. Halfway down the block already, the running man pitched forward, slamming face down into the sidewalk and sliding on the icy pavement. He scrambled up again and dashed off howling into the night. Ruby who'd been holding her breath since the thug went flying, now let out a ragged gasp. 
Braithwaite turned to face her. It's all right, he said, tossing the pistol in the gutter. It's over. He smiled and took a step towards her, but she shied back, brandishing the knife from her purse, the gesture feeling even more futile than if she'd done it while the gunman was still there. What just happened? Ruby said in the car. Nothing remarkable, Caleb Braithwaite said. Those men underestimated us. Nature took its course. Us? I didn't do anything. You kept your head. I know you wanted to run, but if you had, that man might have shot you before I could stop him. She sensed he was trying to flatter her and got annoyed, which was better than being scared. What are you? I think you know what I am, though we probably have different names for it. They were cruising down Lakeshore Drive. Ruby looked out the window at the passing lights of downtown. I want to go home now, she said. Let me ask you something first. Are you happy with the way your life is going? Turning back to stare at him. What? I wasn't just pretending to be interested in you tonight. I like you, Ruby. I think we're very similar in some ways. Yeah, sure, Ruby said. Two peas in a pod. I know how it feels to always have your own desires come in second to someone else's, Braithwaite said. Believe me, I know. So what if you do? What's that to me? You asked about my dream job, he said. I told you I was working on it. I am. But I'm at a point right now where I could really use some help. A very particular sort of help from a very particular sort of person. You want to hire me. You are looking for work, right? Ruby eyed him suspiciously. What kind of job? An interesting one, Braithwaite said. I can't promise you mountain views, but it shouldn't be too hard on the ankles. Her expression turned cross. That's not an answer. Sorry, I don't mean to be coy, but it's an odd job, and there's secrecy involved. So before I get into details, I'd like to show you what I'd be offering in exchange. Which is what? The freedom to choose your own destiny. Freedom? Ruby snorted. You're going to pay me in freedom? There's a cash salary too, but yes. How? If I told you, you wouldn't believe me. But I can show you. You'll need to trust me and take a small leap of faith, but I think you'll be very glad you did. And if you don't like it, or if you decide the job's not for you, you can still say no afterwards. They'd left the lake shore and were passing through the Hyde Park neighborhood now. Braithwaite turned down an alley into a courtyard ringed by townhouses. What's this? Ruby said. Another of my father's properties, said Braithwaite. He parked behind one of the townhouses but left the motor running. What I want to show you is inside. Or, he added, one hand on the gear shift, I could just take you home. Home. The sane choice. Saner still, perhaps. Get out of the car right now, run screaming into the night as the gunman had. But with that thought, came the thought of what she'd be running back to. I can walk away if I don't like it, Ruby heard herself say. You can walk away any time, Braithwaite promised. What do I have to do? Just say yes. Okay, Ruby said. Show me. She woke, head pounding on blood-slick sheets. The late morning sun roused her, creeping up the side of the bed to stab her in the eyes. Ruby pressed her eyelid shut and tried to retreat back into unconsciousness, but the sun kept at her. Hot rays burning the skin of her face and neck made sensitive by a monster hangover. With a groan, she rolled onto her back and tried to sit up. She had difficulty getting traction, the bedsheets warm and slippery beneath her. At first, this was merely irritating, but as she woke up a little more, a scary thought struck her. She opened her eyes. The sun's glare snapped at them closed again, but not before she glimpsed the arterial red of the bedclothes. Oh, Lord Jesus. Ruby rolled off the side of the bed in a panic, landing face down and thrashing, kicking away the bloody top sheet that had trailed her to the floor. She pushed herself up, 
felt her heart beating fast but strong in her chest. Not my blood, she thought, praying it was so. Not my blood. Whose then? Had she killed someone? Her attempt to recall the previous night's events yielded up a single clear memory of sitting at a table across from Caleb Braithwaite, watching as he set a small glass vial filled with red liquid in front of her. She sensed that this offering was part of a larger bargain and that it had everything to do with her current situation. But when she tried to dredge up more details, she got nothing, only an echo of her mother's injunction to never let a man you just met mix your drinks for you. She stood up, eyes still shut tight. Groping blindly forward, she found an open doorway and stepped through into cool darkness, cold tile beneath her feet. She bumped up against a sink, spun the taps, and splashed water on her face and chest. The water cleared her head, but the panic came surging back. Please God, please God, Ruby said, head bowed over the sink. Then she opened her eyes and looked up and saw a crazed white woman's face hovering in the dark just inches from her own. Ruby screamed. Her mind must have gone blank for a few seconds, because the next thing she knew, she was back in the bedroom, fallen on her backside. There was no respite from the madness, though. She'd struck the bathroom door in passing, and rebounding from the wall, it swung shut, revealing another full-length mirror, the glass reflecting the same wild-eyed white woman, now sprawled on the hardwood floor. Ruby screamed again. The white woman in the mirror screamed with her. Ruby clapped her hands over her mouth. The white woman aped the gesture. The white woman. Her. There wasn't any blood. Just bright red hair, long and gently waved, and freckles, dance on her shoulders and upper arms, more sparse on her breasts and her flat white belly. Between her legs was another thatch of red. Viewed in the mirror from this undignified angle, it looked like some weird ginger-furred animal had crawled up in her lap. When Ruby looked down and saw that it was her lap, right there, she let out a yelp and went scooting backwards, as if by moving fast enough she could leave it behind. She banged her head against the radiator on the wall behind her. Wincing, she pressed one hand to her scalp and slapped herself with the other, saying, Wake up, wake up, wake up! But it was no use. When she checked the mirror again, her cheek had reddened. But she was still a white girl. Ruby saw then she had a choice to make. She could give up and go completely mad, or she could just deal with the situation. Being Eloise Dandridge's daughter, she decided to deal. With an effort, she turned her attention from the mirror. She lifted a hand to the bed, touched the shiny crimson sheets. Satin. Ruby had never slept on satin sheets before though she'd once cleaned the house of a woman who did. She scanned the rest of the room. To the right of the bathroom door was a dresser, and laid out on top of it were a pair of red shoes and a set of undergarments. A green dress hung from the back of another door in the far corner. She rose to a crouch and peeked out the window. She was on an upper floor, overlooking a courtyard ringed by two- and three-story townhouses. A silver sedan with dark-tinted windows was parked directly below, the sight of it triggered a flood of additional memories from the night before, coupled with an overwhelming desire to escape. She stood up and went to the dresser. In her haste, she decided to skip the stockings and the flimsy lace garter belt and just put on the panties, averting her eyes as she did so. She wrestled with the bra, the unfamiliar breasts smaller and differently shaped than her own. The dress went on smoothly. Finally, she grabbed the red shoes, which were shiny like the bed sheets but had sensible flat heels. She tried them to make sure they fit, but then carried them in her hand, not wanting to make any more noise than she already had. The door opened on a dim hallway with stairs immediately to her left. She listened a moment and then started down, holding tight to the banister, not trusting the balance of this body. She made it safely to the bottom of the stairs. There, directly in front of her, she saw a door with a mail slot, Hanging on a rack just inside the door was her very own coat. Her purse was on the floor. Ruby had put on the coat and was bending to pick up the purse when she heard footsteps coming up from below. She looked over her shoulder. At the end of a corridor, beside the stairs she just descended, was a sunlit kitchen that seemed familiar. 
Was that wooden table the one at which Caleb Braithwaite had offered her a drink? No time to check. The footsteps had reached the top of the basement stairs, and now a door creaked open just out of view. Ruby tucked the purse under her arm and slipped out the front door, taking care not to slam it behind her. She danced a moment on the frozen stoop, getting the shoes on, then dashed down the walk and out the low iron gate. From the sidewalk, she glanced back. The townhouse? Rough gray stone, half smothered in ivy, suggested a wizard's castle squeezed to fit onto a city lot. Down the block, a cab had stopped in front of another house to let out a passenger. Taxi! Ruby shouted. But the driver had already seen her and was waiting by the open back door with a smile on his face. Cab, miss? She banged her head again, sliding into the back seat. Even without heels, she was taller than she was used to. The driver shut the door for her and walked with agonizing slowness around to the other side. When he got behind the wheel, Ruby was twisted around, watching for signs of pursuit. Where to, miss? The cabbie said. Ruby blurted out her home address. After a moment, when the taxi hadn't moved, she faced forward and saw the driver staring at her quizzically over the seat rest. Are you sure about that address, miss? Of course I'm... But then she stopped and thought about it. Miss? Downtown, Ruby said. Take me downtown. Somewhere in particular, or just drive. Twenty minutes later, she was standing outside Marshall Fields on State Street, taking stock. After paying her cab fare, Ruby had enough cash left in her purse to get by for a couple of days, if she were frugal. Add in her oh Jesus money, the emergency fund stashed in the lining of her coat, and she might last a week. Her identification was useless now, though, which meant bank withdrawals were going to be a problem. She studied her reflection in the department store window. She hadn't been in the right frame of mind to appreciate it earlier, but she was a good-looking white woman, and there was an archness to her features that suggested she was a take-charge girl, used to giving orders. Maybe if she picked the right bank teller, she would need identification, though her name might be an issue. Red hair notwithstanding, she didn't think she looked like a ruby anymore. What did she look like then? Her gaze shifted to the display inside the window. Mannequins in winter clothes posed in front of a painted mountain range. The mountains were probably meant to be the Rockies, but to Ruby, they evoked the Himalayas. And once again, she imagined herself on Everest, this time in a new capacity. Not a Sherpa, but a commander of Sherpas. The name, Ruby thought. What was the name of that white man, the one who reached the summit? Hillary. She spoke the name aloud, like an incantation. Hillary. What do you think? She asked her reflection. Are you a Hillary? Her reflection smiled and nodded assent. While she gazed at the window, other people were passing her on the busy sidewalk, stepping carefully around her. Now, even as she rechristened herself, someone walked right into her, shoving her roughly aside and continuing on without a breach of apology. Ruby opened her mouth to say excuse you, only to be dumbstruck by the realization that the person who'd shoved her was Catherine Demarski. This flash of recognition was followed instantly by doubt. But it was her. Ten paces farther on, Catherine collided with a little Negro girl who was walking beside her mother. The girl fell down crying out as she was nearly trampled, and the mother shouted, Hey! Catherine, without breaking stride, looked over her shoulder and said, Watch where you're fucking going! The words stunned the mother into silence and drew nasty looks from some other passers-by. No one did anything, though, and Catherine plowed onward like a human juggernaut against whom ordinary pedestrians were powerless. But Hillary wasn't powerless. Catherine had gone into Marshall Fields, when Ruby entered the department store, she heard raised voices and quickly spotted Catherine at a cosmetics counter, going nose to nose with the girl on duty there. Ruby walked up to the adjacent counter and pretended to browse a rack of silk scarves while she eavesdropped. They were fighting about someone named Roman, who was, or was supposed to be, Catherine's fiancé, the counter girl. Her name for purposes of this conversation was, You Fucking Bitch, which Ruby shortened to Effie, had been seen making time with Roman, and Catherine wanted to make clear 
the many ways in which that wasn't going to fly. Effie, for her part, denied having anything to do with Roman, but she also, in what struck Ruby as a tactical error, tried to argue that Catherine and Roman weren't as engaged as Catherine seemed to think. The volume and level of profanity increased until the store manager came over. What exactly is the problem here, ladies? he said. Fifteen feet away, Ruby selected one of the silk scarves. Hillary looked out from the mirror beside the display rack, nodding encouragement. Ignoring the manager, Catherine spat a last warning at Effie and stalked away. Ruby stepped deliberately into her path. As they collided, she slipped the scarf into Catherine's coat pocket, leaving the corner with the price tag sticking out. Then she ducked back, hands raised, feigning mortification at Catherine's curses. In fact, Ruby barely heard the words, for in that same moment, she saw the pearl studs in Catherine's ears. Back out on the sidewalk, Ruby approached a policeman who was getting lunch from a hot dog vendor. Excuse me, officer, she said, Hillary's voice brisk and no nonsense. I'm a manager in the store here, and that woman there just shoplifted a scarf from our boutique department. The policeman regarded her unenthusiastically, his eyes saying, What do you want from me? And Ruby had no doubt that if he were dealing with a colored woman, his mouth would be saying it too. But Hillary looked right back at him lips tight and eyebrows arched, sending her own message. You will do your job. The policeman sighed. Keep an eye on this for me, he said, handing his hot dog back to the vendor. Then he hitched up his trousers and asked, That woman there? Brown coat and dark hair? Yes, Hillary said, adding, She was in our jewelry department, too. You should ask her where she got the earring she's wearing. The policeman nodded dutifully, and set off at a lumbering trot. He caught up to Catherine near the end of the block. When he grabbed her elbow, she jerked her arm away, her reflexive anger diminishing only slightly when she saw it was a cop who'd accosted her. The policeman, out of breath from the brief pursuit, pointed at the scarf peeping from her pocket. Catherine pulled it out and stared at it in confusion, then looked accusingly at the policeman as if he were the one who planted it on her. Then the policeman said something that made Catherine raise a hand to her earlobe, and for an instant, her composure broke, and she got very nervous. But her anger came back, redoubled, and she shook her head firmly. But the policeman was nodding. He'd made up his mind. He reached out to grab Catherine's arm again. Catherine batted his hand away and slammed her palms into his chest. The policeman's face turned red, and he slammed Catherine in her chest, using just one hand but exerting considerably more force, knocking her clean off her feet. Catherine hit the sidewalk and bounced back up and launched herself at the policeman, arms flailing. Then two more cops came around the corner, goggling at the melee in progress, and in the space of five seconds, Catherine went from fighting one policeman to fighting three. Up to now, Ruby had been enjoying watching the tables get turned, but this sudden escalation in violence made her queasy. The cops were trying to wrestle Catherine to the ground, she clawed at the first policeman's neck, drawing blood, and he hauled off and punched her in the face, eliciting a cry of damn from the hot dog vendor. As Catherine went down, all three cops on top of her, Ruby's stomach gave a sick lurch. She turned away as if to throw up, and instead broke into a run. I didn't do that, she said, whipsawing between horror and a wild exultation as her feet pounded the sidewalk. I didn't do that. That wasn't me. She ran on, all the way to the other end of the block, and rounding the corner, dashed headlong into yet another policeman. Oh, my God, she cried, staggering backwards, fully expecting to get beaten down too now. But this new cop, young, rosy-cheeked, and smelling like he'd just come from an all-night New Year's Eve bash, reacted in good humor. Watch yourself there, miss, he said, laughing. He caught Ruby's arm, not to arrest her but to steady her, his amusement turning to concern when she didn't smile back at him. Are you all right, miss? Somebody bothering you? He looked past her, bloodshot eyes narrowing. Was it them? Something about the way he said them. Ruby turned around and saw four Negro boys, teenagers, standing on the corner waiting for the light, minding their own business. Was it them? The cop repeated. They say something to you? Do something? 
Ruby felt her stomach give another lurch, and she thought, I could tell him anything at all right now. And he believed me. I could get those boys killed if I wanted to. I could... The cop read her silence as affirmation. Don't worry, he said, stepping around her. I'll take care of it. But Ruby stayed in with a light touch of Hillary's hand on his wrist. No, she said. They didn't do anything. The cop eyed her uncertainly. Really, Hillary said. They didn't do anything. Nobody did. The light changed, and the boys started to cross the street. The cop looked like he might chase after them anyway, just on general principles. So Hillary touched his wrist again and said, Would you like to buy me lunch? Roman, huh? The cop, whose name was Mike, said, Sounds like a real asshole. Excuse my language. No, Roman's a nice boy, she said. At least I thought he was. If he cheated on you, he's an idiot. Maybe she had gone crazy after all. She hadn't really intended to have lunch with him. But when they got to the restaurant, a diner tucked under the Lake Street L tracks, the queasiness in her stomach evaporated, and she realized she was starving. So instead of making an excuse to get away, she went in and sat down and talked. She told him she was Hillary Everest, a tourist in town for the holidays. Hillary Everest. Mike the cop didn't even bat an eye at that, and the thought came to her again that she could say anything to him, anything at all, and he'd believe her. Entranced by the novelty of a policeman taking her words at face value, she kept going, making up a whole story about her holiday adventures in Chicago, complete with a supporting cast of characters, her fool nephew Leo, her spoiled cousin Catherine, and dear old Aunt Effie, with whom she'd been staying. And when she got the inevitable question about whether she had a boyfriend, she conjured up Roman, her steady back home, who she just this morning learned had been stepping out in her absence, watching Mike get aggrieved on her behalf, exactly as she'd predicted he would, gave her a weird thrill. This must be how it had felt for Mama holding her seances. And though it was wrong, hearing the lies come out in Hillary's voice, with Hillary's reflection faint but visible in the window beside the booth, made it feel less wrong somehow. Less Ruby's sin, anyway. So you're headed home tonight, Mike said. To Springfield, Massachusetts, she nodded. I've got to be at work on Monday. It's a shame you're not staying longer. Oh, I'll be back she said, making him light up. Yeah? When? This summer, maybe. Improvising. I was talking to Aunt Effie about maybe taking some courses at the university here. What kind of courses? Journalism. You want to be a reporter? For the first time, he sounded skeptical, though of the idea, not of her. My brother Marvin's a reporter, she said, a touch defensive. No reason I couldn't be, too. Hey. He put up a hand. If that's what you want. If you do come back, you should give me a call. I'll show you the town for real. Maybe, she said. The radio on his belt crackled. Well, listen, he told her. I should get back out there. No, you stay, sit, have some dessert, and don't worry about the check. It's taken care of. He jotted his phone number on a napkin and gave it to her. You have a safe trip home. And tell that Roman guy that Mike says he's a jerk. She watched him walk out, waved to him as he passed on the sidewalk, then focused on Hillary's reflection in the glass. Bad girl, Ruby told her. But Hillary just smiled, shameless, and Ruby felt herself smiling too. She thought, revenge? Free lunch? My own police escort if I want? What else comes with being you? Dessert, miss, the waitress said. With no particular place to go after lunch, she decided to just walk, some vague homing instinct causing her to set off north. As she crossed the river, the wind did its best to remind her she was bare-legged, but Hillary, fortified by a thick slice of chocolate cake, seemed impervious to the cold. As she walked, she thought about the story she told Mike, marveling anew at the pleasure she'd taken in telling it, in crafting it, making up a life, the only limit? Her imagination. Her one regret was using her brother's name. That seemed truly wrong, 
involving Marvin and Hillary's business. Stick to Aunt Effie next time, she told herself. Then she thought, journalism classes? What was that about? She caught Hillary's eye in a passing shop window, asked her the question Mike had asked. You want to be a reporter? Hillary shrugged and turned it back on her. Do you? When she'd gone the better part of a mile, the cold finally began to get to her, so she found a store that was open, a little antique shop on Well Street, and went inside to warm up, telling the man at the front that she was just looking. Just looking was a phrase that had never worked particularly well for Ruby, but Hillary got a much better response, the proprietor inviting her to make herself at home. Back on the street, she began to notice a similar improvement in the reactions of the pedestrians she passed. Many white people, men especially, smiled at Hillary as they went by her. But what was really noteworthy was that the ones who ignored her ignored her in a different way than they would have ignored Ruby. There was no side-eyeing, no pretending not to see her while wondering what she was up to. She didn't require attention. She was free to browse, not just individual establishments, but the world. What else comes with being you? On the edge of Lincoln Park, she chanced upon a white hair salon, Donna's. The salon's sole occupant, a blonde girl filing her own nails, looked up and smiled as Hillary entered. Hi there, I'm Amy, she said. What can I do for you today? Just looking, Ruby almost replied. But she caught herself and said, I'm not sure exactly. Amy gave Hillary's hair a professional once-over. A nice perm, maybe? She suggested. Put some curl into it? No, no curls, Ruby said. She told herself she should just leave, but curiosity got the better of her. Can you just... cut it? Sure, Amy said. How would you like it? She gestured at a line of sample hairstyle photographs culled from magazines, taped up above the long wall mirror. Ruby zeroed in on a photo of a famous aviatrix with a tousled bob cut. She was standing in the open cockpit of a small plane, a shadow of mountains visible behind her. What about that one? Amelia Earhart? Amy nodded. I can do that. If you think your boyfriend won't mind, she explained. Some men don't like hair that short. I'll risk it, Ruby said. While Amy busied herself with Hillary's hair, Ruby tried on a new life story for her. This time she was a Chicago native, born and raised in Hyde Park. Up until last year, she'd worked in her mother's beauty parlor, but then Mama had passed away, and Hillary had sold her share of the business to finance a trip overseas, a dream adventure. Did you go to Paris? Amy asked. Nepal, Ruby replied, just to hear how it sounded. Is that near Paris? Amy asked. Now, having spent more time abroad than she could really afford, Hillary was back, staying at her sister's and looking for a new job before the last of her money ran out. Donna's hiring, if you're interested, Amy said. No, thank you, Ruby said. I'm looking for something different. Like what? I don't know. Eyeing Hillary in the mirror, it's a new situation. If you like flying, you should do what my cousin Holly did. She's an airline stewardess. Goes all over the country, Amy said. She wanted to fly international, too, but the airline people said she wasn't pretty enough. I bet you'd be, though. Maybe you could get paid to go to Nepal. In the mirror, Hillary raised an eyebrow. How do you get a job like that? Ruby asked. I'm not sure how Holly did it, but you could always try that Lightbridge agency. You know, the one with the billboard? A miraculously short time later, Ruby was back on the street. The entire process, shampoo, cut, dry, and manicure, had taken less than an hour. Ruby had known white women had it easier, but my God, this was like getting extra years on her life. And Amelia Earhart's haircut looked good on her, too. She walked west with a new bounce in her step. At the first big intersection she looked up, and there atop a small office building was the billboard Amy had told her about. Joanna Lightbridge Career and Employment Agency. Who do you want to be? The billboard was illustrated with a lineup of white women, modeling professions rather than hairstyles. The stewardess was second from the left, her uniform with its little winged badge 
making her look like an officer in some obscure branch of the Air Force that served martinis. Right next to her was a woman with a steno pad, who might have been a reporter, but was more likely a secretary. But high class, Ruby thought, the kind who'd have her own office in a tower somewhere, and the power to admit or refuse people. As she scanned the rest of the lineup, she felt that weird thrill again, her excitement having less to do with any specific option than with the overall sense of possibility and choice. Who do you want to be? According to the building directory, the Lightbridge Agency was on the sixth floor. But I don't think they're open today, the lobby guard told her. Would you mind if I just went up and took a look? Ruby said. Be my guest. He smiled and nodded at the visitor's log, which she signed, Hillary Earhart, in a bold hand. On the way up, she checked herself over in the polished elevator doors. Should have stopped to buy stockings, she thought, though the dress was long enough that that might go unnoticed. The real problem was the coat, Ruby Dandridge's coat, which, as Amy had noted as politely as possible, didn't suit Hillary at all. It was my mother's. Ruby had told her. She slipped the coat off, draped it over her arm, and smoothed the dress down carefully. Better. The elevator doors opened on a wall of glass with a reception area behind it. The lights were dimmed, and a closed sign hung on the double glass doors. Ruby went up to the glass and peered in at the portrait hanging behind the empty reception desk. It showed an impeccably professional-looking white woman in a blouse and jacket, arms crossed in front of her her brown hair cut short in a style very much like Hillary's. Miss Lightbridge, I presume. Sidestepping a little, Ruby looked down the hall to the left of the reception desk and saw there was a light on in one of the offices back there. She glimpsed a shadow on the wall, a silhouette of a woman with short hair. Ruby smiled, already grown accustomed to Hillary's good fortune. A private audience with the head of the employment agency? Why not? Just don't let us see your ankles. She was reaching for the buzzer beside the glass doors when she noticed a bead of blood on the tip of her finger. She frowned, thinking Amy must have nicked her during the manicure. But when she turned her hand over, it wasn't just her index finger that was bleeding. Red liquid was welling up from under all of her nails. The same panic that had seized her on waking now gripped her again. She felt her heart flutter and skip only it wasn't her heart. It was her breastbone, expanding in her chest, as if a clamp that held the two halves of her ribcage together had suddenly sprung loose. Oh, no, Ruby said. Behind her, the elevator began to close its doors. She turned and lunged for it, smearing blood on the polished metal as she clawed her way back inside. By the time the door slid shut again, the transformation back to her old self was fully underway. As her torso thickened, the bra began to constrict her. She dropped the coat and purse and groped down the back of her dress with both hands. The red shoes bit cruelly into her swelling feet. Reflected in the doors, she saw Hillary's beautiful hair coarsen, darken, and twist while the white of her skin drained away. With a ferocious tug, Ruby snapped the clasp of the bra. She gasped and bent forward, wiping more blood down the front of her dress and watched as the last of the whiteness vanished from her hands and forearms. The elevator, which had been moving, jolted to a halt. Quickly, Ruby snatched up her coat. It was hers again, and buttoned it closed over the worst of the mess. The elevator doors opened. She tried to put her hair into place, realized it was hopeless, and stumbled out into the lobby. Who the fuck are you? the guard said. Just leaving, Ruby replied flashing him a smile that was more like a grimace. She started limping for the exit, the shoes making each step absolute agony. The guard said something else to her, but Ruby kept on going, praying she could withstand the pain long enough to hail a taxi. Three days later, she returned to the house in Hyde Park. She resisted as long as she could, knowing it was madness to go back there, and that the only sane course was to treat the entire incident as if it had never happened. For the first 24 hours after she got home, she almost had herself convinced she was going to be sensible. But on the second day, when the swelling in her feet had gone down and she could walk again, 
she realized she had no interest in resuming her job search. Not as Ruby Dandridge, anyway. And so, on the morning of the third day, she rose early and dressed warm. She thought she might have to hunt around to find the townhouse again, but when the cabbie asked her where to, the address just came to her. On second viewing, the place seemed less like a castle. It was just a big old house in need of maintenance, but there was still an aura of enchantment about it, and Ruby stood for a long time on the sidewalk outside the gate. Last chance, she told herself. You go back in there? You might not escape a second time. But she hadn't even escaped the first time. She clutched her purse and stepped through the gate. She was halfway up the walk when the front door opened and Caleb Braithwaite looked out smiling. Hello, Ruby, he said. Do you remember taking the elixir? They sat on opposite sides of a little parlor, just off the entryway. Ruby had her knife out, and she'd made Braithwaite leave the front door open so she could hear street noises behind her and feel the frigid outside air snaking under her chair and around her ankles. I remember you offering me some kind of potion, Ruby said. I don't remember drinking it. Braithwaite nodded, as if he'd been expecting this answer. That's my fault, I'm afraid. I knew the transformation would be a shock to you, but I should have thought more about what else you'd had to drink that night. Her eyes narrowed. You put something in my drinks? No. You were tipsy, but... I was more than tipsy, Ruby said. You were still in your right mind when you made the choice, Braithwaite said. But the shock of the transformation, on top of the effects of the alcohol, set off a panic attack. Perfectly understandable. The change really is quite startling. Startling, Ruby said, recalling the switch back in the elevator. You ended up passing out from the shock. I thought you just fainted, but you were out cold, so I carried you upstairs and put you into bed. I figured you'd be fine in a few hours. Remembering the slick feel of the satin against her skin, you took my clothes off? They were falling off you. You torn your dress during the panic attack. So you decided to finish the job. Just took the liberty. No liberties. I put you into bed. That's all. Then waited up to see if you'd wake. But you slept through the night. In the morning I had some work to do, down in the basement. And when I came back up to check on you, you'd gone. I decided not to chase after you. I didn't want to upset you any more than I already had, and I expected you'd come back on your own. I've made some adjustments to the elixir formula, he added. The next time you take it, the change should be less jarring. Who said there's going to be a next time? That is why you're here, isn't it? He gave her a long look. But before we go any farther, he continued, there's something I need to come clean about. It wasn't an accident, the two of us meeting up the way we did. What do you mean, Ruby said. I have a powerful intuition, Braithwaite told her. A talent for sensing opportunities. I'm very good at finding ways to get what I want. I need it to be, to have any chance at satisfaction while my father was alive. You're saying your intuition told you to come find me on that corner? Yes, he hesitated. But there's more to it than that. There are some things I haven't told you about what I'm doing in Chicago that may upset you. And I do want to come clean. But I need you to understand. Oh, I understand, Ruby interrupted. You're telling me you're a liar. And New Year's Eve was just a setup. She shrugged, like this was no big thing to her. But in fact, she felt betrayed and furious that she'd allowed herself to be taken in. You're a smooth operator. I'll grant you that. No, Braithwaite said. No, Ruby, it wasn't like that. I did have an agenda that night, it's true, but I also enjoyed myself. It was fun being out with you. The conversation, the dancing, the kissing. He smiled. Yeah, you can just go on and forget about that, Ruby said, wagging the knife. All right. Braithwaite put his hands up, but a smile said, we'll see. What about those two men by the car? She asked. Was that a coincidence? A happy accident? Happy? It's not that I wasn't pleased with the way the night was already going. Another smile. But at some point, I did need to come around to making my offer. And if we'd gotten any more intimate, that might have been awkward. 
running into those men provided a useful change in mood. What if they'd killed us? Ruby said. What would the mood have been like then? There's no way they could have hurt me. And you were never in any real danger either. Ruby shook her head. You're just a piece of work, aren't you? I'm a man who knows what he wants and how to get it, Braithwaite said. I understand you're angry and you have reason to be, but be honest, Ruby. I was right. You want this. Even if I do, Ruby said, that doesn't mean I'm not out of my damn mind. Then she shook her head again and said, Tell me about the job. It had gotten very cold, so with Ruby's permission, Braithwaite shut the front door. They went back into the kitchen. Braithwaite set a tea kettle on the stove, and then he and Ruby sat at the table in the sun. He told her a story. It began in Massachusetts in 1795, with a coven of white men led by Titus Braithwaite, a cousin to one of Caleb's paternal ancestors. The covenant sought to harness the power of creation, but had gotten something wrong, said open sesame when they should have said abracadabra, and called down Armageddon instead. The story then jumped ahead a hundred years to Caleb's grandfather Addison, who'd formed a coven of his own, and Caleb's father, Samuel, who'd expanded the coven and built a new manor house on the ruin of Titus Braithwaite's old estate. In the course of their researches, they learned about a slave girl, Hannah, who'd escaped Titus Braithwaite's apocalypse, bearing her old master's unborn child. They spent years trying to find out what had become of her, but it was Caleb and his intuition that finally solved the puzzle and tracked down the last surviving member of that particular bloodline. As Braithwaite described the plot his father had hatched to lure Atticus out to Massachusetts, Ruby remembered a phone call she'd gotten from George Berry last June, asking if she could watch Horace while George and Atticus went east to deal with some sort of family business, and she recalled who else had tagged along on that road trip. When Atticus and George came to your daddy's house, Ruby asked, were they alone or... They were supposed to be, Braithwaite said, but your sister decided to come with them. Making it sound like a compliment, he added, Letitia's a difficult girl. You don't know the half of it, Ruby thought. But then she thought, or maybe you do. This chapter of the story ended with Braithwaite betraying his father and saving the lives of Atticus and the others. Then after a brief time out to collect his inheritance, Braithwaite had come to Chicago and made contact with another white men's coven. There was more backstory here, but at the first mention of the name Hiram Winthrop, Ruby interrupted. Winthrop? As in the Winthrop house? Yes. And to answer your next few questions in advance, yes, I'm the one responsible for Letitia getting the house. The lawyer who gave her the money and the realtor were both working for me. Penumbra Real Estate is a company my father set up. I'm the real owner of the property. Ruby was shaking her head before he'd finished. I knew it! she said. I knew it was too good to be true. She glared at him. Why? Why her? Intuition, Braithwaite said calmly. I had thought about moving into the Winthrop house myself. I believe the house is hiding some valuable secrets, but uncovering them meant dealing with Winthrop's ghost. And not that I don't love a good contest of wills, but it occurred to me there might be a better candidate for this one. Letitia, but why would you think? Your sister is very tenacious. I had a feeling that if she were properly motivated, if it meant she got to keep the house, she'd find a way to tame Winthrop. Obviously, I was right. Yeah, you were right, Ruby said. But you were wrong, too. Tisha doesn't know it was you who gave her the house, does she? No. And I hope you won't tell her. It wouldn't make her happy. Like you care if she's happy. I do care, actually, Braithwaite said. I like Letitia. But she doesn't like you, does she? So even now she's living in the Winthrop house, it doesn't get you what you want. You can't go ask her if she's found anything. No, Braithwaite agreed. But you can. And that's the job? You want me to spy on my sister? As a small part of the job, he said delicately, I'd like you to spend some time with your sister. Don't interrogate her. Just ask how she's been. 
see if she volunteers anything. Strike up a conversation with Atticus, too, and whatever other tenants you can. Maybe do a little poking around the house yourself. What, on my own? Ruby said. Not a chance. All right. Just talk to the tenants, then. See if anyone stumbled across anything interesting. Books, maps, keys, strange devices, secret rooms. I'd also like to know if anyone else has come around asking questions, or if anyone seems to be watching the house. Anyone like who? White man, Braithwaite said. Police, especially. She regarded him coldly. What have you got my sister mixed up in? That's another long story, and I'll tell it to you. But first, there's a gathering I'd like you to attend tomorrow night. It'll answer a lot of your questions, and afterwards, we can talk about the rest of the job. What kind of gathering? You talking about a party? Don't worry. You won't be serving canapes. You'll be a guest. Yeah, well, Ruby said, my party dress got torn. Braithwaite placed a small glass vial on the table, the red liquid inside it seeming to glow in the sunlight. I've got something that'll fit you, he said. Practical divination, the old woman said. Not gypsy mumbo-jumbo, but rational forecasting based on math. It's been the main focus of our research since October of 29, and we made solid progress. Notwithstanding the odd bobble now and then, more recently, I've also developed a personal interest in the restorative arts. She looked down at the sclerotic hand that gripped the cane she leaned on. Would that I'd begun a bit sooner, but one always assumes one will have more time. So what about you, dearie? What's your field? I talk to dead people, Hillary said. By what method? Spirit radio? Barton's teletype? Not Planchet's, surely. No, I just talk to them. It's a gift. My mother could do it, too. The woman drew back slightly, lips pursed, as if Hillary had said something distasteful. But then she grinned wolfishly and chuckled. A gift? Careful who you say that to in here, dearie. They're liable to burn you for a witch. Small-minded people don't scare me, Hillary said, which earned another chuckle. No, said the old woman. I can see they don't. Nantucket, you said. Hillary nodded. We're a small lodge, smaller than we used to be. Our lodge master defected to Ardham last spring. We're still reorganizing. Ardham. The old woman pursed her lips again. I lost one of mine to them, too. But I understand he came to a bad end, as did his seducer, Mr. Braithwaite. Another chuckle. Let's have some champagne, shall we, dearie? Where's that waiter? As the old woman turned slowly in search of a drinks tray, Ruby surfaced and made her own scan of the ballroom, looking for Caleb Braithwaite. Earlier, she'd sat with him in his car in the parking lot of this country club, watching through tinted glass as the other guests arrived, Braithwaite identifying each one by the city whose sorcerer's coven they represented. Baltimore, Atlanta, New Orleans, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, some two dozen more. The old woman was New York, and between limousine arrivals, Braithwaite gave Ruby her cover story. You shouldn't have to say much. You'll be the only good-looking woman there. Most of them will want to flirt with you. Let them. Smile and look fascinated, and let them talk. See what they give away. The plan was for the two of them to arrive separately, so when the time came, Braithwaite drove several miles to a garage where Ruby's own limousine waited. Don't worry, he told her. You'll be fine. Just mingle and observe. Ruby was worried, though, and so nervous that by the time the limo had brought her back, she wasn't sure she'd be able to go through with it. In desperation, she sought Hillary's eyes in the rear view. Hillary looked back in that archway she had, ready to take charge. So Ruby let her. It was Hillary who stepped confidently from the limo to the curb. Hillary, who strode into the club as if she owned the place, barely pausing to show her invitation to the dark-suited men at the door. In the lobby, she stopped to check herself in a mirror. The physical transformation, though no less strange, had been painless this time. Her red hair had come back full length. Rather than cut it again, she decided to wear it natural, 
Brushed out and lightly tousled by the wind, it had a wildness that contrasted nicely with her dress. Red huntress in a black evening gown. She proceeded to the ballroom. The buzz of conversation dipped as she entered and heads turned her way. Hillary assessed the crowd, deciding where to start, settling on an elderly trio, San Francisco, St. Louis, and Des Moines, giving her dirty old man looks from a nearby table. She went over and introduced herself. Upon learning Hillary was from Nantucket, San Francisco quipped, I think I know a limerick about you. To which St. Louis replied, Now, now you mean her brother. While Des Moines wet his lips and counted the freckles in her cleavage. Two fools and a toad, Ruby thought. But Hillary didn't even bother to be bothered. She sat and took their measures. San Francisco, despite his jocularity, was in considerable pain. He kept palming his abdomen and grimacing, and each time he did so, he looked over at the table where Los Angeles was sitting. Des Moines was insecure and self-conscious, and glad to meet someone whose lodge, he thought, must be even more insignificant than his own. Yet even as he judged Hillary to be beneath him, he also felt a need to impress her. He bragged about his lodge's library and its most recent acquisition, something called the Codex Phantasmagoria, the Ziegler transcription, with all seven commentaries. You know how rare that is? She didn't, but she sensed that St. Louis wanted the Codex for himself and was making nice to Des Moines in hopes of getting a chance to steal it. After a few moments, she excused herself, cutting off Des Moines in the middle of a monologue and moved on to another table. As Hillary continued to work the room, Ruby relaxed, realizing that these folk too were inclined to take her at face value, nor did they seem especially alien to her. The main difference between them and other rich, self-important white people she had encountered being their willingness to converse with her, about necromancy. But even the talk of magic wasn't that peculiar, for most of them spoke of it as they would of money or politics or any other means of bending the world to their will. She found she didn't like them much, and she had no compunction at all about lying to them. Among the general run of fools and cranks were some truly awful human beings while pretending to be spellbound by Denver's ruminations on mind control, Hillary leaned back to eavesdrop on Los Angeles and Las Vegas at the table behind her. Vegas, puzzled over having been snubbed by San Francisco earlier, said, I don't know what the hell's eating him. And Los Angeles laughed and said, I do. Then he said that you could fuck someone on a deal, or you could trust their restaurant recommendation, but only a moron did both. A little while later, she joined a table full of Southerners. Dallas was a middle-aged cowgirl with a husky voice and a body sense of humor, and Richmond, Atlanta, and New Orleans were cultured gents who grasped the distinction between charming and repulsive. It was the most pleasant encounter Hillary had had so far, until the topic of conversation swung without warning to what the men all referred to as the Negras. Dallas used a more familiar pronunciation. It was nothing Ruby hadn't heard or overheard a million times before. But there was a difference between having people talk about you or at you and having them talk to you, believing you were one of them and expecting you to think as they did. It took a significant effort on Hillary's part not to give herself away and to extricate herself from the conversation without telling the one sort of lie Ruby considered unpardonable. Silence in the face of some things being damning enough. And then there was Coeur d'Alene, a blonde skeleton with crazy eyes and an expression so perpetually hate-filled that if he'd stood up and begun firing a rifle into the crowd, it would have come as no particular surprise. He had a whole corner of the ballroom to himself, as none of the other guests would come near him, and in this, Hillary followed the general wisdom. But as she made her escape from the southerner's table, she happened to glance his way and a certainty came over her that the rage blasting from his eyes was of the same species of the vileness on Dallas's lips. Awful people. After nearly an hour among them, she'd had enough and started looking around the room for Caleb Braithwaite, wanting him to come so this could be over. But whatever grand entrance he was planning, it wasn't time yet. She did spot his partner, Chicago, having what looked like an intense conversation with a large representative from Amesboro, Wisconsin. And then she saw Des Moines on his feet and headed her way, 
That was when, seeking shelter, she went over and said hello to New York. New York had managed to flag down one of the circulating waiters, a tall, dark-skinned Negro in his twenties. As she selected a glass of champagne from the tray he offered her, she gave him a long look and said, My, you're a strapping one, aren't you, dearie? The waiter, his true self, almost as well hidden here as Ruby's, only smiled politely, as if New York had complimented him on his choice of bow tie, and turned quickly to offer the tray to Hillary. Miss? No, thank you, Hillary said. You're not drinking? New York said, watching the waiter walk away. I can't. I have a condition. Pity. She drained her own glass in a few gulps. Well, come on, dearie. Let's have a look at Lancaster's prize before another line forms. On the wall at one end of the ballroom hung a painting of a gray-bearded frontiersman riding a horse along a riverbank. Visible behind him was a hilltop fort flying the stars and stripes. Ruby surmised that this was Morgan Glastonbury, who, according to Caleb Braithwaite, had founded the Chicago chapter of the Order in 1847. In his youth, Glastonbury had been a member of Titus Braithwaite's coven, one of the lucky ones, who'd been deemed too inexperienced or too untalented to participate in the apocalyptic ritual. A display case had been installed under Glastonbury's portrait and was being guarded by six of the dark-suited security men. Inside the case, a large and ancient-looking book lay open, its exposed pages covered in strange letters. The Book of Names, New York said, gazing even more lustfully at the pages than she had to the waiter. Ruby peered out from behind Hillary's eyes, curious, that title evoking for her the book in which the Heavenly Father records the names of the saved. But this book of names didn't look like it was in God's hand. Pardon me, New York addressed the man in charge of the book's guard to detail, Mr. Burke. Mr. Burke, this is the Winthrop copy? Yes. A mean little grin appeared on his face as he anticipated her next question and his own answer to it. There's a page in the second appendix I'd very much like a look at. Could you? Sorry. Burke said, not sorry at all. The case stays locked. I understand you don't want me handling it, but perhaps you could. If I opened the case for you, I'd have to open it for everyone, and then we'd have problems. New York pursed her lips. In my invitation to this event, I was given to understand. I don't care what you were given to understand, Burke said, enjoying himself. My orders are, the case stays locked. I don't care for your tone, young man. Hillary backed up, not wanting to get caught in the crossfire if New York started casting lightning bolts with her cane. She felt someone behind her and turned. It was Chicago. He had the face of a retired boxer who'd given up the ring for a bar stool, but behind that brutish mask was a perceptive intelligence that, just now, he let show. You must be the delegate from Nantucket he said, offering his hand. Rose Endicott, Hillary said, taking it. His grip was firm and communicated a strength that could easily have crushed her fingers. John Lancaster, he said. I'm glad you could come. A little surprised, too. When Braithwaite told me he'd invited you, I didn't think you'd accept. Given the history between your lodges, our dispute was with Braithwaite's father, Hillary said. All water under the bridge, huh? He studied her, his face not a boxer's now, but a cop's. Lancaster! New York elbowed her way in between them. Lancaster, a word. Sorry, Madeline, Lancaster said. I've got to get the show started. We'll talk later. A last glance at Hillary, and he walked away, faster than New York with her cane could follow. Lancaster headed for the open space beneath the chandelier at the center of the ballroom. Attention, he called. Everybody give me your attention. The room fell silent. At this time I need everyone who is in security or an invited guest to clear out. The Negro waiters made their way, not unhappily, Ruby thought, towards the exit, a few guests jumping up to grab more champagne as they went by. When the staff had left and the doors were shut, Lancaster signaled to one of his men, who dimmed all the lights except those on the chandelier. Welcome to Chicago, Lancaster said. 
Thanks for coming. I know it's a long way for some of you, not just in terms of miles, but in terms of trust. I appreciate your restraint, agreeing to treat this as neutral ground. He smiled paternally, as at a group of exceptionally well-behaved children. I'm not much of a speechmaker, he continued. My predecessor, Bill Warwick, he could give a hell of a speech. I've always been more of a doer than a talker. But I know how to listen, and I know good sense when I hear it. Late last summer, I got a call from the new Lodge Master of Ardham, saying he had a proposal. I was skeptical. If you know the history between Chicago and Ardham, you know it's not exactly hearts and flowers. And here's this kid, Samuel Braithwaite's kid, calling me on the phone saying he wants to sit down. Well, I could have hung up on him. Or I could have lured him in and taken his head for old time's sake. But I decided to hear him out. And what I heard made good sense. Now he is young, Lancaster cautioned. And because of that, I know some of you are going to have trouble taking him seriously. This is the order of the ancient dawn, after all. Most of us prefer to take our cues from those with a little more life experience. He brushed a hand over his graying flat top. So I'm going to ask you to listen to him as if he were speaking for me. Because he is. And if you give our proposal a fair hearing, I think you'll find it makes good sense for you too. Mr. Braithwaite, the floor is yours. Lancaster raised a hand towards a table at the edge of the open space, clearly expecting Braithwaite to be there, but his gesture was directed at an empty chair. He looked left and right, trying to see where Braithwaite had got to. The moment grew awkward, then comical. Braithwaite, he said. There were chuckles in the crowd, and a louder laugh Ruby recognized as belonging to Dallas. Lancaster went over to one of his men, whispering, Where the hell is he? And then suddenly Braithwaite was there, stepping forward, seemingly out of thin air, to occupy the central space that Lancaster had just abandoned. Nice trick, Ruby thought, and around her, she sensed the other guests thinking the same thing. Only Lancaster missed it, continuing to scowl at his man for a few more seconds until Braithwaite said, his voice soft but carrying, Thank you, Lodge Master. Lancaster spun around, startled and angry, but Braithwaite acted as if nothing unusual had happened and only bowed his head respectfully. Lancaster got control of himself. He nodded back and seated the floor, going to sit in the chair with Braithwaite, Hat, and Ben. Then Braithwaite raised his head and looked around the assembled guests. The lights on the chandelier seemed to brighten, flattering him in a way they hadn't done for Lancaster, revealing him to be not just more attractive, but more present somehow, more vital. Lancaster had called him young, and he was, but young in this light didn't seem like a bad thing at all. Thank you all for coming, Caleb Braithwaite said. I'd like to start by clearing up a misconception. You all know my father died last June, and by now I'm sure you've all heard the rumor of how it happened. He was trying to complete the ritual first attempted by Titus Braithwaite in 1795. The ritual failed, less spectacularly this time. The house and the servants were spared, but all of the members of the lodge perished, except one. He pressed a hand to his chest. Los Angeles spoke mockingly from the crowd. So then, no survivors of note. Braithwaite took the barb gracefully. Some people might feel that way, he acknowledged. But again, I'm here to clear up a misconception, not spread more ignorance. As I was saying, you've heard the rumor of how my father died. But what you've heard is false. The ritual didn't fail. It probably would have. My father himself put the odds of success at no more than 50-50. My own calculations were more pessimistic. I estimated the likelihood of failure was closer to 80%, with a significant chance of catastrophe. 80%, Caleb Braithwaite said. Four out of five. For a long time I thought about playing those odds, but in the end, I decided it just wasn't good enough. I needed to be sure, and I wanted them all dead. There was a slow stirring among the listeners as they grasped the import of his words. Ruby saw Lancaster frown, 
this particular revelation apparently not part of the speech he'd sanctioned. That's right, Braithwaite went on. I sabotaged the ritual. I killed them all, the whole damn lodge. You know why? Because I was tired of the bullshit. Understand, I admired my father. I respected him, up to a point. He had a first-rate intelligence and a virtuoso's grasp of the art. His defect lay elsewhere. It was the same flaw that Titus Braithwaite suffered from, the same flaw that afflicts all too many of you. He had a scientist's mind, a modern mind, but his heart was old. It was an alchemist's heart, a wizard's heart. Another louder stir. Ruby had spent enough of her life in church to recognize the cause. Blasphemy. Lancaster was on his feet now, looking like he might call a halt before the crowd could become a mob. But Braithwaite was just getting warmed up. The Adamite Order of the Ancient Dawn, he said, his tone sneering. Does that sound like a scientific organization to you? Because I'll tell you what it sounds like to me. A joke. Alchemists he shouted. Alchemists all toiling away in your little clacks, jealous of each other, keeping secrets from each other. When you're not busy plotting, you waste most of your time reinventing the wheel, rediscovering esoteric wisdom that ought to be common knowledge by now. And if you do learn something new, you hoard it. Lock it away, up here. He tapped his forehead. Or write it down in one book and then hide that book, And when the odds catch up to you, when the ritual goes wrong, when the book is lost, when the mind that wrote it is destroyed, then it's back to square one for the next generation. I could have waited my turn. Could have waited for my father to blow up the house, just like Titus Braithwaite did a century and a half ago. Or for one of his associates to stab him in the back or curse him or cast him into an alternate dimension. But I value my time. And I don't see the point of running an experiment whose outcome is a foregone conclusion. I'm sick of belonging to an order that wants to change the world, but can't even change itself. I'm tired of the bullshit. So I decided to hurry my father along. Get him to the end of the road he was traveling so I could get started forging a new path. A modern path. A no-bullshit path. And the reason I'm here talking to you tonight is that I believe, I hope, that some of you might be ready to forge a new path to. Might be ready to come together and start acting like scientists, not alchemists. He paused, and the silence that met him was respectful, or at least attentive. Richmond spoke up. What is it you have in mind, Mr. Braithwaite? Union? Union, Braithwaite agreed smiling, or confederacy, if you prefer. That's been tried before, said Las Vegas. On a small scale, yes, said Braithwaite. Two or three lodges talking about a merger with plans for further expansion, but it never goes beyond the first step, because somebody always gets greedy or decides the other party is about to betray them, and then it ends in tears. So what's going to be different this time, asked Baltimore. You think you can merge all of us at once? You think that'll be easier? Not easier, no, Caleb Braithwaite said. But absolutely worth trying. One lodge, spanning the entire country, so big and powerful that any natural philosopher worth the name will want to be part of it. Your individual chapters will still control their own affairs, but you'll operate under one set of bylaws administered by a board of directors empowered to settle disputes. There will be no more hoarding or needless duplication of effort. Like the scientists we claim to be, we'll share information. We'll share resources and risk as well. If you have a particularly urgent research project, here he looked at some of the older and frailer guests, you'll be able to apply for help with it. And we'll decide, together, how to exploit the discoveries we make how to change the world once we can. And who's going to run this fantasy organization, Los Angeles said. If you've got a board of directors, you're going to need a chairman, right? Or a chairwoman, put in Dallas. I have an idea for that, 
Braithwaite said. I, I'll just bet you do, said Los Angeles. You know, Braithwaite, there's more than one story going around about your father. I heard a rumor that right before he died, he found a living descendant of Titus Braithwaite, a direct bloodline descendant. Ruby saw a few other guests nod, but it appeared that this was news to much of the crowd. Now what occurs to me, L.A. continued, you must know there's no way in hell we'd accept a squirt like you as our leader. But maybe you and Lancaster are cooking up a scheme to put this long-lost cousin of yours in charge. Braithwaite didn't react, but Lancaster laughed, louder than he probably intended to. I'm sorry, did I say something funny? I don't think you're funny, Braithwaite said. But you're right. We are going to need a leader. I won't insult you by pretending I don't have an idea who that leader should be. And if there were a living descendant of Titus Braithwaite, and if I thought by trotting him out I could sway some of you to my point of view, well, I'd be tempted. But the problem with appeals to authority is that they're ultimately subjective. One man's honor tradition is another's superstition. And that's where the knives come out. Fortunately, as natural philosophers, we have a more objective standard to rely on. Merit. We're students of nature. And nature has rules, rules that can't be bent or broken or bargained with, only understood. And through that understanding comes power, power that can be demonstrated objectively. So I propose we do that, Caleb Braithwaite said. Chicago has been the site of two world's fairs, two exhibitions of scientific progress. I say we hold an exhibition of our own. I say we meet back here a few months from now on Midsummer's Day. Each lodge will bring an example of its best work, its truest and most advanced expression of the art. We'll all show what we can do, and then we'll see. We'll see who really is the best among us, who deserves to lead. New Orleans laughed. Like Moses and the wise men of Pharaoh, Mr. Braithwaite, one snake gobbles up all the others. Is that what you have in mind? I'm hoping for something less confrontational, Braithwaite said. But why not? If you think your snake is the biggest, it'll be a goddamn bloodbath. This from Coeur d'Alene, which caused heads to swivel in surprise, for he sounded almost happy. Snakes? More like wild dogs. We'll rip each other to fucking pieces before we agree on who's best. We might, Braithwaite conceded. I agree the chance of failure is high. But when I think of what we might accomplish as a unified lodge, I consider that a long shot worth playing. It'll never work, said Los Angeles. You don't have to come then, Braithwaite said. But for those of you who are willing, there'll be an additional incentive. By now you've all had a chance to see the Book of Names. There are other versions of the book extant, but the Winthrop copy is unique. It's by far the oldest, and it includes material not found in any other known edition. The book was recently recovered after being missing for nearly twenty years. It properly belongs to the Chicago Lodge, but Lodge Master Lancaster has graciously allowed me access to it, and at my own considerable expense, I'm having copies made. One for each of you. They'll be ready by Midsummer's Day. World's Fair Door Prizes, Mr. Braithwaite, New York said, unable to conceal the tremble of excitement in her voice. It's not quite that simple, he told her. You'll need to do a little more than just show up. What? said Des Moines. What do we have to do? Try, Braithwaite said. He looked around the room, gathering them all in, and once again, the light shining on him seemed to brighten. Maybe we won't be able to agree on a leader, or a new set of bylaws, and a merger can't work without real agreement. So to require success would be unreasonable. But a good faith effort, that's not too much to ask. And that's what it's going to take, if you want a copy of the book, a good faith effort. And who decides? Los Angeles began, but Braithwaite overrode him. But if you can't be bothered to even try, if you come in bad faith, if there is a bloodbath, then you get nothing, Braithwaite said. 
and you deserve nothing. Because then you really are just a pack of alchemists. So that's the deal, he concluded. And I thank you for listening. Before we bring the waiters back in, I'll give you one more thing to think about. My father liked to say that history doesn't stand still. The world has changed a great deal since Titus Braithwaite's day, and it's about to change a whole lot more. What remains to be decided is what say, if any, you'll have in those changes. Do you want to choose your own future? Or are you content to have it chosen for you? And if it's the former, what are you willing to risk? Who and what are you willing to become? These are the questions you need to consider. But think quickly. Because history doesn't stand still. And we're running out of time. Once more, Ruby lay on satin sheets, but in a bigger bed this time. Beyond the bed's foot, she could see Caleb Braithwaite, shirtless, seated on a stool at a vanity table, shaving. She had Hillary to blame for this. Driving back from the country club, Ruby had found herself strangely spellbound by the way the headlights of passing cars illuminated the planes of Braithwaite's face and by the motion of his arms and shoulders as he steered an evasive course through the city streets. She recognized that what she was experiencing was an effect of the same glamour Braithwaite had used to sway the crowd during his speech, but knowing the feeling was artificial didn't make her feel it any less. And while she could have resisted, she decided not to. Instead, as they returned to the house in Hyde Park, Ruby told herself that while she was too smart to be seduced by magic, if Hillary did it, it didn't count. Now, by the sober light of dawn, she could see red finger marks streaking Braithwaite's bare back. They'd been in the middle of the act when the potion started to wear off. Ruby had felt the blood well up under her nails, but they were too far gone to quit. And so she just hung on, shuddering and crying out, while her flesh snapped back into its original shape. Reflected in the vanity's mirror, she could see another set of red marks. A circle of letters tattooed on Braithwaite's chest. Letters from the same strange alphabet used to compose the Book of Names. My mark of Cain, he told her. It keeps me safe. It keeps me safe. So he knew his Bible, at least. Ruby recalled another white boy she'd been with briefly, Danny Young, who one day had begun expounding on a theory he had that the mark God put on Cain was actually dark skin, and that everything bad that had befallen the Negroes, slavery, lynching, Jim Crow, was a result of their being Cain's descendants. You'd be a better Christian if you learned how to read, Ruby had told him. Cain's mark was a protection. If the mark was his skin color, then God must have turned him white, not black. Braithwaite was watching her in the mirror now. Having second thoughts? More like seventh or eighth. You were going to tell me about the job after, Ruby reminded him, her tone saying, you better not expect this here to be a regular part of it. Playtime's over, huh? He put down the razor, wiped his face, and turned around smiling. I admire your work ethic, Miss Dandridge. Never mind what you admire, Ruby said. Get to the point. All right. I assume you understand what I'm about now. You want to be the Al Capone of warlocks. More like the Frank Costello, if we're going with a mafia analogy, Braithwaite said. Abbott or Costello, I don't care, said Ruby. But your friend Lancaster, he thinks he should be the big boss. And maybe you promised you'd back him on that? Promised is a strong word. Let's say he takes it for granted that he ought to be the man in charge, and I try not to contradict him. You need to try harder, then. After your speech last night, even a stupid man would know you want the crown for yourself. And Lancaster's not stupid. No, Braithwaite said. But he believes he can slap me down whenever he chooses, so he'll keep me around as long as I'm useful. He's got his men watching me. I know they're there, and I can slip away from them when I need to, but it's not always convenient. And if I do it too often, he'll start worrying. So what would be very helpful to me over the next few months would be to have someone I can call on to run errands for me. Someone who can be white or colored, Ruby guessed, as the need arises. As the need arises. Does that sound like something you could do? Depends on the errands. But supposing I say yes, how would it work? Lancaster knows more about me than I'd like, Braithwaite told her. But he doesn't know about this house. 
and if for some reason he were to investigate the property, he'd find that it belongs to a Miss Francine Chase. Miss Chase is a shut-in, whose neighbors never see her, but recently she's been advertising for a new live-in maid. Hmm, said Ruby. So I'll move in here, and then what? Just wait around in case you need something? We'll prearrange times for you to be available, in case I call or come by. Generally, no more than two or three hours on any given day. The rest of your time will be your own, to do with as you like. And as who you like. The only other rule concerns how you come and go from this house. As Ruby, you'll always use the front door. But as... Hillary. As Hillary, you'll go up to the roof. There's another empty townhouse around the corner from here that you can reach by walking along the rooftops. Hillary will come and go through there. And how long is this arrangement supposed to last? Until you get your crown? Braithwaite nodded. I'd say six months to a year, depending on how Midsummer's Day goes and what happens after. And then? Then, unless you decide you want a continuing relationship, we go our separate ways. And you get this a severance. He opened a drawer in the vanity and handed her a copy of the deed to the townhouse. It's not as grand as the Winthrop house, but at least it's not haunted. And it comes with a supply of the elixir. So what do you say, Ruby? She stared at the deed, feeling scared and trying not to show it. She thought, I know what I'd say if somebody else told me they'd been offered a deal like this. Tell me something. What you said in your speech about changing the world, what is it you're going to do, exactly, if you get the kind of power you want? Nothing you have to worry about. You and your people will be protected. My people? The people you care about, Braithwaite said. Your family, your friends. They'll all be looked after. I promise. So what do you say, Ruby? Was it Jekyll or Hyde who was the bad one? Ruby asked. Noon of a Sunday, and she was eating lunch at the Winthrop house with her sister and Atticus, having invited herself over after church. Letitia's obvious pleasure at the visit had Ruby feeling guilty. Mr. Hunt was the alter ego, Atticus said, the one who went out and did all the things that Dr. Jekyll was too respectable to do. Yeah, but they were both bad. This from Mr. Fox, one of Letitia's tenants, playing chess with his daughter at the other end of the dining table. They were the same man. But didn't... Ruby struggled to remember the story, which she'd read a long time ago in school. Didn't the two of them end up fighting or something? Mr. Hyde killed someone, right? And then Dr. Jekyll tried to get rid of him. Hyde got out of hand, Atticus said. Hyde was Jekyll, but Jekyll with all the good bleached out of him, and most of the self-control. That's how come he beats her Carew to death. Jekyll stopped taking the potion and tried to go straight, but it was too late. Hyde started coming out on his own. The thing people overlook, though, Mr. Fox added, is that that whole part of the story describing the relationship between Jekyll and Hyde, that's all Dr. Jekyll talking. And you can't trust Jekyll. As Mr. Fox spoke, he looked away from the chessboard, and his daughter took the opportunity to sneak her queen onto a different square. So what are you saying? asked Ruby. You think Dr. Jekyll was lying about what Mr. Hyde was really like? I'm saying people can be real creative when it comes to ducking responsibility. You got this guy who confesses to a murder, plus a whole bunch of other bad stuff he won't even describe, but he's got this complicated explanation for why it technically wasn't him. And he says he's remorseful, but right up to the end, he's trying to escape being held to account for what he did. Mr. Funk shrugged. Maybe Mr. Hyde was pure evil, but Dr. Jekyll would want to believe that even if Hyde was just Jekyll with a different face. He turned back to the board and with a firm gesture moved his daughter's queen back where it belonged. What do you want to know about Mr. Hyde for? Letitia asked. No reason, Ruby said. Two days later, Ruby sat alone in the kitchen of the house in Hyde Park, waiting on Braithwaite's call. Since taking the job, she'd run four errands for him, twice as herself, She'd gone downtown on shopping trips for the non-existent Miss Chase, each time making her way to a second-floor window in Carson's department store. The window overlooked one of Lancaster's favorite lunch spots, and her mission was to see who, if anyone, he left the restaurant with. On the first occasion, he'd been alone, but on the second, he was with that lodge master from the village in Wisconsin, 
For her third errand, she'd gone, as Hillary, to a downtown parking garage, exited a certain stairwell at quarter past two, found Braithwaite's Daimler, and driven to a service garage in Oak Park that specialized in exotic foreign cars. The mechanics were expecting her, so she didn't even have to crack a window. She just sat tight in the Daimler while they changed the oil and checked the tires and performed several other time-consuming maintenance procedures. Then she drove back to the loop. She did have one bad moment, when the unmarked police car that had tailed her to and from Oak Park looked as though it might follow her into the parking garage. But that proved to be a false alarm. Up until yesterday, the worst part of the job wasn't the errands themselves or the waiting, but the uncertainty of the scheduling. It was true, as Braithwaite said, that much of her time was her own, but never being sure when she'd be free placed limits on what she could do when she was, even as a white woman. She quickly realized that a second job was out of the question, let alone a career. She consoled herself with the thought that this was a temporary situation, just a few months, a year at most, and at least she wasn't doing anything bad. Then yesterday, she'd had a new errand. Once again, she'd gone as Hillary, but Hillary in disguise. Before setting out, she'd pinned her hair up under a kerchief, donned sunglasses, and put on Ruby's coat over a drab, tan dress. At noon, she entered the central police station and asked the front desk sergeant where she could find the burglary division. She climbed the stairs to the third floor, turning left rather than right as she'd been directed, and came to a door marked Special Investigations, Organized Crime Unit. The room inside was unoccupied just then, as Braithwaite had intuited it would be, but she didn't have much time. As she moved to an interior office whose door sat Captain John Lancaster, she felt in her coat pocket for the charm Braithwaite had given her. It was a disc of polished bone, about the size of a half dollar. Engraved on one side was the image of an owl with eyes so large and round they seemed more like binoculars. The obverse was marked with more of those strange letters, stained with what Ruby pretended was red ink. Braithwaite hadn't said what this token was for, only that she was to hide it somewhere in or near Lancaster's desk. Finding one of the lower drawers unlocked, she stuck the charm at the very back, behind a rack of hanging files. She'd made it back out to the stairs, and it just started down when she saw two men coming up. One of them was Burke, the mean-spirited security man from the party. Hillary stayed cool and didn't react, trusting to her disguise, and Burke, who was talking to the other man, didn't even glance at her as he went by. But as she reached the half-landing, she heard Burke fall silent and sensed him looking back, and it took all her self-control not to look back as well. She continued down the stairs and across the lobby, hearing footsteps behind her the whole way and expecting any second to feel a hand on her shoulder. She went out onto the street and hailed a cab, still not looking back, not until the cab was several blocks from the station, and then, recognizing that she had gotten away, she proceeded to go into shock shaking uncontrollably and nearly passing out. In the evening, Braithwaite came by the townhouse in person to congratulate her on a job well done. He took Hillary out to dinner, and afterwards he made a point of restocking Ruby's supply of elixir, bringing up seven fresh vials from his workshop in the basement. Then with the lights in the kitchen shining on him just so, he asked whether, perhaps, she might like him to stay the night. No thank you, Mr. Braithwaite, she'd said. I think I'll sleep better on my own. She hustled him out, taking a fleeting satisfaction from his look of disappointment. Once he was gone, though, she started wondering whether he'd made the offer precisely so she could have the pleasure of refusing him, so she'd feel more in control. She thought, six months to a year of mind games and nervous breakdowns? What's that going to do to you? Assuming you don't just get caught. This morning, she felt better about it. She told herself, that if she didn't have an errand today, maybe Hillary would drop by the Lightbridge Agency, just to browse. In the meantime, she sat at the kitchen table in the sun, reading from the book that Atticus had lent her. Now the hand of Henry Jekyll, as you have often remarked, was professional in shape and size. It was large, firm, white, and comely. But the hand which I now saw clearly enough, in the yellow light of a mid-London morning, lying half shut on the bedclothes, was lean corded, knuckly, of a dusky pallor, and thickly shaded with a swart growth of hair. It was the hand of Edward Hyde. Of a dusky pallor, hmm. Ruby studied the backs of her own hands, straight up dusky, old the pallor, and thankfully hairless. 
the tea kettle began to whistle. She got up and turned off the flame and went into the pantry to get a box of tea bags. When she came back out and shut the pantry door, the basement door popped open on the other side of the kitchen. Ruby hadn't been down to the basement yet. It wasn't off limits. Braithwaite had told her to think of the house as if it were already hers, but the one time she'd been in a mood to go exploring, she'd found that door locked. She set down the tea bags next to the stove and crossed to the basement door. There were two light switches on the wall inside. She flipped them both. A yellow bulb flickered to life directly overhead. Below, around a corner at the foot of the stairs, harsher, brighter white lights came on. The basement was very cold, and there was a low hum of machinery that made it seem not just unheated, but refrigerated. As Ruby came around the corner at the bottom of the stairs, she saw faint wisps of vapor eddying across the bare concrete floor, and her eye followed them back to their source at the center of the room. A gray, oblong pedestal, wrapped in metal pipes, fuzzed with frost. Resting on top of the pedestal was a glass coffin. A woman lay inside it. A white woman with flowing red hair. She lay on her back, head resting on a red satin pillow, a red satin sheet covering her body. Ruby stood with her hand still on the banister. She thought about the hot tea kettle upstairs, thought about going back to it, forgetting she'd seen this, as if she could. She walked forward into the cold basement. She stood beside the coffin and looked down at the pale, freckled face, both familiar and strange. For though she'd come to know it well, she was used to seeing it in the mirror. The woman's eyes were closed, her lips slightly parted. She didn't appear to be breathing, or if she was, the breaths were so shallow that her chest didn't seem to move at all. Her left arm was covered by the satin sheet, but her right lay on top of it, palm up. A silver cuff encircled her forearm, and ascending from it was a slender glass tube with a ruby-red thread at its core. The tube coiled up and around and fed into the back of a spigot that jutted from the coffin's side. A spigot, like the kind a bartender might use to tap a keg. Another one of those moments, then, when Ruby had to choose whether to go crazy or just deal. A close call this time. She took a step back and tried to figure out how the coffin opened. There was no lid. The glass panels that made up its top and sides were joined to a gray metal frame that seemed all one piece. Maybe the whole thing lifted up. She scanned the top edge of the pedestal, looking for a lever or a catch. I wouldn't touch it barehanded, unless you like frostbite. Braithwaite was standing at the foot of the stairs, still in his coat, his cheeks flushed as though he'd been running. He was smiling, though, an indulgent smile, as if it were Ruby who'd committed a transgression here, but one of the mildest sort, which he'd be happy to overlook. What? Ruby said. What is this? Her name is Delilah, Braithwaite told her. She used to work for my father. Your father put her in this? No, I did. Dell suffered a blow to the head the night before my father died. She fell into a coma. I got her medical attention, but months later, she hadn't woken up, and she was starting to deteriorate. She would have slipped away before much longer so I decided to see what I could do with her. Don't you even act surprised, Ruby thought. You knew there was something more to this deal. You knew it. You use her blood to make the potion? I've been drinking. Blood is an ingredient in the process, Braithwaite said. I know it sounds disgusting, but the final elixir is a distillation. Not blood, only its essence. The essence of Delilah. It doesn't hurt her, he continued. Just the opposite, in fact. Right now, she's unconscious. She's not dead, but she might as well be. But when you wear her shape, she dreams. Your experiences and adventures, everything you do, she dreams. You're all the life she has now, Ruby. Ruby shook her head in disbelief. You trying to make this out like it's a favor to her? A dream life is better than nothing. It's what I'd want. You're a liar. You want to help her. Why not use your magic to cure her? Healing is a different branch of the art. A complicated branch, and one I'm not well-schooled in. The elixir is low risk. 
To revive Delilah from her coma would require what's called a ritual of regeneration. And if that went wrong, it might kill her. Or worse. It's not out of the question sometime in the future when I've had more time to study. But for now, this really is the best thing for her. For you, you mean. For us, if you want to think of it that way. But Ruby, no, Ruby said. This isn't what I bargained for. I, stay back, she shouted as he stepped forward. But he didn't approach her. He crossed the basement to a tall refrigerator cabinet clad in stainless steel. He paused in front of it, looking back at her as he spoke. I'm sorry I didn't tell you about this sooner, he said. I knew you'd be upset by it, and I didn't want that. But I should have found a way. Well, you're free to go if you choose to. I won't stop you. But before you walk away, you should understand what you're leaving behind. He opened the cabinet door and stepped back to let her see what was inside. A dozen closely packed shelves, holding what must have been hundreds of glass vials, all full. I made this elixir for you, Caleb Braithwaite said. It's no use to me on my own, and I doubt I'll find anyone else to take it. I'll still look after Delilah, of course. Even if I can't wake her up, she'll survive a long time in there. But that's what she'll be doing. Surviving. Not living. He reached into the cabinet, selected a single vial, and closed the door on the rest. It seems like an awful waste. Ruby was shaking her head again, but she didn't speak or run out, even when Braithwaite came towards her. You should think it over, Ruby. Go for a walk. Take the day. He took gentle hold of her wrist and pressed the vial of elixir into her open palm, holding it there until her fingers closed around it. I'll understand if you feel like you have to say no. But think about the reason. If you pass up this chance, which will never come again, is it because that's the right thing to do? Or because it's safe? Because not getting what you want is what you're used to. And do you really want to go on living that way? You're the devil, Ruby said. I'm a man who knows what he wants. And how to get it, Braithwine said. But this isn't about who I am. It's about who you want to be. That's what you need to decide, Ruby. So take the day and ask yourself, who do you want to be? The Narrow House When I looked out in the morning, I saw a mob of about four or five hundred people coming over the hill, and I saw them shoot a colored man. About eight o'clock, they came into the residential district and began ransacking the colored homes. I went up in the loft when I saw them coming. After setting fire to several homes around, they came into our house, and after turning on the gas, they piled furniture on top and lighted a match. As soon as they left, I went down and turned off the gas and managed to put out the fire and went back into the loft. About an hour later, another bunch came along, and when they saw this house was not burning, they came in and started a fire. I went down again and succeeded in putting it out and returned to the loft a second time. By this time, the smoke was so bad that I decided to go out and started across the street toward the iron foundry when four fellows caught me. They said, where have you been, nigger? And I told them I'd just come from work. Then they said, but we are going to kill you. G.D. Butler, survivor of the 1921 Tulsa riot, as quoted in the Chicago Defender, June 11, 1921. Quarter past dawn of a Sunday in late January, and Montrose stood beside his son's Cadillac, smoking to keep warm, and watching an alien invader emerge from the gloom across the road. The invader was cherry red, about five feet tall, and emblazoned with the words, Drink Coca-Cola in bottles. Beneath that familiar slogan was another, executed in a cruder freehand style. White customers only. Montrose knew that many of the white residents of this southern Illinois county would regard him, rather than Jim Crow, as the true interloper. He regretted that none were present to debate the matter. In particular, he would have loved to engage in a frank exchange of views with the owner of the store, John Purchase Gas and Go, whose property the Coke machine occupied. But the store's lights were out, 
and the sign on the gas pump read, Closed for the Lord's Day. Two Negro boys came walking up the road. They were about ten years old and dressed in bright winter coats, one yellow, one orange. Montrose exchanged nods with the boy in yellow, then looked with fresh concern at the Coke machine, regarding it as he would a Confederate soldier lying in ambush. The boys walked heedlessly up to it, groping in their pockets for nickels. Montrose threw down his cigarette. Hey, he shouted. What are you doing? Don't put your money in that. He crossed the road in quick, long strides, the boys looking around startled. What are you doing? The boy in orange, clearly not the brains of the pair, took the question literally. Getting a Coke. It's all right, mister, added the boy in yellow, smarter, but no wiser. Mr. Perch gave us permission. He did, did he? said Montrose. And why would that matter? It's his store, the boy in orange said with a note of disdain, as if Montrose were the dummy here. He reached for the coin slot, but Montrose caught his wrist and yanked him away, and when the boy opened his mouth to protest, backhanded him across the face. The boy stumbled and fell, squawking. How's that feel? Montrose said, looming over him. You like getting hit in the face? Mister, please, said the boy in yellow. Be still or you'll get the same, Montrose warned. He stared hard at the boy on the ground. I asked you a question. The boy stared back, angry but frightened. No, he murmured. What's that? I can't hear you. No, I don't like it. I didn't think so. And how about if I were to open a store across the way? You think you want to come in and buy a Coke from me? No. That's the first intelligent thing out of your mouth. Montrose pointed at the vending machine. This here? This is a slap in the face. Every time you put in a nickel, you're telling Mr. Perch, thank you, sir. May I have another? A man who respects himself will never do that. You understand me? We understand, mister, the boy in yellow said. Shut up. I want to hear from him. The boy in orange gritted his teeth and contemplated the cost of refusal. Finally, he forced the words out. I understand, mister. All right, then. You get on out of here now. And don't let me catch you doubling back or I'll beat you for real. The boys went on their way. The boy in yellow hurrying. The boy in orange making an effort to appear as though he wasn't. Yeah, Montrose called after them. And next time, get a Pepsi. I don't like Pepsi, the boy in orange called back. Old fool. He broke into a run, and his friend ran with him. Montrose watched them go. I'm no fool, boy, he thought. As for old, well, I'm 41. But 41 in Jim Crow years is old. Ancient, even. Across the road, Atticus had come down off the snowy embankment, carrying a roll of toilet paper. Don't say it, Montrose cautioned as he walked back towards the car. I'm not saying a word, Pop. Yeah, and get over to the other side. I'm driving. Two days earlier, Caleb Braithwaite had been sitting in a booth in Denmark Vesey's when Montrose came in after work. Montrose hadn't seen Braithwaite since that night in the museum, but he'd known it was only a matter of time. What now? he said. Hello, Mr. Turner said Caleb Braithwaite. Please, sit. Can I get you something? I can buy my own damn drink. Montrose sat down in the booth. What do you want? I have another project I'd like your help with. Yeah? And what are you going to threaten me with this time? Nothing, Braithwaite said. I was hoping we could move beyond threats. To what? Me being your nigger? Braithwaite looked affronted. Have you ever even heard me use that word? When you put me in a cellar with a chain around my ankle, Montrose said, it's assumed. That was my father's doing. How about when I got shot? Whose doing was that? My father would have shot you for real, Braithwaite said. He'd have killed your son. Instead, thanks to me, you and Atticus are alive, and my father can't bother you ever again. Yeah, but that story's got a sequel. More than one, it seems. I'm sorry about stealing Ada's book, Braithwaite told him. 
but I needed to make a certain impression on the captain and his men. Uh-huh. Me and my family aren't your niggers. But you want the captain to think we are. I'd have handled it differently if I could. Still, nobody got hurt. And you have to admit, you made out very well on the deal. Even if you could have convinced the Burns family to take Ada's claim seriously, they'd have nitpicked her accounting to death. I just gave you the money. No, Montrose shook his head sternly. You do not get to do that. You do not get to count paying off a debt ninety years past due as a good deed. But it wasn't my debt. No, your debt is still outstanding. And don't think I've forgotten that either. You mean Hannah? You want back wages for her too? It's got nothing to do with wanting. Because I could arrange that, Braithwaite said. Of course, with a century and a half of interest to cover, it might take some time to get the funds together. But if it'll help make up for the way I've treated you. You don't get it, Montrose said. You can't buy goodwill with money that ain't yours. It's not a favor to pay what's owed. Let's talk about real favors, then. There must be something you want, Mr. Turner. Name it. Montrose hissed in frustration. No, Mr. Braithwaite. Let's talk about what you want. That's what this conversation is really about. And I can see you're not leaving until you speak your piece. So spit it out. And then I can tell you to go to hell. All right, Caleb Braithwaite said. I want you to find Hiram Winthrop's son, Henry. He ran away from home not long before my father killed his father. He was sixteen at the time, and the story is he ran off with one of the housemaids. He also stole a number of his father's books. Books? So that's what this is about, more magic books? Braithwaite nodded. My father thought Henry might have taken the book of names, so he was eager to find him. But Henry did a surprisingly good job of covering his tracks, the thing is, as far as my father knew, Henry wasn't a practitioner of the art. In fact, he apparently loathed natural philosophy, so he wouldn't have taken the books to use them. He'd have taken them to deny their use to Hiram Winthrop. But the books were also very valuable, and my father assumed Henry would eventually sell them. The market for that sort of literature is small. My father kept feelers out. It took longer than he expected, but a few years ago, a book called The Atlas of Untrod Paths that was known to have belonged to Hiram Winthrop went on auction in Manhattan. My father contacted the auctioneers and eventually traced the chain of providence to a man calling himself Henry Narrow, who'd sold the book in Philadelphia in 1944. Narrow matched Henry Winthrop's description. He was the right age, and he'd been living with a Negro woman who was probably the missing housemaid. But by the time my father's people came looking for him, He'd vanished again. And this is where I come in, Montrose said. You want me to go to Philadelphia and pick up the trail with my special Negro powers? Braithwaite smiled. No, he said. Detectives Burke and Noble are going to Philadelphia. They're flying out tomorrow afternoon. While they're preoccupied with what they think is a new lead, I'd like you to go to Aiken, Illinois. You see, I've had my own detective out looking for leads. Recently, he discovered that a man named Henry Narrow bought a house in Aiken in the summer of 1945. He bought it for cash, for a sum slightly less than what Narrow was paid for the Atlas. If you know where Narrow's house is, what do you need me for? Montrose said. Why not just send your detective? I did, said Braithwaite. He's disappeared, along with the $50,000 I gave him for book shopping. So now you want to trust me with fifty thousand? I trust you not to run off with it. I know you don't need the money. That still doesn't make sense, though, Montrose said. You could go see Narrow yourself. I could. But he might not want to deal with me, especially if he knows how his father died. I don't want to deal with you either. But here you are anyway. How's Henry Narrow any different? He isn't. But those... Special Negro powers you joked about? They might actually exist in this case. He's been living with a Negro woman, and he'll know you're not a member of the order. I think he's more likely to deal squarely with you than he would with any white man I could send. Maybe, Montrose said. But that ain't the real reason. And then it came to him. You're worried. You say this guy isn't a practitioner. 
but that was when he was 16. How old would he be now? About 35. So for 20 years, he's been hauling around his daddy's magic books. Is there a particular one you're looking for? I'll take whatever he still has, Braithwaite said. But I'm especially interested in a set of handwritten notebooks containing his father's research. His father's research notebooks. And you're not concerned he might have looked into those at some point? Maybe learned a trick or two? It's not that easy. I'm sure. But over twenty years? Maybe your detective didn't run away with the money. Maybe Henry Winthrop turned him into a toad. That would be a good trick, Caleb Braithwaite said. I'd like to learn that one myself. I bet you would. Is this the part where you tell me to go to hell? No, said Montrose. If you're scared of this guy, maybe I do want to meet him. But assuming I get him to sell me the notebooks, what's to stop me from throwing him into the nearest bonfire? Nothing, Braithwaite said. That wouldn't be the worst outcome for me. Don't misunderstand. I want the notebooks, but it's more important to me that no one else gets them. Like Lancaster? Especially him. Look, Mr. Turner, when I asked you before what you wanted, I already knew the answer. You want me gone. Out of Chicago, out of your family's lives. You got that right. The thing is, if I left town now, you'd be at the mercy of Captain Lancaster and the rest of the Order. They don't care about you. But Atticus, because of his relationship to Titus Braithwaite, has a certain value to them. Not as a person, you understand, but as a sort of living fetish object. Now that they know he exists, they won't forget about him. Ever. Yeah. And I got you to thank for that. You have my father to thank for that. But that's spilled milk. My point is, if things go the way I hope they will, very soon I'll be in charge of the order. Not just one lodge, but all of them, all across the country. Captain Lancaster will be out of the picture, and I'll make sure your family is left alone. You have my word on that. Uh-huh, Montrose said, not believing it for a second. And you having these notebooks will hasten the day? It couldn't hurt. Whereas, if I don't give them to you, I might be slitting my own son's throat. I wouldn't put it that way, Braithwaite said. But you wouldn't be helping Atticus. And of course, if I burn the notebooks and you won through anyway, then you'd be a king who didn't owe me any favors. I suppose that's true. Montrose smiled. You see, he said, I knew there'd be a threat in there somewhere. Aiken, Illinois was a small city on the Ohio River, midway between Cairo and Metropolis. The sun was just above the rooftops as they drove through the central business and municipal district, which felt like a ghost town at that hour. They paused for a red light in front of the Aiken City Hall, and Atticus was reminded uncomfortably of a 3 a.m. traffic stop in Biddeford, Massachusetts. But Montrose, still heated from the encounter with the boys, glared furiously at the empty sidewalks, daring someone anyone, to come out and look at him cross-eyed. The light changed. They turned right and drove west along Elm Street, looking for number 213. It would have been hard to miss. The house itself was unremarkable, but the owner of the property next door had erected a marquee sign on his garage roof with a flashing neon arrow that pointed at 213 Elm. The letters on the marquee read, Nigger Lover. Father and son both looked dumbfounded, Montrose saying to himself, just when you think you've seen it all. The front door of 213 Elm flew open, and a short, burly white man came out, brandishing a fireplace poker. He charged down the front walk, but stopped abruptly a few feet from the Cadillac, lowering his weapon in sudden embarrassment. Atticus rolled down his window. Henry Nero, he said. David Lansdowne, the man replied. Esquire. You a lawyer? Atticus glanced up at the marquee. Affiliated with the NAACP by any chance? Lansdowne nodded. Two years ago, I was lead counsel on a lawsuit to integrate our county school system. Clark, my neighbor, wanted to make sure everyone knew which house to throw stones at. I'm sorry about this, he said, holding up the fireplace poker. But when a car I don't recognize stops in front of the property, it usually means trouble. 
No need to apologize, said Montrose, leaning across from the driver's side. Would you gentlemen like to come inside for some coffee? Yes, sir, Montrose said. We'd be honored. They took their coffee in David Lansdowne's living room. As he passed around the cream and sugar, Lansdowne explained that his wife Judith had already left for church in Mount Vernon, an hour and a half drive to the north. After the lawsuit, our local pastor asked us to stop coming on Sundays. He was afraid someone would take a shot at me and send him to heaven by mistake. Judy found a new congregation and started attending again last year, but I guess I've lost the habit. You ever think about moving? Atticus asked. Every time I replace a window. But I'm stubborn. If Judy were here, she'd tell you how stubborn I can be. Lansdowne settled in a chair by the fireplace. The poker was back in its stand. So, Henry Narrow, would he be an old friend of yours? No, sir, Montrose said. We've never met the man. We're here to see about buying some books from him. In that case, I hope you didn't come a long way. The reason I asked if you were friends is that Henry Narrows is dead. He's been for some time. He and his family were murdered in 1945, right after the war ended. Murdered, said Atticus. In this house? No, the Narrows never lived here. The address you're looking for, 213 Elm Street, is on the other side of town, near the cemetery. This is 213 West Elm. It's common for visitors to get the two streets confused. It's how I met Henry Nara. He saw a realtor's listing for the old widow Metzger's house, came to Aiken to take a look at it, and ended up on my doorstep. He had a woman and a boy with him. He acknowledged the boy, Henry Jr., as his son, but he introduced the woman, Pearl, as the boy's nanny. She was a Negro, light-skinned. The boy was lighter still. Light enough to pass, at least when he was standing by his father. But he resembled both his parents in different ways, and seeing the three of them together, it was obvious they were a family. In fact, if not in law. It wasn't my business, Lansdowne said. But they seemed like nice people, and there was the welfare of the woman and the child to consider. So while Judy was getting a cookie for Henry Jr., I took Nero aside. I told him that while there was no anti-miscegenation statute in the state, a family of mixed race, if recognized as such, would probably not find Aiken very welcoming. I also told him I thought he had the right to live where he wanted, so if he was determined to make a home here, I'd help him find a place. The house next door where Clark lives now was about to go on the market, and I thought my neighbor at the time could be convinced to sell to the Narrows, maybe with a bit of arm twisting. But the widow Metzger's house? That was another matter. That part of town, I said, would be not just inhospitable, but dangerous. The mayor and the chief of police lived in that neighborhood, and they were old school Democrats, the kind who liked to wear sheets after dark. I'd narrow react, Montrose asked. He thanked me for the warning, said Lansdowne. The way men do, when they don't intend to heed it. He told me that he and his family preferred to keep to themselves, so it was okay if the neighbors didn't want to be friends. Mr. Nara, perhaps I wasn't clear, I said. If these men don't like you, they won't just shun you. But he insisted he'd dealt with such people before, had grown up around them, in fact. Then he said something odd. He asked me if any of the men I was talking about had a reputation for studying philosophy. I said no. That was part of the problem. They weren't students of anything, least of all that. That's all right, then, he said. We'll stay out of their way, and they'll stay out of ours. I could see there was no point in arguing with him, and I assumed it didn't matter. I thought whoever was representing the widow Metzger's heirs would take one look at the Narrows, see what I had seen, and refuse to sell to them. But I was wrong about that. You wouldn't have guessed it from the car he drove, but Nara had a lot of money. I heard later that he bought the house with cash, and the realtor, Frank Barrington, made an unusually large commission on the deal. As for the widow's heirs, the nearest of them lives in Bloomington, so they didn't care what the neighbors thought. It must have been July when they moved into the house. The fire happened in August. It was the same week the Japanese surrendered, so the story was buried inside the newspaper. The paper claimed Nero forgot to screen his downstairs fireplace before going up to bed, and a cold ignited the rug. The three of them were trapped upstairs and supposedly died of smoke inhalation. 
What the story didn't explain is why Nero would have been using the fireplace on a warm summer night. About a week later, I spoke to a friend of mine, Louis Peters, who was a clerk in the coroner's office. I asked him if he knew anything that hadn't made the paper. He didn't want to talk about it, but I pressed him, and finally he told me that he'd gone into the morgue the morning after the fire to pick up some paperwork, and he'd seen Henry Nero's body. He said Nero's skin had been blackened by smoke, but he also had what looked like a bullet hole in his temple. I told Lewis if that was true, he needed to report it. There's no one to report it to, he said, and there's no evidence even if I did. The bodies have been disposed of. You figure it was the mayor and the police chief? Montrose said. I do, Lansdowne said. Not that I could ever prove it, but if it was them, I suppose there was a measure of justice in the end. The house was damaged, but not destroyed, and since the Neris had no next of kin that anyone could find, the mayor contrived to have the city take possession of the property and put it up for auction. The auction was so poorly advertised that there was only one bidder, the police chief's son-in-law, who got the house at a bargain price. The son-in-law, the police chief and the mayor, went to a restaurant over in Cairo to celebrate. They drank a great deal and drove back to Aiken at one in the morning. The son-in-law was at the wheel. He came down Elm Street, going much too fast, and plowed into a tree right in front of the narrow house. The car burst into flame, and all three men died. After the funerals, a rumor started going around that it was an alcohol that had caused the crash. The story was that the son-in-law had swerved to avoid a little boy and a Negro woman who had darted out into the street. Since there were no witnesses to the accident, I don't know how anyone could know that. But that was the story. And soon enough, other people started claiming they'd seen the woman and the boy as well. You believe it? Atticus said. Lansdowne shook his head. I think there was some guilty consciences at work there. The rumors did have a salutary effect. A number of Elm Street's other residents decided they no longer liked the neighborhood so much, and a few of the worst individuals left Aiken entirely. Not enough of them, in my opinion. But our current mayor is a Republican, so maybe there's hope for the future. What about the narrow house? Montrose asked. Is it still standing? It's a ruin now, Lansdowne told him. It was never repaired after the fire. Ghosts or no, I imagine anything of value has long since been taken out of it. Might be worth a drive by anyway, as long as we're here. All right. Let me get a map and show you how to go. I'd offer to take you over myself, but at this point, you'll probably be more welcome in that neighborhood without me. Hill Street, Montrose said, annoyed, staring at the sign for the cross street in front of them. Should that last turn have been a right, maybe? Atticus suggested. I know how to read a map. I didn't say you didn't, Pop, but I thought I heard Mr. Lansdowne say to turn right off Locust. That's what you heard, is it? Montrose looked over at the house on the corner lot beside them. We're in the right vicinity, at least. Poking up out of the snow in the yard was a black-faced lawn jockey. Atticus looked at it, too. Maybe we should just go home. Nah, we've come this far. We'll find it. Montrose swung a right onto Hill Street, thinking he might circle around the block. But after a short incline, the street dead-ended at the entrance to the Aiken Cemetery. Montrose shifted into reverse, and the car sputtered and stalled out cold. Cursing under his breath, he reached for the ignition. Hold on a second, Pop, Atticus said. Inside the cemetery, a Korean man was pushing a wheelbarrow along a line of graves, gathering up old flower wreaths and using a whisk broom to brush snow from the tops of the headstones. Let me go ask this guy if he knows which way Elm Street is. Nah, stay in the car. Montrose turned the ignition key. The Cadillac's engine wheezed, but wouldn't catch. Atticus opened his door and got out. Atticus! I'll be right back, Pop. He trotted off through the cemetery gates, his father calling after him. Montrose tried the ignition again. The engine continued to wheeze. He sat back, cursing aloud this time, and stabbed at the button on the dashboard lighter. He was fishing in his shirt pocket for a cigarette when the Cadillac bounced as though someone had jumped on the back fender. When Montrose looked behind him, there was no one there, but he could hear somebody giggling. 
He got out of the car. Who's there? He called. A snowball landed on the roof of the Cadillac, and then he saw the boy, standing about fifteen feet away on the far side of the car. He was seven or eight years old, and he was light-skinned, with big brown eyes and dark curly hair. Hey! Montrose said sharply. He started around the car, concern tempering his anger as he realized how the boy was dressed, in a denim jumper and nothing else. No winter coat, no shoes or socks, not even a shirt underneath the jumper. Hey, Montrose said in a different tone. What are you doing out here? Where's your mother? The boy laughed and dashed away barefoot through the snow. Montrose went after him. They ran along the outside of the cemetery wall. Montrose's feet, plunging deep into the snow, drifted up against the stone, while the boy bounded lightly on ahead. Stopping now and then to look back, they came to the corner of the cemetery property, and the boy, still laughing, vanished into a thicket of snow-covered branches. Montrose plunged in after him and found himself tumbling down a slope. He fetched up hard at the bottom, half buried in snow, half buried. His left arm was planted up to the elbow in a snow mound, but his right hand rested on warm green grass. Summer grass. Montrose lifted his head and looked over the grass at the back of a big yellow house, standing bright beneath a hot noon sun. A Negro woman in a checked apron waited on the back porch steps for the boy, who came running towards her. Montrose got to his feet, straddling winter and summer. He pivoted clockwise and stood firmly on the grass, the snow on his left shoe and pants leg melting away instantly in the heat. Ma'am, he called to the woman, who had taken the boy by the hand and was leading him inside. But she didn't respond, and neither did the boy. Montrose looked over his shoulder at Winter, still just a hand's breadth away. Then he started towards the house. Halfway across the yard he looked back again, and the snow had disappeared. The slope up to the cemetery was all green shrubbery and flowers. He climbed the steps to the porch. The back door of the house was ajar. Montrose stood at the threshold, his attention drawn to a line of letters from Adam's alphabet, carved into the right post of the door frame. Looking farther to the right, he saw an identical inscription cut into the sill of a window. Ma'am? Montrose knocked on the half-open door. No one answered but the door swung wide, and he stepped inside, into a kitchen. The woman was at the sink, scrubbing on a pot, though Montrose sensed that the majority of her effort was devoted to ignoring his presence. Meanwhile, the boy, seated at a table with a sandwich and a glass of milk, looked up smiling, as though he and Montrose shared a private joke. Ma'am, Montrose said again, and then, when she still didn't answer, Mrs. Narrow? At last, she met his eye, but the words she spoke weren't addressed to him. Henry, she said. There's someone here. A white man appeared in an open doorway behind the boy. He regarded Montrose with curiosity, as though visitors to the house were rare. Can I help you? he said. Recalling the family portrait from the Winthrop house, Montrose had no doubt that this was Hiram Winthrop's son. But you ain't thirty-five, he thought. Then again, you wouldn't be. You were only in your twenties when you died. What name to address him by? Montrose chose to be direct. Mr. Winthrop, he said. The woman, who had returned her attention to the sink, looked up startled. The boy lost his smile, and the man's expression grew severe. State your business, sir, he said and Montrose felt the chill of winter at his back, icy tendrils curling down inside his collar and threatening to freeze him where he stood. It's about my son, Mr. Winthrop, Montrose said, his voice steady despite the cold. My name is Montrose Turner, and I was sent here by a man named Braithwaite, who wants something that belonged to your father. But I didn't come for that. I came on behalf of my boy, Atticus, Braithwaite has designs on him, and I don't know how to stop him. But I think you might. So I've come to ask for your help, and I'm prepared to make a deal. If I can. If you will. The cold receded, 
Summer returned. But the woman and the boy continued to watch and wait until Henry Sr. nodded. All right, Mr. Turner. Come into the parlor. We'll talk. They sat at a table by a front window. While Winthrop poured tea, Montrose looked out at the lawn. At the edge of the grass by the street was a big, bold oak with a tire swing. Montrose guessed this must be the tree the police chief's son-in-law had swerved into, though the tree showed no evidence of having been involved in a fiery crash. Maybe the crash hadn't happened yet. The calendar above the mantel of the parlor fireplace said August 1945, and among the cars parked on the street, Mondros could not identify a single one of post-war make. Even as he considered the possibility, some more stubbornly rational part of his brain kept trying to protest. This was all wrong, it warned him. He did not belong here, sitting in a summer yesteryear with a dead man. He should get up and go back the way he had come, without delay. And definitely, definitely, he should not eat or drink anything given him in this house. But Montrose had no intention of leaving empty-handed, and it would have been rude to refuse Winthrop's hospitality. So he accepted the cup placed before him, and one of the shortbread cookies Winthrop also offered. The tea and the cookie were remarkably bland, flavorless, to be honest, but when swallowed, they produced a mild intoxication, a torpor of reason that allowed him to embrace a parley with a dead man as part of the natural order of things. Henry Winthrop, the dead man said. It's been a long time since anyone's called me that. You say Braithwaite sent you. Samuel Braithwaite? His son, Caleb. Samuel Braithwaite is dead. Really? Winthrop said. I hadn't heard that. He looked distractedly out the window. We don't get much news here. No, Montrose said, his own gaze straying to the calendar above the mantelpiece. I don't suppose you do. But about my son, Mr. Winthrop. Braithwaite has designs on him, you said. What sort? I don't entirely know. Braithwaite's father wanted to use Atticus as a sacrifice in a ritual. Caleb's more subtle. For now he wants to keep Atticus around. I think as a sort of trophy to impress his other sorcerer friends. But in the long run, I expect he'll come up with some ritual of his own. I want him gone before that happens. You want to kill him? I would if I could. But he's charmed somehow, and I can't raise a hand against him. Braithwaite calls it immunity. Winthrop nodded. My father had that too. It was frustrating. Is there a way around it? A number of ways, Winthrop said. But I don't know what any of them are. You know anyone who does? No one living. What about your father's notebooks? Montrose said. That's what Braithwaite sent me here to get, and he was very particular about not wanting anyone else to have them. Could there be something in them, you think, about revoking immunity? There might be. Would you be willing to part with them? Winthrop shrugged noncommittally. I suppose I could let them go. God knows they aren't doing me any good. Of course, he added. There would have to be a fair exchange. I have money. Montrose said. It's back in my car. No, not money. Money's no use to me. What then? Feeling, Winthrop said. I don't understand. Winthrop looked out the window again. It's not just news we lack for here, he said. It's everything. All that sunshine. But I'm never really warm. He turned back to Montrose. Or cold, either. And this? Gesturing at the tea and shortbread. Unsatisfying. No sweetness in the sugar. No savor in salt. And it's the same with emotion. Oh, we can pretend. But it's just faded echoes. To really feel something again. To experience strong emotion, even for a moment. That would be a good trade. The look of naked craving on Winthrop's face reawakened that inner voice. Get out, it told Montrose. This ain't a man. It's a vampire and it's starving. Get away from it. 
I still don't understand, he said. How can I make you feel something? Tell me a story, Henry Winthrop said. He raised his head up like an animal, scenting prey. Tell me about your father. No, said Montrose. No, I won't do that. But the dead man wouldn't hear no. Roland, was it? He said. Was that his name? Dick Roland? Montrose shook his head, that inner voice saying, Run. My father was Ulysses. So who was Dick Roland? Winthrop demanded. Montrose tried to get up then, but the torpor had settled in his legs, trapping him in the chair. Who was he? Tell me. Nothing for it but to answer. He was a boot black, Montrose said. A shoe shiner. Did he and your father work together? No, my father had his own store. He and Roland didn't know each other, not to speak to anyway. But there was a connection between them, Winthrop insisted. What was it? What happened? Roland was accused, Montrose said, after trying once more unsuccessfully to stand. Accused of what? The usual, Montrose told him, and with the sudden kindling of anger in his breast, he lost his reluctance to speak. It was Memorial Day, 1921, he said. Dick Rowland went into the Drexel building in downtown Tulsa to use the colored restroom on the top floor. He stumbled and fell against the elevator operator, a white girl named Sarah Page. She said he attacked her. And did he? Winthrop asked. Montrose threw him a look of disgust. Broad daylight in a public building on Main Street? He's going to attack a white girl? How suicidal would a man have to be? But it didn't matter. She screamed and he ran, and from that moment on, he was guilty. Cops arrested him early the next day. That afternoon, the Tulsa Tribune ran an article about the attack, claiming the girl's clothes were torn. They admitted later they'd made that up. But of course, as soon as the paper hit the street, the lynch talk started. The sheriff had Dick Rowland in the jail at the county courthouse. By nightfall, there was a huge mob of white people gathered outside. But the Negroes who lived up in the Greenwood section had heard about the lynching too, and some of the men decided to get their guns and go down and put a stop to it. My father was one of them. I never got a chance to ask him what happened, but the story I heard later was that one of the whites at the courthouse tried to take a pistol away from one of the Negroes. War broke out. The Negroes were outnumbered something like twenty to one, so the ones who survived the initial gunfire fell back towards Greenwood. The whites followed after, but they stopped along the way to get more guns and ammunition. They broke into hardware stores and pawn shops, took everything that wasn't nailed down. My father got back to our house around eleven o'clock. His arm was cut, and there was blood all down his sleeve, but I don't think he even knew it. He told my mother to start packing the car with anything she couldn't bear to lose. He said he was going back out. The Greenwood man was setting up a defensive line at the railroad tracks to turn back the white mob. But if that failed, we had to be ready to leave in a hurry. My mother didn't want him to go, but he didn't see there was any choice. He said, they're looting their own people's property. What do you think they're going to do if we let them get up in here? I told my father I wanted to come with him to help defend the neighborhood. Seven years old, I thought I was a big man already. My father said no, of course, and with him, one no was all you ever got. But I got excited and tried to argue, and that's when he gave me this. He tilted his head and pointed to a scar by the corner of his left eye. Cut me with his ring. My father had a reputation as a violent man, and he could be violent, but it was always controlled. He'd hit me if I needed it, but he never left a mark on me before. And he didn't mean to that night, when I felt the blood trickle down my cheek. That's when I realized how scared he was, how bad a fix we were in. And then, Montrose said, my brother George stepped up and said he needed to go out and get my great-grandmother's book. Her book, Winthrop said. An accounts ledger, said Montrose. It was in the safe at my father's shop. 
My father told George if worse came to worst, he'd save the book himself, but George insisted it was his responsibility. I expected George to get smacked down, too, about then, but my father said, okay. I couldn't believe it. When my mother jumped in and tried to forbid George to go, my father told her to be quiet. So my father and George went out together. And after that, my mother was all business. She had me and my sister running around the house, gathering things together, packing wedding dishes. I was so mad. George gets to go to the front line. I get wedding dishes. As we were bringing things out to the car, we could hear gunshots off in the distance. My mother got real agitated, and I did too, but for different reasons. We got the car pretty well stuffed. And then there was this moment when my mother and Ophelia were inside the house trying to decide what else to take, and I was outside, alone, listening to those gunshots, and I couldn't hold myself back anymore. I just put my father's toolbox in the car, so I grabbed this big old claw hammer and started running towards the battle. When I got to Archer Street, I could barely recognize it. The Greenwood defenders had shot out all the street lights, and they had snipers up overlooking railroad tracks. The whites couldn't see the snipers, but a few of them had managed to sneak across with oil rags and lighters. All the shanties on the Greenwood side of the tracks were on fire, and some larger buildings, too. So I was out there in the street with my hammer, with the fire and the smoke and the darkness, bullets flying by in both directions. Men were shouting at me to get the hell out of there, but I just started wandering down the street in a daze looking for my dad. I saw a car full of white men drive across the tracks and come under fire. The headlights and the windshield just exploded. The driver threw it into reverse and backed out in a hurry. I was jumping up and down, hollering. We were winning. Then my father swooped out of nowhere and grabbed me. He didn't hit me this time. He picked me up and he shook me. Montrose raised his hand above his head. Like this. I heard a big bang, like a bomb going off. My father stopped shaking me and he hugged me to him and he started running. And you know, it's funny, but once we got away from the smoke and the flames, it was almost nice, him carrying me like that. I dream about it sometimes. And in the dreams, there's no gunfire. It's just an ordinary spring night and my dad's carrying me home, like from a movie or a ball game like he should have been. We must have been about halfway home when a car came up behind us, moving fast. As it got close, I saw it. It was all shot up, bullet holes in the hood, glass on, knocked out. I opened my mouth to say something, but there was no time. A white man leaned out the back with a pistol and fired two shots. Then the car was past us and gone into the night. I never knew what happened to it or who that man was. I thought the shots had missed us. I knew I wasn't hit, and my father didn't break stride. He ran on for another block or so, and then he just stopped. He put me down, careful, put a hand on my shoulder like to steady himself. Then he fell over. We were on the grass in front of someone's house. The people inside heard me yelling, and the porch lights came on. I saw my father had been shot in the side, and there was blood coming out of his mouth. He had this look on his face. Horror. Horror at the universe. I was too young to understand it. I thought he was afraid because he was dying. But that wasn't it at all. It wasn't until I had a son of my own, a son who wouldn't listen, that I understood what he felt. He wasn't afraid for himself. He was afraid for me. He wanted to protect me. He had. He saved my life. Get me away from that gunfight. But the night wasn't over, and he knew he wasn't going to be there to see me through it. That's the horror. The most awful thing. To have a child the world wants to destroy and know that you're helpless to help him. Nothing worse than that. Nothing worse. Eyes suddenly wet. Montrose looked up, as though waking from a trance, and saw the woman in the kitchen doorway with the boy held tight in her arms. 
Seeing her stricken expression, Montrose wanted to apologize for bringing such a tale into her house. But her husband leaned forward, still hungry, and determined to lick every last crumb from this particular plate. And then he died, Henry Winthrop said. Yeah, said Montrose. Then he died. Outside the window, it was still summer, but the color of the sun had changed to pink and gold, and the shadows on the grass were growing long. Montrose, still lost in the burning night of Tulsa, did not find it strange that evening should already be drawing on here. Henry Winthrop said, I wish I had a father like that. I don't have a father like that, Montrose said. That's the damn point. He swiped his eyes with the heel of his hand. So what's your story? What was your father like? Curious, Winthrop replied. There are other words I could use to describe him. But to understand him, you'd have to start with that. His insatiable curiosity. He wanted to know everything about everything. Which is a lot to know. Much more than can be learned in a single human lifespan. So to give himself the time he needed, he decided to become immortal. And as close to omnipotent as it was practical to get. On one level, it was comical. The men my father associated with thought of themselves as rationalists, scientists, natural philosophers. To speak of the supernatural was a sign of simple-mindedness. They wanted to become gods, but rejected the concept of God as vulgar superstition. My father was less orthodox than most. He didn't mind vulgarity if it got results. It's what led him to my mother. She was a witch, Winthrop explained. Called herself that, unselfconsciously. She believed in gods and miracles and magic, and she showed my father that what he wanted was at least theoretically possible. She paid for it, too. First with her health, then with her life. The story is she had polio, Montrose said. That was the story, Winthrop agreed. But it wasn't a disease that put my mother in a wheelchair. It was a mistranslation. A cosmic pun. Are you familiar with the language of Adam, Mr. Turner? Acquainted with it, Montrose said cautiously. There's a line in Matthew's Gospel that says if you ask God for bread, he won't give you a stone, Winthrop said. That's because the God of the New Testament is a person, a father who cares about you. But when you invoke the language of Adam, you're addressing nature. And nature doesn't care. It just does what it's told. If you garble your instructions, transpose a letter, stress the wrong syllable, you'll get what you ask for. But it might not be what you want. What did your mother ask for? A doorway, Winthrop said. One challenge my father faced in understanding the universe was that most of it was beyond his reach. With my mother's help, he set out to find a means of bridging distant points in space. They succeeded, but one of their experiments left my mother crippled. She asked nature for the power to walk between worlds, and nature gave her legs of stone. After the accident, my father became more cautious. He had a deep respect for technology and already employed machines in the pursuit of his art. He began to invest more heavily in their use. He wanted to ensure that in future mishaps, the harm would fall on something other than himself. Machines made good surrogates, and for situations where they weren't sufficient to absorb the risk, he also cultivated a pool of young, over-eager apprentices. My mother continued to help my father with his research, but their relationship changed. At first, she thought it was just bad luck that she was the one who'd gotten hurt. But seeing how he used his new assistants to shield himself from danger, she began to wonder. These apprentices, Montrose said. Were you one of them? No. My mother was adamant about that. She made my father promise never to involve me in his work, and because she was still very useful to him, he kept his word. Of course, I wanted to help him. What boy doesn't want to work with his father? But she made me promise, too. 
and any time I started showing interest in natural philosophy, she'd uncover her legs. How'd she die? Trying to fix herself, Winthrop said. When I was fifteen, she decided to leave my father. But in order to get free of him, she first had to get free of the wheelchair. I was away at boarding school when she performed a ritual of regeneration. She asked nature to give her her legs back. Nature gave her legs. I don't know the exact count, but it was more than her heart or nervous system could handle. My father claimed she didn't suffer for long. The funeral was closed casket. Afterwards, we went home to a new house. My father talked about making a fresh start. He said he wanted to make me a partner in his research. But it was too late by then. While he'd been off chasing the ancient mysteries of the universe, I'd been studying a different, more modern sort of philosophy at school. My father was furious. He said he hadn't paid all that tuition to have me turned into a socialist. He blamed my mother, who'd chosen the school for deliberately corrupting me. He was right about that. What he didn't know was that my mother had written me a letter before she died. She knew she might not survive the ritual. She wanted to make sure I survived my father, so she sent me detailed instructions on how to run away, where to get the money I'd need, how to forge a new identity, and how to hurt my father for her on my way out the door. It was another year before I left. I needed time to get ready, and I was afraid. My father was keeping a close eye on me. He refused to let me go back to school. Instead, he hired a tutor, this crusty old Prussian. I spent months cooped up in our new house. That's how I got to know Pearl. We would sneak up to the roof together when I was supposed to be studying. It ever occur to you, said Montrose, unable to help himself, that involving a maid in your family drama might not be right. We were young and in love, Winthrop said. And to my way of thinking at the time, I wouldn't have been doing her a favor to leave her in my father's service. Pearl wanted to get away from that house as badly as I did, to see the world. He smiled, and Montrose bit back a caustic remark. From the kitchen, unnoticed by either of them, came the banging of pots. We waited for a night when my father was out of town, Winthrop continued. We slipped out after supper went to Dearborn Station and bought tickets to Los Angeles. We made sure the ticket clerk would remember us. But we never boarded the train. Instead, we went to a garage where my mother's old car was stored. It hadn't been driven in more than a decade, but she'd paid to keep it serviced. The keys were in the glove box. We drove east. The first year we were in New York City, we were married there, and I became Henry Narrow. By the time Henry Jr. was born, We'd moved to Philadelphia. I got a job at a bookstore. Pearl worked as a nanny and taught Sunday school on the weekends. We had a good life there. Yeah, Montrose said. So what'd you come back to Illinois for? Pearl missed her mother, Winthrop said. Every Saturday in Philadelphia, I get the previous Sunday's Chicago Tribune and look for news of my father. But his obituary had already come and gone. So it was years before I found out he was dead. When I told Pearl, she wanted to go back and look for her mom. I didn't think it was a good idea. Death, in my father's case, wasn't necessarily final. And even if he was really gone, he had friends and enemies who might still be looking for me because of what I'd taken. But Pearl missed her mother. Without telling me, she contacted some of her other relatives to see if they'd heard from her. None of them had, and she was worried. Eventually, we agreed on a compromise. We'd go back to the Midwest and set up somewhere quiet, where my father's old associates wouldn't find us, but close enough to Chicago that I could slip in and look for Pearl's mother. Originally, we planned to rent a place farther north, but on the way out from Philadelphia, we stopped over in Paducah to visit one of Pearl's cousins. She really seemed to enjoy the reunion. And while we were there, I happened to see a listing for this house, just a short drive across the river. And we had the money, so I thought, why not? Why not? Montrose said. After what Mr. Lansdowne told you? What in God's name were you thinking? I thought we were protected, Winthrop said simply. My mother's last letter included instructions for two enchantments, 
One, to confound pursuers when I was on the move. The other, to be used on any house I chose to dwell in, to ward off those who would do me harm. They were the only spells I ever knew. But I didn't really understand how they worked, and my mother didn't know about Pearl. She assumed I'd be running on my own and that the main threat to me would be my father and men like him. Sorceress, said Montrose. The ward on the house only protects against sorceress. That would be my best guess, Henry Winthrop said. Even now I don't know for sure. But my real failure of understanding was more fundamental. I made the same mistake my mother made. I asked for something without grasping the true nature of my request. My father was my protector too, you see. He didn't protect me the way your father protected you, out of love. He protected me incidentally, as a function of who and what he was. So long as I was under his roof, the only thing I had to fear was him. In seeking to free myself from him, I was also seeking to make myself vulnerable to the world. But I didn't appreciate that. I thought free meant free to do as I pleased. I thought... I thought I had immunity. Everybody thinks that, Montrose said. But then you got out in the world, and her with you. You didn't see it was otherwise? Winthrop shook his head. No one ever bothered us in Philadelphia. Oh, maybe now and then someone would say something rude. Pearl was much more sensitive to that than I was. But no one ever attacked us. I assumed my mother's spell was working. I saw no reason it shouldn't work just as well here. You were a goddamn fool is what you were. Yes, I was a fool, Henry Winthrop agreed. That was the problem. I had charms to protect me against philosophers and wise men, but not against my own foolishness or the hands of the simple-minded. Nara! The call came from outside, where night had fallen. A particular night. Montrose looking out the window saw three cars drawn up on the lawn and a dozen men milling in the headlights. A mob of simpletons, but armed. Nara! Their leader cried. You and your two niggers come out here. In the summer darkness across the street, more people were gathered. Spectators, women and children among them. One of the men on the lawn thumbed the wheel of a lighter and touched the resulting flame to a rag stuffed in the mouth of a gasoline-filled Coke bottle. Montrose watched the bottle come tumbling towards the window until at the last second the strength returned to his legs and he shoved back out of the way of the spray of window glass. The bottle flew across the room to dash against the foot of the hearth and the rug in front of the fireplace blazed up. Henry Winthrop, who hadn't moved, sought Montrose's gaze from the table. His expression was mournful and self-pitying. I didn't know, he said. I swear I didn't know. Then a pistol cracked out in the night, and Winthrop's head snapped back. He slumped, lifeless in his chair. Montrose stood up, kicking his own chair away, and put his back against the wall beside the window. The spreading fire had cut off the doorway to the kitchen, and smoke from the burning rug was billowing across the ceiling. Montrose covered his mouth and nose with a handkerchief. He was preparing to leap the flames when he suddenly saw the woman and the boy standing side by side on the hearth, posed like corpses with their eyes closed and their arms crossed in front of them. More shots were fired from outside. Montrose ducked reflexively. When he recovered himself, the woman and the boy were gone, and in their place, standing directly in the fire, was a large, dark-skinned colored man. The man's eyes were open and filled with a bitter rage, almost as familiar to Montrose as his own. Dead? Montrose said, lowering the handkerchief. Daddy? Ulysses Turner moved his lips urgently, but whatever words passed between them were swallowed by the flames. Montrose leaned forward, straining to hear, but the heat held him back. And so he stood there helpless and uncomprehending, while the room filled with smoke and the sound of bullets launched by the hands of simple men. Pop? Atticus followed his father's tracks in the snow to the back of the narrow house and climbed up to the porch, stepping carefully over a gap in the boards. Two planks were nailed across the back doorway, 
but the door had been forced open, so by crouching, he was able to enter. Pop, he called, standing in the ruined kitchen. In here. The section of floor in front of the parlor fireplace had fallen in, as had the ceiling above it, but the light shining in through gaps in the boarded-up windows, Atticus could see his father on the far side of the room, sitting precariously in a chair that was missing one of its back legs. Montrose was hunched forward with his arms outstretched, gripping some sort of package. Pop, how'd you get over there? No answer. Atticus went back through the kitchen and found his way up a central hall to the parlor's other entrance. Standing before his father, he saw that the package in Montrose's hands was a set of notebooks, squared up and tied with heavy twine. The books were coated with ash, but the twine looked clean and new. What you got there, Pop? Atticus said. Is that? Montrose stood up, sending the rickety chair toppling over backwards. Nothing, he said looking his son in the eye with a furious urgency. We found nothing. The Narrows are dead, their houses burnt, and we didn't find a damn thing. That's what we're going to tell Braithwaite, and that's what we're going to believe. So if he looks inside our heads, he doesn't see different. You understand me? You listening? Yeah, Pop, I get it. You'd better, Montrose said. And he sighed, wearily, feeling the weight of every one of his Jim Crow years, but still feeling. We need to go now, he said. This is a place for the dead, and we don't belong here. He hugged the notebooks to his chest. Not yet. Horace and the Devil Doll The specimen, as West repeatedly observed, had a splendid nervous system. H.P. Lovecraft, Herbert West, Reanimator. The lady sounded like she was possessed, Neville said, like that time on The Mysterious Traveler when the demon took control of the archaeologist's girlfriend, the way her voice changed. It was just like that, except she used words you can't say on the radio. His grandpa, Nelson, down in Biloxi at turn 55, he explained, the family was going to call to wish him happy birthday in the evening after the rates went down, but then, during dinner, Neville's sister Octavia broke a glass and cut her foot. Neville's parents took Octavia to the emergency room, leaving Neville home to watch his other sister. Neville got it into his head to call Grandpa on his own, to let him know why they'd forgotten him. It was a foolish thing to do. His father would be mad about having to pay for two calls, even at the lower rate, but Neville had never placed a long-distance call before. And, having just turned 13 himself, he was anxious to start doing adult things. So he picked up the telephone and got connected to the operator in Biloxi. This is Neville Porter. Call him person to person for Mr. Porter, Neville said. The operator, a white woman who sounded old and was perhaps hard of hearing, said, What's the name of the party you wish to speak to? Mr. Porter, Neville repeated. His first name, said the operator. It's okay, Neville told her. It's a private house. There's only one Mr. Porter there. Which is when the demon came out. Now you listen to me good, you goddamn pickaninny, the demon said. If you think I'm going to call a nigger mister, you've got another think coming. What's his name? N -N Nelson, Neville said. The demon mocked his stammer, then made him apologize and address her as ma'am, before finally putting the call through. By then, Neville didn't even want to talk to his grandpa anymore. Didn't want to talk to anybody. Why didn't you just hang up? Curtis asked. On the operator, I mean, not your grandpa. I couldn't, said Neville. It would have been disrespectful. So? She was disrespectful to you. And what's she going to do about it anyway from a thousand miles away? She's not a thousand miles from my grandpa. What if she really got mad and talked to the other operators down there? You think he'd ever get a phone call again? Curtis reared back in outrage. They can't do that. It's Mississippi, stupid, Neville said. They can do whatever they like. Horace, walking beside them, nodded his head in agreement. My dad was telling me about this one town down south. One year, the Negroes started up a drive to get people to vote, 
so the highway department shut down all the roads between the colored section and the courthouse. Cutting off someone's phone would be nothing compared to that. Well, I'd sue if they cut off my phone, said Curtis, whose father was a personal injury lawyer. Sue, Neville said. You think you could sue? My God, how ignorant are you? You can always sue, Curtis insisted. Not in Mississippi, you can't. The law's not for colored people, not down there. Sue. Neville shook his head in disgust. Wind up hanging from a telephone pole, most likely. Well, you don't have to sound so happy about it, Curtis said. I'm not happy. I'm wise, Neville replied. You should try it sometime. In the distance now, they could see a bright yellow awning that marked their destination, White City Comics Emporium. Neville, continuing to shake his head and muttering, Sue, sped up, running to catch two other boys who were making the same after-school pilgrimage. Horace stayed with Curtis. Don't let Neville make you feel bad, he said. I hear these kinds of stories all the time from my dad, and I know they're true, but some of them are so crazy, it's like I don't even want to believe it. You know Joe Bartholomew? Pirate Joe? Curtis nodded. Sure. You know he lost his eye in a car accident when he was little? Lost his mom, too. And my dad, he told me Mrs. Bartholomew probably didn't have to die, but the hospital where they lived in Alabama wouldn't treat colored people. They had to call an ambulance from another hospital, like 70 miles away, and by the time it got there, it was too late. For real? Curtis said. I mean, I know it's all segregated and everything, but even if you're dying? That's what I asked my dad, Horace said. You know, did they at least try calling the White Hospital just to see if they'd make an exception? Pirate Joe's mom was a school teacher, so I thought maybe. But my dad said Jim Crow doesn't work like that. Man, Curtis fingered his coat above his appendix scar. You ever been yourself? Down south? No, never yet. That's kind of funny in a way, your dad being a travel agent and all. A safe travel agent, Horace reminded him. I tried to go. A couple years back, my dad went down to Atlanta on business, and I asked to come along, but my mom said no. She was probably worried about what would happen if you got in a car wreck or if your asthma acted up. One day I'll go, Horace said. Before I move to New York and start working in comics, I want to see this out for myself. You could come with me if you like. Meet Jim Crow face to face? No, thanks. I think I'd rather stay home and be ignorant. Hey! Hey, you kids! The call, raspy and low, came from a boarded-up storefront they'd just passed. A white man stood grinning in the open doorway, he wore a rumpled suit and sported a five o'clock shadow, like a businessman who'd started to go feral. You kids want to make some money? He said. One of you come here a second. I'll give you a dollar. A dollar for what? Said Curtis. I want to rub your head. What? Horace squawked. Just come here and let me rub your head. The man held up his right hand, curled loosely into a fist and shook it. They heard the rattle of dice. For luck. Neville, who hadn't abandoned them after all, came rushing back. Be wise, he hissed, pulling Horace and Curtis away. Don't stop. You're really not coming in, Neville said. I can't, Horace said. I promised my dad. Looking through the front window of the comics emporium, he could see that Mr. D'Angelo was back minding the store. A week ago, when Horace had come here with Reginald Oxbow, Mr. D'Angelo had been out sick, and the substitute clerk had stared at them the whole time they were in the store. Then, when they come up to the cash register to make their purchases, he'd made them take their coats off to prove they weren't shoplifting. That evening, Horace's uncle had come over, and during dinner, Horace mentioned what the clerk had done. Uncle Montrose was incensed. You still bought comics from this guy after he treated you that way? Well, yeah, Horace said, then tried to explain that since the clerk didn't own the store, they weren't really buying from him. But the distinction was lost on Uncle Montrose, who shot Horace's father a look that said, What are you teaching this boy? So now the shop was off limits, until his father found time to come down and have a talk with Mr. D'Angelo about his employee. Horace knew it could have been worse. Uncle Montrose would have skipped the talk and gone straight to a permanent boycott. If you could go in, Curtis asked him, You know what you want to get? 
Horace shrugged. I was thinking the new Superboy. I was thinking about getting that, too, Curtis said, nodding. Anything else? Mostly, I just wanted to look around, you know, see what came in this week. Watch us through the window, then. If I see anything good, I'll hold it up. Neville and Curtis went inside, and Horace stood by the window, stamping his feet to keep warm. He hadn't been standing there long when he heard someone come up behind him. Thinking it might be the dice man, Horace raised a protective hand to his scalp, but when he turned around, there were two white men there, both clean-shaven. The one on the left opened his coat to show the police star in his vest. Horace Barry, he said. I'm Detective Noble, and my partner here is Detective Burke. We have some questions for you. They took him to a diner down the street. Dismissing the waitress with a flash of their police stars, the detective sat Horace in a U-shaped booth and crowded in beside him. Detective Noble was on his left and Detective Burke on his right, close enough that he couldn't move without bumping into one of them, yet far enough apart that he had to constantly swivel his head to maintain eye contact with whichever of them was speaking. Adding to his discomfort was a customer with a cigar who was sitting at the counter directly across from the booth. When Horace noticed the cloud of smoke rising above this man's head, he felt his lungs start to clench up, and he knew that to avoid an asthma attack, he'd need to breathe slowly and keep calm. Difficult under the circumstances. So, Horace, Detective Noble began, the reason we wanted to talk to you is because we think you can help us with an investigation, Detective Burke said. We'd like to know what you can tell us about this. Detective Noble placed a copy of the Interplanetary Adventures of Orithea Blue on the table. You recognize it? Horace picked up the book. It was issue number 11. The Christmas special. It was wrinkled and torn, and the ink on the front cover had smeared. The back cover was soiled with a muddy tire track. It was found at the scene of an accident, Detective Noble said. Accident? Is my mom okay? Your mom? said Detective Burke. She's fine, as far as we know. What makes you ask about her, said Detective Noble. Nothing, said Horace. He lowered his eyes and pretended to be interested in the tire track. Detective Noble jabbed two fingers under Horace's chin and tilted his head up. Horace, listen to me, he said. You don't want to lie to us. You really don't, Detective Burke agreed. There's no future in it. I'm going to let you in on a little secret, said Detective Noble. Cops, smart cops, a lot of times when we ask a question, we already know the answer. But we ask anyway, because we like to know whether the person we're talking to is cooperating or trying to fuck us, Detective Burke said. You're not trying to fuck us, are you, Horace? Detective Noble said. No, Horace said, but I don't, I don't know what this is about. You don't need to know what it's about, Detective Burke said. You just need to answer our questions. But, added Detective Noble in a gentler voice, we could probably tell you a little, just to get things off on the right foot. He looked at his partner. We can tell him a little, can't we? Detective Burke shrugged. Maybe a little. Sure. Detective Noble turned back to Horace. It's about connections, he said. The past few months, Detective Burke and I have been running a surveillance detail. You know what that is? You're watching somebody. That's right. A man named Caleb Braithwaite. You familiar with that name, Horace? Horace shook his head, conscious of the two detectives studying him very intently now. Well, Detective Noble said, we've been keeping an eye on Mr. Braithwaite and on people he associates with. People like your cousin Atticus and your Uncle Montrose, and your dad. My dad? What? And because we like to be thorough, the detective continued, we've also been looking at people who might be associated with Mr. Braithwaite, even if we've never actually seen them together. Your mom, she'd be in that category. So that's the first thing. The second thing, said Detective Burke, is this accident. A shooting accident, Detective Noble said but with complications. Yeah, weird ones, said Detective Burke. Three men dead, two more missing, and signs of at least one person who fled the scene. And this, 
tapping her finger on the comic book, was on the ground near the victims. Now this happened in Wisconsin, outside our jurisdiction, Detective Noble explained. But the authorities who are looking into it are friends of our boss, and they like to trade favors and share information. So they ended up showing him this comic book, which they couldn't make heads or tails of. Ordinarily wouldn't have meant anything to us either, Detective Burke said. But this is where the part about the connections comes in. Orithea Blue. That's an unusual name, said Detective Noble. Orithea was a queen of the Amazons. Not a very famous one, though. These days, the only Amazon most people have heard of is Wonder Woman. And if they know an Amazon queen, it's probably Wonder Woman's mom. What was she called again? Hippolyta, Detective Burke said. That's right. Hippolyta with an E on the end but you can also spell it with an A. Orithea Blue, Detective Burke said. Hippolyta Berry. Interesting coincidence. And it gets more interesting, Detective Noble said. If you know, like we do, that your mother used to be Hippolyta Green. Blue and green, Detective Burke grinned. Both colored women. We also know your mother goes on a lot of road trips, Detective Noble said, and we know she was out of town on the night of December 21st, which is when this thing in Wisconsin happened. We wouldn't have figured her for a comics fan. But then your teacher, Mrs. Freeman, told us. You talked to Mrs. Freeman? Like I said, with her oh. Mrs. Freeman told us you're quite the little artist. So you see where this takes us, Detective Noble concluded. And now that we've shared all this with you, Horace, it's time for you to start sharing back. This is your work, right? No point in denying it. Yes, sir. You gave this to your mother before she left on her trip? Horace nodded. Do you know where she went? Minneapolis? So she would have driven through Wisconsin? I guess. And what happened? I don't know. As Detective Burke suddenly leaned into him. I don't. You know something, Detective Burke said. She said, she says she lost it. When? When she got back, Horace said. At Christmas. She asked me if I took the book out of the car, and I said I didn't, and she said she must have lost it. She was worried. He regretted the words as soon as they were out of his mouth. But she wouldn't... Wouldn't what? Wouldn't do anything bad. Maybe not on her own, Detective Noble said. But if Mr. Braithwaite asked her to do something for him... I don't know any Mr. Braithwaite. I... Calm down, Horace. We believe you. But see, now we've got this problem. Detective Burke and I need answers. We could just go ask your mother directly. But if she is working for Mr. Braithwaite, she might not want to talk to us. And that could get ugly, Detective Burke said. Fast. We'll do what we have to do, Detective Noble said. But what I'm thinking, maybe you could talk to your mother for us. Be subtle about it. Ask her if she ever found that missing comic book, and then see if you can get her to tell you about her Minneapolis trip. And when you've gotten what you can about that, Detective Burke added, try mentioning Mr. Braithwaite's name. Maybe say you overheard your dad talking about him. See how she reacts. And then come back to us, Detective Noble said, and tell us all about it. What do you say, Horace? You think you could do that? He wanted badly to say no. Beyond not wishing to betray his mother's confidence, Horace sensed that this was all a play act and that the detectives had already decided what they were going to do. If their plans included hurting Horace's mom, nothing he did or didn't agree to would change that, in which case he should refuse them and suffer the consequences with his dignity intact. But he wasn't nearly brave enough to do that, and just the thought of saying no triggered another warning spasm in his lungs. I can try, he said, the words coming out wheezy. I can try talking to her. Detective Noble looked sad. Oh, Horace, he said. You disappoint me. We warned you not to lie, Horace, Detective Burke said. I'm not lying, Horace said. I'll talk to my mom, I'll... But then he broke off, coughing. The customer with a cigar had gotten up from the counter and was approaching the booth, preceded by a heavy reek of smoke. So, the cigar man said. 
Sorry, Captain Lancaster, Detective Noble told him. I don't think Horace is going to play ball with us. He thinks he can pretend to go along, said Detective Burke. Trick us into letting him go, then run home to warm Mommy and Daddy. All right, then, Captain Lancaster said. We'll do it the other way. He drew on the cigar, and as the tip flared, Horace felt a twitch start in his left eye. Stand him up, the captain said. The detectives grabbed Horace's arms, lifting him out of his seat and over the top of the table. Horace kicked and tried to scream, but his lungs wouldn't give him the air. And then, as he was set down on the floor outside the booth, he saw it didn't matter anyway. The waitress and the diner's other customers had all disappeared. He was alone with the detectives, the captain, and the burning cigar tip. Horace whipped his head around until he was dizzy, determined to present a moving target, but Lancaster's intent wasn't to blind him. Instead, he held the cigar in his right hand and then spat thickly into his left. He jammed the cigar between his teeth, then clapped his hands and began rubbing them together briskly. Horace stopped moving as he saw what looked like steam jetting from between the captain's palms. Then the captain said, Hold his head still. And Horace started struggling again. But Detective Burke dug his fingers into the back of Horace's skull, and the captain reached out with his hot, spit-slicked hands and massaged Horace's scalp as though determined to rub away every last ounce of luck he possessed. That night, he had the dream about the heads. It was an old dream. Back when Horace was seven, he'd taken a ride with his uncle to a warehouse in Gary, Indiana. The place was a giant junk shop that specialized in second-hand industrial equipment, and Montrose's bosses had sent him to look at a used printing press. While Uncle Montrose conducted his business, Horace explored the warehouse's collection of spare machine parts. Larger items sat out openly on shelves or on the floor, while smaller objects were gathered in wooden crates. The crates were themselves secondhand, and some still bore the labels for the produce they had originally contained. As he wondered, Horace began making up a story about a grocery store for robots, a metal grocer that sold lettuces made of fan blades and stone fruits that were vacuum tubes, and the shadows at the back of a low shelf he spied a crate labeled Georgia Nigger Heads. The words were accompanied by a cartoon of a freckled and buck-toothed Negro boy. In what might have been someone's idea of a joke, the portion of the label showing the boy's body had been torn away, leaving only the grinning head and the wide-brimmed straw hat. A white man hunting for something along the same row of shelves saw Horace staring at the crate. They're watermelons, the man told him. Little watermelons about the size of your noggin with dark rinds and woolly bits around the stems, so that's what they call them, niggerheads. You can eat the seeds. Riding home that day, Horace fell asleep in the car and dreamed that he was in the produce section of a big supermarket, facing a display stand on which colored boys' heads were stacked in a tidy pyramid. The heads themselves were not that scary. They weren't severed heads, just heads that lacked bodies. They were alive and didn't appear to be suffering, most of them looked bored or were asleep. The unnerving thing was that none of the customers in the store seemed to find them at all remarkable. They pushed their carts past the display without a glance, or if they did look, they regarded the heads with indifference, as if they really were nothing more than a bunch of watermelons. Horace kept wanting to speak up, to point out that no, in fact, these were boys' heads. But at the same time, he was afraid to draw attention to himself certain that something awful would happen if he did. The dream had recurred many times since then, usually when he was anxious about something. In more recent versions, his own head was often part of the display. This time, Horace's head remained on his shoulders, but the faces of Neville, Curtis, and the Reverend Oxbow's son Reggie all looked out from the pile. It was after hours. The supermarket's lights were turned down low, and there were no customers, which Horace couldn't recall ever having been the case before. Nervously, he looked towards the rear of the store. There was something moving around back there, making furtive noises in the shadows. Whatever it was, Horace knew instinctively that he didn't want to meet it face to face. He needed to get out of here. But when he looked to the front of the store, there was no exit door, just a line of opaque, milky white windows. Lights shining from outside cast the silhouettes of two men against the glass. The detectives, Burke and Noble, waiting in the parking lot. If he broke a window to escape, they'd grab him. Just get a good running start, 
Horace told himself. Bust right on through and keep going. They won't expect that. He took his mark and was about to go when something made him glance at the heads again. Neville and Curtis and Reggie were all looking at him imploringly. Don't leave us, their faces said. Don't leave us behind. The thing from the back of the store was coming closer now, scuttling up an aisle towards the produce section. Horace searched frantically for something to carry the heads in. On a low shelf underneath the counter heaped with peaches, he saw a wicker basket. But when Horace tried to grab it, it slid back out of his grasp. He crouched and leaned forward, cheek pressed against the front of the counter, arms reaching blindly into the shelf. The lights went out. Something shifted above him, and a peach tumbled down and burst, rotten and slimy, on his shoulder. Chorus gave a cry of disgust and scrambled backwards to escape the avalanche of peaches that followed. He raised his arms defensively, expecting something to come flying at him out of the darkness. Then he realized there was a weight on his shoulder that was more than just the remnant of the burst peach, a weight on both his shoulders. Strong hands reached up from behind and clapped over his ears, gripping tight. Twisting, Horace screamed himself awake then, but not before feeling his head turned completely around and yanked from the top of his spine, as neatly as a ripe piece of fruit being harvested from the vine. When he came out to breakfast, his parents were arguing. Horace's mom had made last-minute plans to drive to New York to see her mother over the weekend, but Horace's dad had been counting on her to fill in for Victor Franklin at the Grand Boulevard Travel Office while Victor was in Philadelphia at his sister's wedding. Ordinarily, Horace would have stayed out of it, but if Mom was going out of town alone, which it sounded like she was determined to do, he needed to warn her about the police being after her. He tried to tell her yesterday. After the detectives had let him go, he'd run straight home. His scalp had been on fire, as if the captain's spittle were laced with battery acid, and as soon as he got in the apartment, he'd stuck his head under a cold faucet. The burning subsided, but there was a residual itch that no amount of soap and water could get rid of. The itch in his scalp was mirrored by an itch in his throat and lungs, as he discovered over the course of the evening. Any attempt to tell his mother or his father about his encounter with the police caused the itch to flare up. He'd get a few words out at most, and then start coughing. The more he tried to talk, the harder he coughed until he was hacking like a hairball-sick cat. He'd hoped a night's sleep might cure him. Instead, the itch seemed to have progressed to a more advanced stage, where even thinking about talking was enough to set it off. I don't see what has to be me, his mother was saying. Can't you get Atticus to do it? Atticus won't be back from Michigan until tomorrow morning, his father said, and I imagine he's going to want to sleep when he gets in. Cough. What about Quincy, then? I need Quincy at the Douglas office. Why can't you just wait for Victor to get back on Tuesday and go see your mother then? Because the weather's supposed to turn next week, and if there's a blizzard, I can't go anywhere. Cough, cough. Horace reached for his drinking glass. George, his mother said, I just need to be on the road a while. You know how I get. I've been feeling cooped up lately. You've definitely been feeling something, and not just lately, his father said. Is there something you haven't? Horace coughed explosively, spraying milk all over his scrambled eggs and a good portion of the table besides. Good Lord, his mother said. Horace, said his father. You all right? No, he wasn't. But it was beginning to sink in that he wasn't allowed to say so. Horace was one of a rotating crew of boys who ran deliveries after school for Rollo Danvers Corner Grocery. He worked three or sometimes four days a week, earning a flat nickel for each delivery run, plus whatever he got in tips. Usually, he tried to get in quick and snag the first run of the afternoon. But today, Horace let the other boys go ahead of him. So he could have some time to finish up a project, he'd started in class. His parents had reached a compromise— his mother was minding the Grand Boulevard office today and tomorrow and would leave for New York tomorrow night, while his father got someone else to fill in on Monday. Meanwhile, Horace, seeking to pass a warning to his mom without speaking it aloud, had decided to encode his message in a comic. A straightforward note might have seemed more sensible, but Horace was used to communicating this way. He didn't have time to do a complete book, 
so he concentrated his effort on a single page-sized illustration. Orothea Blue was front and center, cruising through open space, distracted by the contents of the as-yet-unfilled thought balloon beside her head, following close behind her, playing to see if only she'd look in the rear view were a pair of vicious bounty hunters. Horace had spent a lot of time on the bounty hunters' faces. The artwork was done. What he still had to figure out was what the two bounty hunters were saying and what Orothea was thinking. He sat in the little back room of the grocery, sketchbook on his knees, trying to come up with the right words. Always the hardest part for him. His scalp continued to itch, which made it difficult to concentrate. He scratched his head furiously to buy himself a few seconds' relief and lowered the tip of his pencil to Bounty Hunter Noble's dialogue balloon. Horace. He looked up, thinking Rollo had spoken to him, but Rollo was at the front counter, talking to a customer on the phone, and there wasn't anyone else in the store right now. Horace looked back down in his sketchbook and looked up again. This time it wasn't a sound, but a feeling. The uncomfortable sense of being stared at. A high shelf on the wall opposite him held rags, brushes, and a variety of cleaning products, including a canister of old Carolina metal polish that Rollo used to shine the cash register. The canister was illustrated with a drawing of a Negro butler, a lesser sibling of Uncle Ben and Aunt Jemima, whom Horace had dubbed Cousin Otis. There was something wrong about Otis, something vaguely sinister in the geometry of his face that suggested, to Horace at least, that behind his servile grin, he was plotting to do away with the family whose silverware he cleaned. Horace had used a sketch of Otis as the basis for Iago, the homicidal android bellhop from Orothea Blue No. 9. Today Otis seemed to have a bit more life in his eyes, and his gaze, ordinarily focused on the sparkling teapot in his hands, was directed outward, so that the weight of his grinning malice fell on Horace. Ridiculous. But once the thought was in Horace's head, he couldn't get it out. Otis was eyeballing him. Horace turned his chair around and scooted it back beneath the overhang of the shelf. He resettled the sketchbook on his lap and tried, again, to concentrate. He'd just gotten an idea and was touching pencil to paper when he heard a soft scraping on the shelf above him. A trickle of dust sifted down onto the sketchbook, speckling the page. Horace stared at the specks while his scalp crawled with imaginary dust mites. Then the scraping came again, louder. Horace tilted his head back, lifting a hand to shield his eyes, and a bottle of drain cleaner hit him in the chest. He jumped out of the chair, dropping his sketchbook and pencil on the floor, and flattened himself against the far wall. Up on the shelf, Cousin Otis's canister remained exactly where it had been, though Otis's grin seemed just a bit wider, as if to say, What's got into you, boy? Horace? Rollo called. You're up. Outside in the cold, the itch in his scalp turned to an icy prickling that generated waves of free-floating paranoia. As Horace lugged his delivery basket down streets stained pink by the lowering winter sun, he found his anxiety fixating on seemingly random objects, like a playground seesaw, whose lengthening shadow resembled that of an emaciated and headless giant. Rollo had given him four deliveries to make, the last of which was to Mrs. Vandenhoek, a ninety-year-old Dutch woman who'd been in Washington Park since back when it was still a mostly white neighborhood. She lived alone in a house surrounded by brick tenements. Delivering to her was an exercise in patience. She seemed to spend most of her time upstairs, and when you rang the buzzer, she'd throw up a window and peer out, not speaking, just squinting suspiciously, like a near-sighted castle guard deciding whether to lower the drawbridge. Eventually she'd come down and unlock what sounded like half a dozen deadbolts on the front door. She never brought money with her on the first trip, and no matter the weather, she wouldn't let you in the house. Instead, she'd make you wait outside while she put her groceries away and went to whatever remote hiding place she kept her cash in. Horace imagined a cellar vault three or four levels down, guarded by Dutch-speaking trolls. After you'd had a chance to reflect on the fleeting nature of youth, she'd return to the door, opening it this time with a chain on, and hand you what she owed for the groceries, plus a dime tip. Today, conscious of the rapidly approaching sunset, Horace broke protocol and asked Mrs. Vandenhoek if she'd like him to bring her groceries inside for her. She gave him one of her squinty-eyed looks, like he'd offered to come in and cut her throat, 
and then carried on as she always did. As she headed for the vault, Horace put down his basket and turned nervously in place, scratching his head, until his anxiety found a new target to seize on. Mrs. Vandenhoek's Christmas display. The display, which appeared in Mrs. Vandenhoek's yard in late November and typically remained out all winter, consisted of a wooden manger scene, warped by time and weather, and a knee-high statuette of the Dutch Santa, Sinterklaas, who rode a white horse and had a hat shaped like the Pope's. And between Sinterklaas and the manger was a second statuette that could have been mistaken for a lawn jockey in Renaissance garb. This was Black Pete, the dark-skinned elf who worked as Sinterklaas's enforcer, spying on and punishing bad children. Horace had learned about Black Pete not from Mrs. Vanderhoek, but from Rollo, who'd served in World War II and had traveled around Europe after the fighting ended. In December 1945, he'd been in Amsterdam and had awakened one morning to find the streets swarming with men in blackface. They were hitching rides on military jeeps, Rollo said, so it's like the army of minstrelsy invaded. Mrs. Vandenhoek's Black Pete looked like an actual Negro, not a minstrel player, but he also, Horace noted now, looked a lot like Cousin Otis, around the eyes and mouth at least. After trying and failing to unsee the resemblance, Horace shifted position until his view of Black Pete's face was eclipsed by the head of Sinterklaas's horse. A minute passed. Horace stamped his feet and blew into his hands and scratched his head and wished Mrs. Vandenhoek would hurry up. Then he felt eyes on him again. He looked at the Christmas display and saw that Black Pete had come out from behind the horse. Horace tried to convince himself that he was the one who had moved. But the problem with that was that Pete hadn't just shifted back into view. He'd also turned, so that instead of facing the street as he normally did, he was now staring and grinning directly at Horace. The sudden blare of a car horn made Horace look away. It was only for a second, but when he looked back, Black Pete wasn't there anymore. The prickling on his scalp crept down to the back of his neck. He started to turn around, and something that felt very much like a tiny leg hooked him behind the ankle. He toppled over backwards and sprawled, shrieking on Mrs. Vandenhoek's front walk. The front door of the house popped open, and there stood Mrs. Vandenhoek, squinting angrily, her fist clenched tight around the grocery money and the dime tip that Horace strongly suspected he wasn't going to get now. As for Black Pete, he was back beside Santa Claus his face all innocence, except for the faint hint of a smirk that only Horace's eyes could see. On Saturday, Curtis and Neville brought the devil doll to the church. The Mount Zion church had been a synagogue before the neighborhood changed, and before that, it had been a meeting house for some austere denomination of white Protestants. The building lacked a steeple, but it did have an attic, accessible through a steep, narrow stairway behind the altar too low-ceilinged to be useful for anything but storage. For years, the attic had been abandoned altogether, until Reggie Oxbow prevailed upon his father to let him turn it into a clubhouse. The attic was Reggie's personal fiefdom, but his lordship came at a price. He was expected to look after his little sister, June, whom everyone called Bug. Bug and her friends were allotted a small portion of the attic near the stairs, while the rest of the space was reserved exclusively for Reggie and his friends. They played a lot of games up there. Mrs. Oxbow ran the charity shop in the church basement, and Reggie and Bug got first crack at any toy donations. Reggie had amassed an impressive collection of used board games. The boys made up games, too, scrounging pieces from duplicate Monopoly sets. For the past few weeks, they'd been obsessed with a game they called Krieg. Krieg was short for Das Kriegspiel, the war game. Horace had found the manual in a box of foreign language books at Thurber Lang's bookstore. The text was in German, but from the illustrations, he deduced that this was a set of rules for reenacting the campaigns of Napoleon with dice and tin soldiers. Horace had enlisted Rollo, who still had some German from his own time at war, for help with the translation. He took the translated rules to Reggie, who was initially cool to the idea, saying, without irony, that he wasn't interested in playing Napoleon. It was Curtis who turned Reggie around by pointing out that they could keep the bones of the rules intact while changing the game's subject matter and so the war horses and ships of Europe became thoats and flyers of Barsoom, and the continental powers became various races of Martian. And Greek was born. Their first game had the Red Martians, under John Carter, defending the twin cities of greater and lesser helium against a combined force of green, yellow, and black Martians. It was a lopsided battle, 
but it was also a big hit, especially with Reggie, whose Green Martians spearheaded a crushing victory over Neville's Reds. That Saturday, when Reggie and Horace came up the stairs to the attic, they found Neville and Curtis putting the finishing touches on a new scenario, set up on and around the cardboard boxes they used to represent the Martian terrain, was a combined force of plastic army men, toy vehicles, chess pieces, checkers, and Monopoly and Parcheesi tokens. Ordinarily, these would have been broken out into separate, opposing battle groups, but today, they were united against a singular foe, an ugly black doll that Horace had never seen before. What the heck is that? Reggie said. Behind him, Bog looked up from a solitaire game of chutes and ladders and intoned solemnly, It's the devil. According to the box in which it had come, and on which it now stood, like a splay-toed statue on its pedestal, it was a fully posable African pygmy devil doll. A midget witch doctor, eighteen inches in height, its oversized head accounting for at least a third of that. The doll's hair was woven into short braids, weighted with bits of bone, and another, larger bone was shoved sideways through its nose. Its eyes were deep-set under woolly brows, and its mouth was open in a thick-lipped, toothy leer from which a sharp red tongue protruded. Its bare arms and chest were covered in ritual tribal scars. A miniature skull hung on a thong around its neck, and another capped the medicine stick it wielded, and dangling like a pocket watch from the belt of its grass skirt was a tiny shrunken head. It was hideous to the point of being comical, but in the manner of a clown, that might not be so funny after dark. Indeed, Horace's first thought on seeing it was to imagine what it would be like to find the doll hiding under his bed or lurking in a closet. Probably not funny at all, in that circumstance. Isn't it cool? Neville said. I dug it out of a trash bin behind the thrift store near my house. Didn't cost me a nickel. What'd you bring it here for? Reggie said. You forget this is a house of God? Neville rolled his eyes. Church is downstairs, he said. Besides, added Curtis, this isn't really a devil. It's a robot. A what now? A robot, Neville said, built by Ross Thavis, the mad red Martian scientist, to fool the green Martians. It's made up to look like a giant Martian tribal spirit, but Tars Tarkas figures out it's really a machine, and he gets John Carter to round up all the other Martians to go fight it. It's got 350 battle points. Curtis explained, so it's real hard to kill, and it's got all kinds of special weapons, like disintegrator rays out of its eyes, said Neville, and a death stump. What are you talking about? Reggie said. It's a battle, Curtis said. A new one. We made it up. No, no, no. We're not doing any new battle today, especially not with some devil doll. We're doing a siege of helium. We've done that one, like a million times. Yeah, because it's fun. Fun for you, maybe, said Neville. I'm sick of it. Yeah, Reggie, Curtis said. Let's try this today. It'll be good, you'll see. Nah, no way. Reggie stepped onto the battlefield, scattering Martian infantry with his own version of the death stomp. Let's get this set up for helium and get that devil doll out of here. Uh-uh, said Neville. And then he and Reggie were bumping chests and yelling, while Curtis tried to separate them. Ordinarily, Horace would have been in the middle, too, but not this time. He was too busy staring at the devil doll. Neville had nudged the devil doll's box in passing, and the doll had tottered and nearly fallen over. It didn't just not fall, though. It caught itself, ankles and knees flexing beneath the grass skirt to bring it back into balance. As the boys shouted at each other, the doll swiveled its big head around to glare at Neville's back and raised its medicine stick as if to hex him. Hey, guys, Horace tried to say. The devil doll's moving. But what came out of his mouth was a wordless wheeze. The doll heard him, though, and swung its head back his way. As it locked gazes with him, he saw what looked like sparks dancing around its eyes, precursor to a disintegrator blast, perhaps. And then his scalp was burning again, worse than ever, and his lungs were burning, too. Curtis was the first to notice his desperate whoops for breath. Horace, he said, while Horace clutched at the roof beam above his head and with his other hand tried to point, thinking, Look! Look! Look at the doll! But none of them would look, except maybe Bug, who he thought he heard gasp right before he passed out. Then the devil doll wagged its medicine stick and its eyes flashed. 
Horace's own eyes rolled up in his head, and he swooned, crushing armies beneath him as he fell. He woke up in a hospital bed. It was dark outside the window, and the only light on in the room was a small bedside reading lamp. Horace, at first seeing only the dim ceiling above him, feared he was back in the supermarket with the heads. He sat up gasping. Easy, his father said. He leaned over from his chair beside the bed and squeezed Horace's shoulder. How you feeling? Weird. His lungs felt raw, but he touched the top of his head as if the true discomfort were there. What happened? You choked up and nearly stopped breathing, George said. Reverend Oxbow decided not to wait for an ambulance. He threw you in his car and got you to the emergency room double quick. Horace nodded, flashes of memory coming to him now, of being carried semi-conscious through the cold, of concerned faces leaning over him, of a needle going into his arm and a mask being placed over his face. Then he remembered the devil doll. Horace? His father said, alarmed by the expression on his face. Horace? You okay? He reached for the buzzer to call the nurse. I'm all right, Horace said. I'm sorry, I just, I'm okay. You sure? Horace made himself nod. Then he asked, where's mom? On her way to New York. Already? He started to get agitated again. I thought she wasn't leaving till tonight. She wasn't. But this morning we had another conversation about whether the Grand Boulevard office really needed to be open today. She'd been gone about an hour when the Reverend called me. Did she take the drawing I made for her? I don't know. I didn't pay attention to her packing. We should go home, Horace said. We should be there in case she calls. Whoa. George put a hand on Horace's shoulder again. Doctor wants you to stay here overnight, just in case. But if Mom tries to call us, she's not going to call tonight. You know your mother. It's when the phone does ring that you got to worry. She'll check in tomorrow sometime, and you'll be home by then. Someone went running by in the hall outside. Horace turned his head at the sound. You're staying here with me tonight, right? Yeah, of course. Horace? You sure you're okay? I'm fine, Horace said, continuing to stare into the hallway. I'm just tired. He went home in the morning. Curtis and Neville came by to see him after church. They brought a get-well card from the Oxbows and a bag of Mrs. Oxbow's ginger cookies. Reggie would have come over too, Curtis said, but he's grounded. Grounded for what? Horace asked. He hit Bug and knocked her down the stairs, Neville said. She's okay, just a little bruised up, but the Reverend was not happy. What did Reggie do that for? Bug wrecked the clubhouse, Curtis explained. Neville and I took a look, and we could see why Reggie was mad. It's like she went crazy up there. All the games dumped out on the floor, kicked around and stomped on. She even busted out one of the windows. That doesn't sound like Bug, Horace said. Yeah, she says she didn't do it, or any of her friends either. But who else? Of course, Bug might not have done all of it herself, Neville added. What do you mean? The devil doll, Curtis said. It's gone. Reggie says Bug stole it. But that's not what happened, said Neville. Reggie just didn't want to play that battle. He must have got rid of the doll after we left yesterday, then decided to blame it on Bug after what she did. They stayed for an hour. Cora spent the rest of the day reading, and from time to time, getting up to stare out the front window at the street below. That night his mother called from New York. Her trip had been uneventful. She had taken the comic that Horace had made for her, though she hadn't looked at it yet. But she'd read it on her way home, she promised. She felt guilty for not being there when Horace was sick and said she was thinking of cutting her trip short. Horace was torn on that, part of him wanting her to come home right away, another part wanting her to stay where she was safe. I'm okay, he told her. Don't worry about me. It wasn't even eight o'clock yet when he got off the phone, but his father told him it was time for bed. He needed his rest. Horace got into bed, but he didn't sleep. He lay in the dark with his eyes open until he heard his father go into his own room. Then he got up quietly and went to check that both the kitchen door and the front door were locked and bolted. He went to the parlor window and looked down at the street again. He looked for a long time. Eventually, 
Horace slept, but he dreamed that he didn't, that he just went on checking doors and windows all night. By the time morning arrived, he was exhausted. His father, seeing how tired he was at breakfast, offered to let him stay home from school. But Horace thought it would be more restful to be out among other people than home alone. He told his dad he wanted to go. All right, but you take it easy, George said. No deliveries today. You come straight home. At school, he tried to talk to Reggie about the devil doll, but Neville and Curtis must have gotten to Reggie first because he was in no mood to discuss it. It wasn't me, it was Bug, he said. Now leave me alone. That evening, his father had a Freemasons meeting to go to. I was thinking of skipping it, George explained, but your Uncle Montrose has something he wants to talk to me about. We might go out after. I got Ruby coming to stay with you while I'm gone. I don't want any arguments. I know you think you're too old for a sitter, but I don't want you by yourself tonight. Horace didn't make any arguments. Ruby came over at seven. Horace was glad to see her, and not just because he didn't want to be alone. He'd always liked Ruby. He felt like she was one of the few adults, other than his parents, who took his artistic ambitions seriously, neither dismissing them as fantasy nor offering false assurances. Making a living at comic books would be hard, she said, and he might well fail. But if it was what he wanted to do with his life, he shouldn't let anyone talk him out of trying. They sat in the kitchen and drank hot chocolate and played Scrabble. Ordinarily, this would have been heaven, but Horace couldn't stay focused. He kept getting up to go check the front door and look out the parlor window, and the third time he was gone long enough that Ruby called out to make sure he was okay. He came back to the kitchen and managed to sit still for ten whole minutes, but then he thought he heard something out on the fire escape. He got up and opened the door and poked his head out. There was nothing there. Nothing in the alley either. Not that he could see. When he sat back down at the table, Ruby said, What's got into you? Horace looked at her. His lungs were fine right now, but he could feel the asthma just waiting to rise up and stifle him the minute he said the wrong thing. Horace? Is this something you want to tell me? Horace breathed in and breathed out. He shook his head. He looked down at his tile rack. O E L C Z P I. He shuffled the letters around. P O L I C E Z. He breathed in and breathed out. He looked up and saw that Ruby was still watching him, and without pausing to think about it, he said, Ruby, can I tell you a secret? His lungs tightened up at the end of secret, but the question was already out. Sure, Ruby said. You can tell me a secret. You can tell me anything you like. For the next thirty seconds or so, he couldn't do anything but concentrate on getting air. Then his lungs unclenched, but not all the way, and Horace knew if it happened again, it would be much worse. He kept his tongue still. He removed the Z from the tile rack and turned the rack around so Ruby could see the other letters. That's what your secret's about, Ruby said. Horace breathed in and breathed out. He nodded. Ruby lowered her voice and asked, You worried somebody might be listening? Horace shook his head. But you don't want to say it out loud. Horace nodded. All right. Ruby dumped her own tile rack on the board and dumped out the tile bag, too. Then she shoved all the letters over to Horace's side of the table. Spell it out for me. It didn't take very long. He spelled out detectives and asked me and Mom's Christmas trip and Wisconsin and a few more words and phrases. But as soon as he got to Braithwaite, they switched to a 20 questions format with Ruby who had always been a good guesser, seeming to know exactly what to ask. Horace nodded fervently, shook his head a few times, did a couple more spell-outs, and then, the bulk of the secret having been spilled, he felt his asthma back off and found that he could speak. He filled in a few more details. He didn't tell her everything. He told her about Captain Lancaster rubbing spittle on his head and some of how that had affected him. But when he came to the part about Cousin Otis and Black Pete, and especially the Devil Doll, Horace balked, thinking it would sound too crazy. So instead, he just said that in addition to his asthma problems, he'd been feeling strange and having weird dreams. 
You believe me, right? Yeah, of course I believe you, Ruby said. Horace slumped with relief. Then he said, What am I supposed to do? I want to help Mom, but I don't even know what this is about. You just sit tight, Ruby told him. I know someone who can help. You do? Who? But Ruby shook her head. That's going to have to stay between me and me for now. When'd your mom get back from her trip? She hadn't decided last I talked to her. Maybe tomorrow night? All right. So you don't need to worry about her, Ruby said. You just keep your own head down. Once your daddy comes home, I'll get in touch with my friend. I should be able to reach him tonight. But if not, I'll be talking to him tomorrow for sure. And he'll know what to do? He'd better, Ruby said. You just be careful going to school tomorrow, and after, after, I got work, Horace said. I had to skip today, but I promised Rollo I'd be in tomorrow. All right, tell you what, Ruby said. You go to Rollo's, and I'll meet you there. But you keep your eyes peeled on the street, Horace, and if you see those two detectives coming, or that Captain Lancaster, you run the other way. Don't worry about getting in trouble, either. Just do what you need to to get clear, and we'll sort it out later. Okay? Okay. Suddenly Horace was blinking back tears. Thank you, Ruby. I've been so scared about this, and I didn't know what I was going to... This time they both heard it. A thump, like a heavy footfall, out on the fire escape. Ruby put a finger to her lips and pointed at the switch on the wall behind Horace. He got up and flipped the lights off. Ruby rose silently and went to the sink, leaning forward to look out between the burglar bars that covered the window. What is it? Horace whispered, but Ruby gestured for silence. She grabbed a knife from the drying rack and stepped to the door, at the same time motioning Horace back into the hall. She opened the door and went out, and Horace covered his face with his hands. But after a moment, Ruby came back inside, shaking her head. Nobody, she said. Nobody there. By 6.30 the next evening, Ruby still hadn't showed. Horace had finished his last delivery run 20 minutes ago. Rollo told him he could go home, but he lingered instead, loitering at the front of the store so he wouldn't have to play stare-down games with Cousin Otis, and so he could keep an eye on the sidewalk. Coming back from this last run, he'd caught a glimpse of a small black creature, something that might have been a cat or a large rat darting underneath a parked car half a block behind him. Now, staring out the window, he found himself fixated on a patch of darkness beneath a blown street lamp across the way. You plan to keep fidgeting like that? Rollo said, looking up from the Zane Grey novel he was trying to read. Sorry, Horace said. Can I use the phone, Rollo? Long as it's local. He dialed the number Ruby had given him, but it just rang and rang. Then, on impulse, he called home. But there was no answer there, either. He tried the travel office number and got the after-hours answering service. No message, he told the woman. He hung up and stood gnawing his lower lip. His father had mentioned that he might go run an errand after work. Horace hadn't thought much of it, because he'd assumed Ruby would be with him. But now his imagination went to work, and he pictured going up the stairs to the dark apartment alone. The phone rang, making Horace jump. Rollo gave him a look and picked up. Dan was grocery. Rollo Dan was speaking. He listened a moment and reached for his order pad. Yeah, we deliver here, he said, scribbling down an address. Is that a house or an apartment? Okay. And that's all you want? Sure, no problem. And what name is this order for? Hello? Rollo frowned then shrugged and hung up. Rollo tore the top sheet from the pad and reached behind him to get a pack of Chesterfields. He slid the paper and the smokes across the counter. Delivery over on South Park Way, he said. You can just go home after and bring me the money tomorrow. Horace stared at the cigarette pack, his mind on the dead street lamp outside. I don't know, Rollo, he said. You don't know what, said Rollo. Horace raised a hand to his head. Scratched. Nothing, he said. Fifteen minutes later, he stopped beneath the street lamp to check the address on the order sheet. To his left, across a two-lane avenue, 
stretched the 370-acre park that gave the Washington Park neighborhood its name. A few sparks of illumination were visible back among the trees, but this section of the park was mostly unlit, and the impression was that of standing by the shore of a vast, dark lake. It wasn't the park he was concerned about. As he returned the paper to his coat pocket, he looked back along the sidewalk in the direction he had come, paying particular attention to the curb line beside the parked cars. Like the last dozen times he checked, there was nothing to see. He continued walking south, scanning a row of narrow townhouses. At the end of the row, he found the number he was looking for. It was spray-painted on a plywood slab that had been used to board at the house's front door. Horace stared at the condemned notice, pasted it to the wooden slab, and thought, Maybe Rollo wrote the number down wrong. But the prickling of his scalp told a different story. With a glassy pop, like a flashbulb exploding, the street lamp he'd just been standing under blew out. Horace turned towards the sound, his gaze going automatically to the curb by the foot of the lamppost. Nothing there. But then he lifted his head and raised his hand and scratched, and for a moment his vision blurred. And when it cleared again, he saw a red eye glowing in the darkness. No, not an eye. A cigar. Captain Lancaster was standing beneath the lamppost, his brutish face wreathed in smoke and illuminated by the glowing coal. There was something unreal about him, a waxwork stiffness that made him seem less a man than a mannequin. But he was no less frightening for that. Run the other way, Horace heard Ruby say. He turned around, and the street lamp on the corner to the south went out. As if the light had switched on rather than off, another figure sprang into view. Detective Noble. Horace. He jerked his head to the right. Detective Burke had materialized on the front steps of the condemned townhouse, almost close enough to touch. Like Lancaster, he seemed posed, stiff as a scarecrow, but there was life in his eyes, and he was grinning Cousin Otis's grin, the expression even more disturbing on a white face. Horace retreated in the only direction he could. As he backpedaled into the street, headlights washed over him, but his eyes remained fixed on Detective Burke. Then the driver of the car speeding towards him leaned on the horn, and Horace whirled and leapt out of the way, his book bag flying up behind him. The car, which never slowed, clipped the book bag in passing, sending it whipping around to smack Horace in the face. He staggered across the far curb and into the park. From under the trees, he looked back. The captain and the two detectives had been swallowed up by the gloom, and Horace could see nothing moving on the darkened street. But there was definitely something there, making furtive noises in the darkness. Coming closer, he turned and sprinted deeper into the park, making for a spark of lamplight up ahead beyond the trees. By the time he reached it, he was winded and overheating. Horace shrugged off his book bag and leaned against the lamppost, which cast its icy white light over a frozen playground set. He unzipped the front of his coat. He breathed in and breathed out, hearing nothing now but the sound of his own labored respiration. With a creak of wood and metal, one of the seesaws moved, an invisible weight pushing one end down, a clump of snow sliding off the other end as it rose up. As Horace came off the lamppost, a wind he couldn't feel set the swings moving. The roundabout was next. With a groan, it started turning on its own, slowly at first, shedding chunks of snow and ice as it picked up speed. Horace stared at it, transfixed by the moving shadows of the metal grab bars. Something landed with a thump on the far side of the rotating platform. Horace watched the devil doll come riding around, its little hand clinging to one of the grab bars. As it jumped down, he took a step backwards and tripped over his book bag. He fell on his back in the snow, and for a moment, he was eye-level with the devil doll, now running straight towards him. He rolled and kicked away the book bag and scrambled back up. A footpath ran beside the playground, and on the other side of it was a little cement blockhouse marked restroom. Horace made a dash for it, praying that it wouldn't be locked. It wasn't, but when he got inside, he discovered that that was because the lock was broken. He put his back against the door and braced himself, at the same time casting around wildly for a weapon or a way out. He found neither. The restroom was a windowless concrete cell, just large enough for a sink, a urinal, and a toilet stall. It was lit by a yellow incandescent bulb, 
set above the empty mirror frame over the sink. The bulb flickered as Horace looked at it. A heavy blow struck the door at Horace's back. He dug in his heels. More blows fell, making the door jump in its frame, but Horace held firm and it didn't open. There was a pause. What came next was a light scratching. A small sound, but like fingernails on a blackboard, it sent shivers up his spine and set his scalp crawling. Horace gritted his teeth and shut his eyes. Not getting in, he thought. The scratching stopped. He opened his eyes. There was someone in the toilet stall. Beneath the wooden partition, Horace could see a pair of men's shoes and a frayed pair of trouser cuffs. Hey, kid, a voice said, raspy and low. You want to make a dollar? No way, Horace thought. Uh Uh-uh. But the stall door creaked open, and there stood the dice man. His five o'clock shadow had become a patchy beard, matted with filth. His hair and clothes were filthy, too, and he reeked as if he crawled up a sewer pipe to get in here. His skin was red and cracked and covered in scabs. Let me rub your head, he said, holding out a diseased hand. For luck. Horace shrank back. You're not real, he wheezed, but the dice man took a shambling step towards him, and Horace rounded in a panic and tried to push out through the door, forgetting that it opened inward. Then he heard another step behind him, felt scabby fingers brush his scalp, and he yanked the door wide and bolted into the open air. He was barely through the doorway when his feet tangled, and he belly flopped. He banged his chin on a hard patch of ice, sending sparks shooting up behind his eyes. More ice and snow pressed against his sweat-soaked shirt, instantly sucking the heat from his body. But it wasn't just the cold ground that froze him. As his vision cleared, he found himself practically nose to nose with a devil doll. In the stark white lamplight, its skin looked pale, and its tribal scar stood out in sharp relief. The bones in its hair gleamed, its eyes glowed a dull red, and as it caught and held Horace's gaze, it began to sway in a sort of dance, a hypnotic witch doctor dance. Get up, Horace told himself. It's just a stupid doll. You're a giant compared to it. Get up. Get up and stomp on it. But he couldn't move. Not a muscle. And he wondered whether the devil doll would stop his heart now or just hold him like this until he froze for real. Then the doll raised its medicine stick, holding it overhand with the bottom end pointed at Horace's face like the tip of a stabbing spear. Horace felt that twitch start in his eye again. He thought of Pirate Joe, sitting half blind in a car wreck in the land of Jim Crow, his mother dying beside him and help not coming. Not in time. Not in that country. A despair, colder than the ground on which he lay, engulfed him. But he felt a hot spark of anger, too, at the unfairness of it, and his rage displaced his fear, the spell holding him weakened. In that same moment, he became aware of the chunk of broken brick under his right hand. The devil doll danced towards him, jabbing at his eyes, and Horace brought his arm around and smashed it with the brick. The doll went flying, and the spell was broken. Horace sprang to his feet, clutching the brick and ready to do battle. But the doll, already recovered, looked up at him and hissed. Horace's anger turned to ash, and his courage blew away like smoke. And then he was running again, racing down the footpath with the devil at his heels. He could feel his lungs puffing up, and he knew where this was going, but he couldn't stop. The path curved sharply, and Horace saw streetlights up ahead. He'd looped back around to South Park Way. Thoughts of home, where his father, and perhaps even his mother would be waiting by now, filled him briefly with hope. But another figure loomed in the path. A white policeman. Not a captain or a detective, but a uniformed beat cop. His beady eyes fixed on Horace running towards him. Hey, champ, the policeman said. Where you going so fast? Not real. Horace thought, and kept running. But the policeman stuck out a foot and sent Horace sprawling. I said, where's the fire? The policeman stood over him as he lay gasping on the path. Where you running from, huh? What did you do? Horace flopped onto his side. He saw the devil doll, standing in a circle of lamplight back of the bend in the path. 
He tried to point, but the policeman grabbed him roughly under the arms, lifting him up and slamming him back against a tree. What are you running from? The policeman demanded. Horace, unable even to wheeze now, raised his arm and gestured feebly, thinking, look, look, look. But the policeman went on asking the same question, getting more and more angry. The doll tilted its head to one side, and Horace saw the policeman tilt his head to one side. The doll lowered a hand to grip the shrunken head dangling from its skirt. The policeman dropped a hand to his belt and unsnapped his gun holster. Then Horace's full attention was on the policeman as he drew his revolver and cocked it. I'm going to ask you one more time, the policeman said. What did you do? Horace's mouth opened and closed uselessly. The muzzle of the revolver became the center of the world. Then the scene seemed to telescope as an invisible cable attached to the policeman's back yanked him into the air and sent him flying into the trees on the far side of the path. Horace slid to the ground. He still couldn't breathe, and he wondered, a blackness darker than night boiling across his vision, whether he'd been shot after all. If this was what that felt like, a warm hand pressed against the center of his chest and his lungs unclenched. He jerked upright, drawing in air in a ragged gasp. Another white man was crouched beside him, a young man in a suit. Easy, the man said. Easy now. Sorry to put you through this, but I needed to lure it out into the open. Shifting his hand slightly, he patted the cigarettes in Horace's coat pocket. Hang on to these for me. He stood up leaving Horace at the base of the tree, still sucking in fresh oxygen, and turned towards the devil doll, which had come down the path and now stood less than a dozen feet away. The doll had its arms up and was waving its medicine stick menacingly, but the white man seemed more amused than threatened. He bent down and picked up the doll by its braids and held it suspended in the air with its legs kicking. Fascinating, Caleb Braithwaite said and then gripping the devil doll with both hands, he ripped off its head. Once again, Horace was made to hold still while a white man massaged his scalp. At least he was in more pleasant surroundings this time. At home, in the kitchen, with his dad sitting at the table beside him, and his mom standing by the sink with her arms crossed, Caleb Braithwaite finished his examination and sat back. It's a mark, all right. Surprisingly high level of artistry, too. Horace's mother didn't care about the level of artistry. Someone put a mark on our son's head. Braithwaite nodded. There's a branch of the art that deals with bringing inanimate objects to life. Dolls, statues, corpses occasionally. It's not one of my specialties, but I know Hiram Winthrop made a study of it. It looks like Lancaster has, too. This is more than I would have expected of him. I don't understand. Horace's father said. What's any of that got to do with a mark? The mark is a catalyst, Braithwaite explained. You could think of it as a kind of opportunistic curse. It uses the subject's own senses and emotions to find an object to animate. Ideally, something the subject is afraid of. And what it animates tries to kill you? Horace said. That's the general idea. Your lucky Lancaster made the mark with saliva, Braithwaite told him. Marks made in blood are much more potent and almost impossible to remove. He reached into the bag he'd brought with him and pulled out a silver flask. He uncapped it and soaked a handkerchief with the contents. A sharp, vinegary smell filled the room. This will sting a bit. He leaned forward and scrubbed Horace's scalp with a handkerchief. It did sting, but it also made Horace feel better. He breathed easier than he had in days. But why? George wanted to know. Why would Lancaster go after Horace? It's his way of sending me a message, Braithwaite said. Lancaster thinks I'm planning to betray him. And he's right. But as it happens, the particular incident that set him off had nothing to do with me. He glanced over at Horace's mom. On Solstice night, your wife trespassed on a piece of property controlled by an ancient Dawn Lodge in Wisconsin. Apparently, Lancaster thinks she was acting on my orders. George turned to his wife. Hippolyta? What's he talking about? What did you do? 
Don't you look at me that way, George Barry, Hippolyta replied. How long have you known Mr. Braithwaite here and not said anything? George opened his mouth and shut it again. We'll talk about this later, he said. Yes, Hippolyta said, we will. The point is, said Braithwaite, Lancaster thought I was making a move. When he couldn't get your son to act as his spy, he decided to kill him, in part to punish your wife for conspiring with me, but more as a way of letting me know that he was on to me. Which is good news. How do you figure that? George said. If Lancaster were really worried, he'd have tried to kill me, not your son. The fact that he's playing games means he thinks he can still dominate me. Braithwaite smiled. He's made the same mistake about me that Hiram Winthrop made about my father. He's underestimated me. So now what? You're going to kill him? Not me, Braithwaite said. Us. The Mark of Cain Now art thou cursed and banished from the land, which hath opened its mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield thee its strength. A wanderer and fugitive shalt thou be on the earth. Genesis chapter 4, verses 11 and 12 They gathered at the Freemason's temple in the late evening, under cover of a light but driving snowfall. George and Hippolyta and Horace were the first to arrive. His parents' attitude was solemn, but Horace could barely contain his excitement at being admitted to the secret meeting room. He gazed in wonder at the two Solomonic pillars, the altar with its copies of the Holy Bible and the Koran laid out side by side, and sitting forgotten and gathering dust in a corner, the scale model of King Tut's tomb. Is this a game? Horace asked of the model. But his father didn't answer, and his mother said only, Remember what I told you. Pirate Joan Abdullah came next, followed by Mortimer Dupree. Atticus, Letitia, and Montrose showed up together a few minutes later. Last to arrive was Quincy Brown, the lodge door warden, who took up his post outside the room, armed with a sword. The sword was ceremonial, but Quincy, who'd been captain of the Sabre team at Wayne State, could handle himself quite well with it. And tonight, he had a pistol in his pocket for good measure. The others sat facing one another beneath the Pillars of Solomon, like wizards embarking on a ritual whose outcome was far from certain. Montrose went first. He told the story of how Caleb Braithwaite had contacted him last June, and how he'd been lured to Artem and chained up in a cellar. Then Atticus took up the tale, describing his own journey to Artem with George and Letitia, and what happened when they got there, when Samuel Braithwaite and the Sons of Adam had been reduced once more to piles of ash, Letitia took her turn, explaining, with no small amount of pride, how she'd come to be the landlady of a haunted house. Her mood soured when Atticus added his coda about who the Winthrop house really belonged to. Letitia had learned the truth herself less than twenty-four hours ago, and she was still upset that Atticus hadn't told her sooner. She wasn't the only one angry at having been kept in the dark. Hippolyta fumed as George recapped the Freemason's trip to the museum to retrieve the Book of Names. But she was revenged a few moments later with the telling of her own story, which no one but George had heard yet. He wisely kept quiet as she told it, leaving it to Montrose to ask, You went there alone in the middle of the night? Well, Horace said, awestruck, Another planet? For real? Though reluctant even now to betray her vow of silence to Ida, Hippolyta told them everything, for that was the point of this exercise, to share all, as any detail might prove important. In the end, the matter of most immediate concern to her listeners was not the old woman stranded at the far end of the universe, but the five dead white men. Holy God, Mortimer Dupree said. Yeah, George added, breaking his silence. You can see why Lancaster might be feeling paranoid, if he thought Braithwaite was behind that. It's just not paranoia, though, said Montrose. Braithwaite really is double-dealing, and he told the story of the trip to the Narrow House. Hippolyta took the news of Pearl and Henry Jr.'s fate hard. That poor child, she said. Poor Ida. Then it was Horace's turn. As he described how he'd been cursed, stalked, and nearly killed, his excitement once more got the better of him, so that he sounded more thrilled than terrorized by the experience. But the adults' expressions were grave. George finished up, recounting how Braithwaite had cleansed Horace of Lancaster's mark and what he'd said afterwards. So that's where we're at, 
George concluded. Braithwaite's going to war, and he wants our help. He doesn't want our help, Montrose corrected his brother. He expects it. Braithwaite thinks he owns us. Yeah, Atticus said. And even if he does beat Lancaster, that won't be the end of it. He says he'll leave us alone after, but... Has he told you what his plan is? Abdullah asked. Not yet, George said. But he's sending someone to give us our marching orders. He checked his watch. They should be here any minute. Soon enough, there was a knock at the door. George answered it, and Quincy stuck his head in and whispered something that made George say, Who? Then George stepped back, opening the door wide to admit Braithwaite's messenger. Ruby? Letitia said. So they listened to one more story. Ruby described how she'd lost her job, and how on New Year's Eve, seemingly by chance, she'd met Caleb Braithwaite. And you went off night clubbing with him? Letitia said. That's why you didn't come to my party? Ruby gave her sister a look. Tell me again how God wanted you to have the Winthrop House, she said. Ruby's account of the rest of New Year's Eve was heavily abridged and revised. There was dancing and some drinking, but no kissing. And while the night culminated in a job offer, there was no magic potion. He said he worked for the government and he was in Chicago on a special assignment. He said he needed a housekeeper for this safe house he'd set up. Someone who'd be discreet and not mention his name to anyone. Ruby shrugged. It was work. And it paid well. Her description of the job itself was as close to the truth as she could make it without mentioning Hillary. She even told them about some of the errands Braithwaite had sent her on, though in this version of the story, they were patriotic missions whose significance Ruby was left to guess at. The man he had me spy on looked like gangsters, so I figured he must be with the FBI. She finally did get suspicious, though, after he started asking her questions about Letitia. And then a few days ago, while Braithwaite was out of the house, she found the basement door unlocked. Her description of Braithwaite's workshop omitted the glass coffin in favor of a vague assortment of strange devices that seemed more suited to devil worship than government work. There were files, too, Ruby said. He had a folder with Atticus's name on it and another that was all about the Winthrop House. I only started to look at that when Braithwaite came back and caught me. It scared me near to death. But he wasn't mad. He said he'd be needing more of my help soon, and it'd be easier if I knew the truth. So he sat me down and told me his story, his real story. It sounded crazy, like something out of one of Horace's comic books, but it got me to believe it. She looked around the circle. I guess you all believe it, too. So you know what he's up to? George said. What he wants from us? Ruby nodded. Right about now, he's on the phone to Captain Lancaster, setting up a parlay to work out their differences. There's a country club up in Forest Glen that belongs to Lancaster's coven, and Braithwaite's going to offer to meet there tomorrow night. He wants to bring Atticus with him. What for? Atticus said. That's easy, said Montrose. You're the peace offering. Ruby nodded again. Something like that. She looked at Atticus. He's not really going to offer you up, though. That's just a ruse, to get Lancaster to lower his guard a little. And that's where the rest of you come in. She opened her purse and pointed to the altar. May I? George and Abdullah moved the holy books aside. Ruby unfolded a map that showed the layout of Lancaster's club and the surrounding grounds. For the next ten minutes, she explained Braithwaite's plan. That's a lot of moving parts, Pirate Joe said when she'd finished. Yeah, and if one thing goes wrong, we're all cooked, said Mortimer. We're cooked either way, Abdullah pointed out. Even if the plan works, all we've done is give Braithwaite a clear field. I think it will work, Ruby said. I haven't known Mr. Braithwaite as long as some of you, but I've seen enough of him to know he's good at getting what he wants. But I've also seen enough to know that what he wants can't be good. He's likable enough for a white man, but he's... Evil, Montrose said. Yeah, Ruby said. She gestured at the map. So you're right. This isn't enough. We need to get rid of him, too. I think we'd all be on board with that, George said. If we knew how. The problem is that damn immunity of his. If we could get around that. I don't know how to get around it, 
said Ruby. But I know where it comes from. She told them about Braithwaite's mark. Letitia's eyes narrowed. A tattoo on his chest? She said. How would you know about that? I'm the help, not a big shot landlady, Ruby replied. You think he's going to throw a shirt on just because I come in the room? I saw it once when he was shaving, and that's what he said, that it was his mark of Cain and that it protected him. I thought he was joking, but when I found out he was a warlock, this tattoo, said Atticus, it's red, like blood. Yeah. Atticus looked at George. What did Braithwaite say to you? Marks made with blood are more potent and almost impossible to remove. Almost impossible, Hippolyta said, which means it's possible. Yeah, okay, said George, but we still don't know how. No, we don't, agreed Montrose, suddenly thoughtful. But I've got an idea who we can ask. The snow continued to fall. The street outside the Winthrop house was hushed as Atticus and Letitia and Montrose drove up. Inside was a different story. Mr. Fox was on the phone in the atrium, shouting to be heard over a bad connection and over the sound of his daughter skipping rope just a few feet away. In the dining room, Charlie Boyd and a group of friends were engaged in a boisterous card game. Meanwhile, Mrs. Wilkins, awakened not by the noise, but by thoughts of her late husband, was wandering perplexed along the gallery trying to remember where she was. Mrs. Wilkins? Letitia called up to her. You all right? Jeffrey? Mrs. Wilkins responded, her roomy eyes focusing not on Letitia, but Montrose. Jeffrey, are you home? This is Mr. Turner, Mrs. Wilkins, Letitia said. Wait here, she told Montrose and Atticus. She's been getting this way after dark lately. She started for the stairs. Atticus turned to his father. So where do you want to do this, Pop? Basement? It's not up to me, Montrose said, looking at Hecate. He held up the satchel he brought with him, as if to present it to the statue. Mr. Winthrop? I got something here that belongs to you. He undid the catch and opened the satchel, sending a puff of ash up into the air. Got some bad news about your son, too. He drew out the notebooks, sending more ash flying. The motion of the ashes caught Atticus's eye, and he watched, mesmerized, as they whirled more and more slowly in the light, and then stopped completely, frozen in midair. Looking past them, he saw the girl Cecilia, frozen too, both feet off the floor, while a blur of rope hung beneath them. Behind her, her father posed motionless with the phone against one ear, and a hand pressed to the other. In the dining room, Charlie Boyd, mouth open and a now soundless laugh, was caught in the act of slamming a pair of aces down on the table. Letitia's foot hovered over the top riser of the stairs, while Mrs. Wilkins stood paralyzed in confusion on the gallery. Pop, Atticus said, spooked by the sound of his own voice in the abrupt stillness. Are you? Yeah, I'm still here, Montrose said, looking around at the frozen tableau. Guess we don't have to worry about anyone eavesdropping on our parley. They heard the elevator rising out of the basement. It stopped on the first floor, and the gate rattled open. Atticus circled the fountain and approached the empty elevator car. The interior was lit by an overhead lamp that he'd rewired himself, but as he got closer, he noticed another light, tinged red and flickering like hellfire, shining up from below and visible in the gap between the car and the shaft and that corresponded to no device he'd had anything to do with. Um, Pop? It's all right, Montrose said, stepping past him. I've been down this road before. Just don't eat or drink anything. You'll be fine. The next night was cold, but clear. Braithwaite picked up Atticus outside the Winthrop house at the appointed time, and they headed for the northwest side. They spoke very little during the journey. Braithwaite kept his eyes on the road ahead and grinned in self-satisfaction, as if his victory over Lancaster was already accomplished. Atticus, more somber, kept looking into the dangler's back seat as if checking for followers on the road behind them. The moon was just beginning to set as they drove up to the front gate of the Glastonbury Country Club, 
with its prominent members-only sign. The guard in the stone gatehouse acknowledged their arrival by picking up a telephone, but then for a long while, nothing else happened. Braithwaite took the delay in good humor. His only sign of impatience, a light drumming of his fingers on the steering wheel. Atticus looked into the back seat again. Finally, the guard came out and opened the gate for them. Braithwaite drove forward, but almost immediately found the way blocked again, this time by Detectives Burke and Noble. Adopting an impish expression, Braithwaite goosed the accelerator pedal, forcing the detectives to duck aside as the car lurched towards them. Noble managed a graceful sidestep, but Burke slipped on a patch of ice and nearly went down. Atticus, knowing who would suffer for the detective's displeasure, gave Braithwaite a side-eyed look that said, Was that really necessary? And then a thought struck him. They're not immune. Lodges that know the secret of immunity tend to reserve it for the senior membership, Braithwaite said. Keeps the neophytes in line. He added, Don't forget, you're not immune either. I'm not the one making trouble, Atticus reminded him. Noble was at the driver's door now, rapping impatiently on the glass. Braithwaite rolled down his window. Good evening, officer, he said. How can we help you? Get out of the car, Noble said, bending down to look in at Atticus. Both of you. They got out. Burke was waiting on the passenger side to slam Atticus up against the car and frisk him. Noble looked as though he would have liked to give Braithwaite the same rough treatment, but because of Braithwaite's immunity, he couldn't just lay hands on him. If you wouldn't mind, he said, and Braithwaite raised his arms and consented to be searched. Burke shoved Atticus aside and shined a flashlight around the dangler's back seat. Detective Noble opened the trunk. What's this? Noble said, lifting up a dictionary-sized object wrapped in gift paper. A peace offering, Braithwaite said. I told Lancaster I'd bring him Hiram Winthrop's lost notebooks. Noble tore open the wrapping paper. Peace offering, huh? What is it? asked Burke. Noble showed him, and Burke laughed and said to Braithwaite, do you have a fucking death wish? If I do, said Caleb Braithwaite, you won't be the one to grant it. No, Noble agreed. Lancaster will want to do the honors himself. Then he shrugged. It's your funeral. Leave the keys in the car. I'll walk you in. Mind you don't scratch it, Braithwaite said to Burke. Death wish, Burke replied. He slammed the trunk shut then came back around the passenger side, meaning to give Atticus another shove. But Atticus, not wanting to be tempted to hit Burke now that he knew he could, had already started for the clubhouse. As Noble and Braithwaite and Atticus went inside, Burke remained standing by the Daimler, rubbing his chin thoughtfully. Sir, said the gate guard, is everything all right? No, Detective Burke said. I don't think so. He nodded at the Daimler. Get this parked, then get on the phone to the house and get some more men out here. Back gate, too. I'm going to take a walk around the grounds. That asshole's up to something. Hippolyta emerged from the trees as the moon slipped below the horizon. For the last twenty minutes, she'd been making her way through the woods that bordered the country club's golf course. She'd stumbled more than once in the dark, but her sense of direction had held true, and now, looking south across a snow-covered fairway, she could see the clubhouse and, closer to hand, the small outbuilding that was her destination. She heard footsteps at her back as the white woman who'd accompanied her emerged from the woods as well. The woman's name was Hillary, and she worked for Braithwaite. Hippolyta would much rather have had Letitia or Ruby with her, but Letitia had been assigned a different task, and Ruby was back in town somewhere, performing some other errand which she wouldn't describe, but which, she said, was absolutely essential if Braithwaite wasn't to become suspicious, Hippolyta felt for the pistol in her coat pocket and started across the fairway, Hillary at her side. Soon they were close enough to read the sign on the outbuilding. Power and utility. No admittance. According to Braithwaite, there would be at least two men inside, stationed in a control room on the second floor. They'd have a phone to the main house and probably radios as well, and the danger was that in the event of a commotion, they'd have time to raise an alarm. Hence, the white girl. Okay, Hippolyta said as they sheltered on the north side of the building, out of sight of the upstairs windows. 
You know how you're going to get them to open the door for you? I could just knock and ask, Hillary said. But if they're being careful, they might make me wait outside while they call it in. We need to make it so they don't stop and think. So, she shrugged off her coat, revealing a sleeveless black dress more suited to a cocktail party than a trek through the woods. She bent down and tugged off her boots as well, and then, standing in the snow in her stockinged feet, gripped her dress with both hands and tore it. Yeah, Hippolyta acknowledged, seeing where she was going. That'll work. The gate guard set the dameless parking brake and got out. A ten count after the door slammed shut, there was a soft click of a latch, and the rear seat's back cushion swung down, exposing the narrow compartment between the seat and the trunk in which Letitia lay hidden. She got out of the car and crouched beside it as she loosened the drawstring on a velvet bag. Inside was a tapered ebony wand, about a foot long, carved with atomite letters, its narrow end was tipped with a small silver dragonfly that Letitia was careful not to touch. Staying low, she went after the guard, who had nearly reached the gatehouse. She let him get inside, then ran up and banged on the door. When he stuck his head back out, saying, Mr. Burke? She swiped his cheek with the dragonfly. It was the barest of caresses, but the guard's eyes rolled up instantly, and he crashed to the ground, unconscious. Interesting. Letitia said. Detective Noble led Braithwaite and Atticus to a large parlor at the west end of the clubhouse. There they were made to wait again. Braithwaite helped himself to scotch from the bar and sat in one of two chairs arranged in front of a roaring fireplace. Atticus, not needing to be told the amenities weren't for him, remained on his feet, scanning the shelves of a pair of ceiling-high bookcases. Unfortunately, this was one of those decorative pseudo-libraries whose contents appeared to have been chosen purely for the look of the bindings. The hallway door opened, and Lancaster entered in a swirl of cigar smoke. Nice of you to join us, Caleb Braithwaite said. Really, said Lancaster. That's the attitude you start with? He waited for Noble to hand him a scotch, then took the other seat by the fire. So, he said, did you bring that thing you promised me? Detective Noble cleared his throat. He picked up Braithwaite's present from the bar and brought it over to Lancaster. Lancaster set down his drink and put the cigar in his mouth and took the book, a single leather-bound volume in both hands. As he read the gilt lettering on the cover, a comprehensive encyclopedia of Hebrew Kabbalah by Mordecai Kirschbaum, his expression grew pained. He gave the book back to Noble and took the cigar out of his mouth and stared into the fire working his jaw side to side as if trying to find a comfortable position for it. Wow, he said finally. You are just bound and determined to piss me off, aren't you? I couldn't bring you Winthrop's notebooks, Braithwaite told him. I don't have them. I don't fucking believe you, Lancaster replied. And even if I did, it wouldn't excuse this sort of bullshit. Or this he added, reaching into his jacket. He brought out a coin-sized disc of bone engraved with the image of an owl and tossed it on the hearth. Turn about, Braithwaite said. You've been spying on me too. I've been watching your ass because I know you can't be trusted. And you're saying I could trust you. Lancaster reared his head back. Unbelievable, he said. You try to fuck me over and it's my fault? I dealt square with you, asshole. I welcomed you into my city. I was willing to work with you. Of course you were, Braithwaite said, as long as I stayed in my place. What were you expecting? You're a kid, for Christ's sake, not even half my age. You think I'm going to bend my knee to you just because you got a little talent? Who the fuck do you think you are? A better natural philosopher than you'll ever be, said Caleb Braithwaite. Lancaster laughed. Is this the kind of lip you gave your old man? It's a wonder he didn't kill you first. I'll tell you something else, too. I didn't know your father. But Bill Warwick? He was one of Winthrop's apprentices back in the day, and he was there when Winthrop and your dad had their thing. He told me some stories about what a snot-nosed Sam Braithwaite was. So, congratulations. You may have hated your father's guts, 
but it sounds like you're just like him. Atticus had been doing his best to act invisible. But now, seeing Braithwaite's reaction to Lancaster's comment, he allowed himself to smile. Lancaster stiffened and turned to glare at him as if he'd laughed aloud. I'm sorry, Atticus said. Why don't I wait outside while you gentlemen... No. You stay right where the fuck you are, Lancaster told him. Turning back to Braithwaite. Both of you. The guard at the back gate had stepped outside to urinate in the bushes beside the gatehouse. He was zipping up his trousers when a silver dragonfly landed on the back of his neck and he collapsed. Letitia stood over him with her arms raised in a prizefighter's stance. Then she went to open the gate. A van marked Shadow Brook Bakeries that had been waiting down the road drove up and stopped inside the gate. Montrose and George jumped out. They picked up the unconscious guard and put him in the gatehouse. How long is this guy supposed to be out for? George asked. Mr. Braithwaite said he should be dead to the world for three or four hours at least, Letitia told him. And when he wakes up, he won't remember anything he's seen or done tonight. Abdullah had turned the van around and was backing it up to the loading dock behind the clubhouse kitchen. As he switched off the engine, a door at the side of the loading dock swung open, and a dark-suited white man came out. Oh, shit, Montrose said. But it wasn't the van that had brought the white man outside. He had a cigarette between his lips, and his attention was focused on a lighter cupped in his hands. Don't worry, Letitia whispered, brandishing her wand. I got this. Oh, God, sir, please help me, Hillary said. And as the guard threw the door open, she pretended to swoon and fell into his arms. He stumbled back a few paces, regained his balance, and froze feeling the muzzle of the gun pressed up under his chin. Shh, Hillary said, while Hippolyta stepped through the open doorway and moved quickly to the foot of the stairs. Bobby, a voice called down from above. Who is it? Two minutes later, Hillary was handcuffing both guards to a pipe in the ground floor generator room. She tried to act surprised when she turned around and found Hippolyta's pistol pointed at her. Now you, Hippolyta said holding up another pair of cuffs. Without waiting to be told, Hillary tossed her own gun into a far corner of the room. She took the cuffs and had begun to lock herself to a different pipe when one of the guards snickered and said, That's what you get for trusting a nigger, sweetheart. You shut your mouth, Hippolyta said, and then blinked, realizing that Hillary had said it too, in the exact same tone of voice. Hillary answered Hippolyta's look with a shrug. Go on upstairs and don't worry about me, she said clicking her handcuffs closed. George Montrose will be giving the signal any time now. Pirate Joe, Abdullah, and Mortimer made their way through the clubhouse kitchen, stepping over the unconscious bodies of security guards. They paused to rebalance their burden, a large, flat object wrapped in furniture pads, and headed for the ballroom. Another guard appeared out of a side corridor, but Letitia was right behind the man, and she zapped him before he could do anything. The ballroom was unoccupied. They maneuvered past the tables to the open space beneath the chandelier, while Pirate Joe and Abdullah undid the furniture pads, and Mortimer reviewed a diagram on a creased piece of drafting paper. Letitia continued to the far end of the room. The display case had been removed, but the painting remained, and when Letitia pressed the hidden catch on the bottom of the frame, it swung out to reveal a large wall safe. She studied the combination dial and rubbed her fingers together as if preparing to crack it. Instead, she returned to the Masons. Okay, she told them. I'm going back out to make sure I didn't miss anybody. You boys be all right on your own for a few minutes? Yeah, Pirate Joe said, grinning. We should be fine until the shouting starts. Be careful. Lancaster sipped his scotch reflectively. So what do we do now, huh? He said. I suppose I could just send you packing. And keep him. He waved his cigar in Atticus's direction. You could try to do that, Braithwaite said. Lancaster smiled. You think I couldn't run you out of town if I wanted to? But it'd be a shame to lose you now. You've got skill, I grant you that. And a way with words. You could be very useful come Midsummer's Day. If only I could turn my back without worrying you'd stick a knife in it. That is a problem. Yeah. 
but maybe I have a solution. Tell me, that mark I put on the boy, what did you think of that? Technically impressive, Braithwaite acknowledged. Was it really your work? I picked up the basic principles from Bill Warwick, Lancaster said, but the execution was all mine. So, what's your plan? You want to send a toy to chase after me now? No. I've got a different mark in mind for you. Something else Bill was working on. I found it in his files after he disappeared. He called it the Mark of the Beast. As in St. John's Revelation, Braithwaite asked, or a livestock brand. Well, they're kind of the same thing, aren't they? Lancaster said. Bill was always worried about who he could trust. I think that's why he went into Winthrop's treasure chamber alone. Too bad for him. Anyway, this mark. The idea is you put it on people whose loyalty you want to ensure. Then all you have to do is think about them, and you know exactly where they are and what they're up to. And if they're up to no good, you just think a little harder, and they die. And the best part, the mark works on people with immunity. So no one can kill your servants but you, Braithwaite said. He glanced over at Noble. And you know how to do this. Bill was still working on the mark when he disappeared, Lancaster said. I think I've got the last few kinks worked out. There are a couple of questions I was hoping Winthrop's notebooks might help me with, but that's just being conservative. I'm ready to make a live test right now. Braithwaite's smile became dangerous. And you think you can force me to sit still for that? Not me, Lancaster said. Us. Noble opened the hallway door to admit a procession of white men wearing silver signet rings. Atticus recognized one of them as a former city alderman, and there were others, more vaguely familiar, whose faces he must have seen in newspaper photographs. There were thirteen men in all. They formed up in two rows, like an odd-numbered jury. So, Lancaster said, looking from Braithwaite to Atticus and back again, who wants to be first? Montrose and George had gotten onto the roof through a trap door in the kitchen. The chimney they wanted was at the far end of the building. Their route to it was a two-foot-wide walkway running just below the line of the roof peak. It would have been an exciting hike even in summer, but now the walkway was slick with snow and ice. Santa's little helpers, George muttered nervously, to which Montrose replied, Don't go all berry on me. Montrose started off, George followed, and soon, Thanks in no small part to the power of sibling rivalry, they were moving along the roof line with the sprightliness of boys. In moments, they stood above their destination. Montrose tied a rope to the walkway, and they eased themselves down the slope of the roof until they were braced against the chimney side. Then George took a flashlight from his pocket and looked towards the outbuilding, where Hippolyta was waiting to cut the power. Montrose unslung a bag from around his neck and took out a glass bottle filled with a milky white potion. The potion was a concoction of Braithwaite's, but the specific choice of container had been Montrose's idea. No volunteers? Lancaster said. Fine, then. We'll start with you, Braithwaite. He put down his empty glass and tossed his cigar butt into the fire. Noble brought him a knife from the bar, then returned to stand by the door. The men at the Chicago Lodge all fixed their eyes on Braithwaite, the atmosphere in the room grew charged. Atticus tensed, preparing for action. Only Caleb Braithwaite remained relaxed, or seemed to, until suddenly he leaned forward in his chair, stuck two fingers in his mouth, and let out a piercing horse whistle. As the whistle died away, Lancaster sat with his head cocked and the blade poised over his left palm. What was that? he said. Calling for your magic pony. A Coca-Cola bottle came flying down the chimney and shattered. The fire was instantly doused, and white smoke jetted from the hearth. At the same moment, the clubhouse's electricity went out. At the sound of Braithwaite's whistle, Atticus had turned to face the door and committed everything he could see to memory. Now, though blinded by smoke and darkness, he knew exactly what combination of steps would get him out of the room. There was only one obstacle in his path, and it didn't have immunity. As Hippolyta emerged from the powerhouse, she had the wind knocked out of her. 
For one brief, confused moment, she thought she'd just run down the stairs too fast. But then the second punch landed on the side of her head, and she realized she was in trouble. She fell on her side in the snow and tried to reach for the pistol in her pocket, but Detective Burke grabbed her wrist and twisted her arm up and got the gun first. He kicked her in the ribs, flipping her onto her back, and stood watching while she writhed and tried to catch her breath. Well, well, Dorothea Blue, Burke said. What are you doing here? He gave her another jab with the tip of his boot. Who else is with you, huh? George around here somewhere? You didn't bring Horace, did you? He smiled at her reaction to her son's name. No, I guess not. You probably left him with a babysitter tonight. Don't worry, though. I'm going to go check up on him after we're done here. Time doubled back to Solstice Night in Wisconsin. Hippolyta, hearing again that funny double pop as the two dark coats collided with each other. Burke's smile grew puzzled, and he turned towards the open doorway of the powerhouse, even as Hillary stepped up and shot him a third time at close range. Then Burke was on the ground, and Hillary was standing over him, goose flesh breaking out on the freckled skin of her arms. You all right? she asked Hippolyta. Hippolyta, still short of breath, stared in mute fascination at Hillary's bare wrists. Yeah, Hillary said. I brought a spare handcuff key. Thought I might need it. Hippolyta sat up and pressed a hand to the side of her jaw. Something about Hillary seemed terribly familiar to her in that moment. Who? Who are you? Nobody you need to worry about, said Hillary. But can you do me a favor? When you see Mr. Braithwaite, tell him I quit. Then she was gone, running in her stockinged feet through the snow to where she'd left her boots and her coat. Caleb Braithwaite, exiting the parlor a few seconds after Atticus, slammed the door shut behind him and did something that made it not want to open again. As they dashed away down the hall, Atticus could hear the doorknob rattling and fists pounding against the wood. Then the pounding ceased, and a powerful force blew the door straight off its hinges. Lancaster came out, waving away smoke. Noble, blood streaming from his broken nose, was right behind him. Then came the other large members, scattered at first, but quickly reforming into a tight group that followed on Lancaster's heels. They proceeded swiftly down the hall, chasing the sound of running footsteps in the darkness. The sound had just faded away when they stumbled over one of the downed security guards. Quiet, Lancaster hissed. From not far ahead came the sound of an avalanche of pots and pans hitting the floor. Noble started for the kitchen, but Lancaster said, Wait, and then, turning, stepped over to the doors of the ballroom and shoved them wide. At the far end of the room, Atticus was holding a lighter up to the exposed wall safe, while Braithwaite manipulated the dial. They both looked around as Lancaster burst in. You just couldn't resist, could you, you stupid son of a bitch? Lancaster strode forward, unbuttoning his cuffs and rolling up his sleeves. Well, you can forget all about the book now. Forget about being my pet researcher, too. I'm just going to take your fucking head and be done with it. And after Midsummer's Day, when I'm running the show, I'm going to make a special trip to Artem and burn the whole fucking village down. Braithwaite turned and walked forward as though intending to meet Lancaster and his entourage in the middle of the room. He moved more slowly than they did, though. His arms were loose at his sides and his fingers waggled. He might have just been flexing them, limbering up, but viewed from a different angle, the motions were a lot like those a puppeteer would make. As Lancaster passed beneath the chandelier, the tablecloth on one of the tables behind him flipped up, and Mortimer Dupree rolled out from under it. He scrambled forward, unnoticed by the Chicago lodgeman intent on Braithwaite, and used a piece of silvered chalk to make a short, precise stroke on the floor. Changing a letter, Lancaster and Noble and the men of the lodge all stopped short. Like passengers on an L train whose emergency cord had been pulled, they rocked forward and then back, fighting for balance. Even as they steadied themselves, their feet became rooted to the floor. Braithwaite? Lancaster roared. What the fuck is the... Mortimer made another stroke with a chalk. Lancaster's lips continued to move, but his tongue was stilled. Two more tablecloths flipped up. Pirate Joan Abdullah stood and switched on electric lanterns. 
illuminating the great chalk circle that surrounded Lancaster and his companions, and the larger pattern, of which it was a part. To the right, parallel lines connected the big circle to a smaller one, ringing the freestanding door that the three masons had carried in from the van. To their left, a single line, straight at the ends, but zigzagging in the middle, linked to another small circle, currently unoccupied, and stretching out ahead of them, two more parallel lines, drawn so close together that they seemed like one, reached all the way to the base of the wall beneath the safe. I'd say something clever and pithy now, Braithwaite told Lancaster, but I've always been more of a doer than a talker. He took a piece of chalk and drew an outline around the safe door, connecting it to the parallel lines on the floor. Then he went over to the empty circle, where Atticus was waiting with a knife and a rolled up parchment. But when he tried to take these implements from Atticus, Atticus shook his head. I'll do it, Atticus said, and stepped into the circle. He cast a dark look at Lancaster. I owe him for Horace. Braithwaite hesitated, a glimmer of suspicion in his eyes. This ritual isn't without risk, he said. What, as opposed to the rest of the evening? said Atticus. Do me a favor. Still, Braithwaite hesitated. But he could see no angle here, and for once, and not by accident, his intuition failed him. All right, he said. But the rest of you should clear out, just in case. Pirate Joe, Abdullah, and Mortimer went out into the hall. Atticus slid his palms. Braithwaite squatted down and made two strokes with a chalk, granting Atticus the power to both read and utter the language of Adam. The spell was different this time. What came out of the doorway was not light, but darkness, a living dark, like the creature that haunted the Sabbath kingdom would. It swallowed up Lancaster and Noble and the rest of the Chicago Lodge and shot out a thin tendril of shadow to pop open the safe. And then it withdrew, back into the doorway, leaving not even ashes behind. Almost too easy, Braithwaite said, rubbing his hands together as he went to claim his prize. Midsummer's Day, now that's going to be a real challenge for us. Atticus dropped the bloody parchment to the floor. He raised his left arm and stripped down his sleeve, exposing the Adamite letters written on his skin. The black ink he'd used was barely visible, but he could read it just fine now, and he recited the incantation in his head, committing it to memory as he had the layout of Lancaster's parlor. Holding it firmly in mind, he stepped out of the circle. Braithwaite removed the book of names from the safe and verified that it hadn't been damaged. All right, then, he said. Let's get the rest of the family together and get... As he turned around, he was surprised to find Atticus right behind him. But secure in his immunity, he didn't try to duck away, even when Atticus reached out with a bloody palm. What's this now? Atticus answered in the language of Adam. As he uttered the first syllable, he placed his hand on Braithwaite's chest. A great heat burned through the fabric of Braithwaite's shirt. Braithwaite cried out and dropped the book of names. He tried to pull away, but the two of them were already fused together, skin to skin, palm to chest, blood to mark. Atticus went on speaking, while Braithwaite howled and clutched at Atticus's forearm. Atticus finished the incantation. The heat and the pain faded. When Atticus pulled his hand away, there was still a mark on Braithwaite's chest, and it was still a mark of Cain, but a different one. The new, a pun upon the old. Braithwaite fell back against the wall, saying, What? What did you do? And then his legs buckled under him, and he slid helpless to the floor. The ballroom doors opened. Montrose and George and Letitia came in, and Hippolyta and Pirate Joe, and Abdullah and Mortimer. They came and stood beside Atticus, looking down, while Braithwaite jerked and trembled like a man having a seizure. You can't, he gasped, fighting to get the words out. You can't kill me? We're not killing you, Atticus informed him. We're kicking you out. They cleaned up before they left. Mortimer mopped the ballroom floor, while Pirate Joe and Abdullah put the props and equipment away. Hippolyta led a delegation out to the powerhouse. Letitia swatted the two guards with her wand of sleep and forgetting, and Montrose and George, after a brief discussion, wrapped Detective Burke's body in a furniture pad 
and put it in the trunk of Braithwaite's Daimler. They loaded Braithwaite into the back of the van. They got on US-41 and drove south. It was after midnight when they crossed the Calumet River and came to a double road sign reading, Now Leaving Chicago, and Welcome to Indiana. There they turned left, driving onto an open stretch of ground between Indianapolis Avenue and the Pennsylvania Railroad tracks. They drew up the van on the Illinois side of the border. Letitia parked the Daimler just across the state line and left the keys in the ignition. Atticus and Montrose dragged Caleb Braithwaite out and dumped him unceremoniously beside his car. As soon as he was beyond the Chicago city limits, Braithwaite began to recover his strength, and within moments, he was standing up on his own. Hippolyta retrieved a road atlas from the van's glove compartment. She handed it to Atticus, who walked it over to Braithwaite. Horace couldn't be here to say goodbye, Atticus said, but he made you a going-away present. From now on, George explained, you'll want to steer clear of the areas marked in red. It shouldn't be too much of a burden, added Hippolyta. Most of the country is still open to you. As long as you don't make any detours through Detroit or Philadelphia or Harlem, you should get home just fine. Braithwaite was shaking his head. You can't, he said. You can't do this to me. Can and have done, Atticus said. Mr. Winthrop sends his regards, by the way. He was very grateful to get his notebooks back. Winthrop, Braithwaite said. Winthrop told you how to do this? Yeah, Atticus said, and you should be grateful, too. My pop had a different end in mind for you, and I was leaning that way myself. I'll show you gratitude, Braithwaite promised. He turned to Letitia. You and your tenants are going to have to find a new place to live. As soon as I get to a payphone, I'm calling in a demolition crew to turn the Winthrop house into a pile of rubble. Oh, I don't think so, Mr. Braithwaite, Letitia said. It's not your property anymore. She's right, said Atticus. I stopped by Mr. Archibald's office this afternoon, paid off Letitia's contract in cash. You paid it off? Braithwaite looked at George. With the money I gave you. With our money, Mr. Braithwaite, George said. Our money. For a moment then, Braithwaite was speechless with anger. His face reddened and his hands holding the atlas trembled, but he mastered himself quickly. Fine, he said. Keep the house. Keep the money. But the book, he looked at Atticus. Let me have the book of names. I don't think so, Atticus said. Abdullah? No, Abdullah said flatly. I'll pay you for it, Braithwaite said. Name a price. Not for every last dollar you have, Abdullah told him. It's for the flames. There you go said Atticus. But don't feel too bad, Mr. Braithwaite. The truth is, the book wouldn't do you any good anyway. That new mark on your chest, it doesn't just bar you from physical locations. You're out of the brotherhood as well. What are you talking about? You're not a sorcerer anymore. You still have your immunity, in a more limited form, but you'll find your other powers are gone, and trying to get them back or learn new ones will only make you very sick. You're allergic to natural philosophy. Braithwaite refused to believe him at first, but then he looked inside himself and tried to call up some of those other powers, and his expression changed from denial to dawning horror and desperation. No, he said. No, Atticus? Atticus, come on, you can't. Can, Atticus said, and have done. He turned to go. Braithwaite made a grab for his arm, but Atticus pulled free easily, and then a wave of weakness and nausea sent Braithwaite stumbling backwards. Atticus, he cried. Atticus, please. You need me, Atticus. Standing once more among his family and his friends, Atticus looked back and lofted an eyebrow. I need you, he said. I think you might want to check a dictionary, Mr. Braithwaite. You think this is over? Just because Lancaster's Lodge is destroyed? Braithwaite said. It's not over. There are other lodges all over America. They know about you now, and they'll be coming for you, but not like I did. They won't think of you as family or even as a person, and they won't leave you alone until they get what they want from you. 
no matter where you go. You'll never be safe. You... But he had to break off. For suddenly, Atticus burst out laughing. Letitia and George and Hippolyta and the others laughed too. Even Montrose, who up to now had been feeling surly about the fact that Braithwaite was getting away alive. They roared laughter. What? Braithwaite shouted, looking at them as if they were crazy. What's so funny? But for a long while, they were laughing too hard to answer. Oh, Mr. Braithwaite, Atticus said finally, wiping tears from his eyes. What is it you're trying to scare me with? You think I don't know what country I live in? I know. We all do. We always have. You're the one who doesn't understand. Still laughing, they got into the van and drove away. Caleb Braithwaite remained standing out in the cold long after their taillights had vanished into the distance. Half an hour later, when the Indiana State Trooper rolled up, he was still standing there, slack-jawed in the dark with a map book in his fist, like a lost traveler trying to work out just where and how he'd gone wrong. Epilogue. 1955. A new year is upon us, and as always, we pause to give thanks for the advances of the last twelve months. The just ruling of the Supreme Court in Brown v. Board of Education. News that the desegregation of our armed services is, belatedly, completed. And other victories, less heralded, but no less vital. We continue to look forward to the time, not far off now when all travelers are treated as equals. And until that glorious day, we resolve to stride forth boldly, prepared for whatever challenges the road ahead may bring. The Safe Negro Travel Guide, Spring, 1955 edition. Sure, I can ask him, Letitia said, but I can't promise he'll do it. I'd be willing to trade favors with him, within reason, said Hippolyta. They were sitting in Hippolyta's kitchen on a morning in early March. On the table between them lay a sheet of paper on which Hippolyta had drawn an eight-by-eight eight array of boxes. A handful of the boxes had been filled in with numbers, tentatively in pencil, but most were still blank. Letitia touched a finger to the paper. You sure about this? The woman did try to kill you. She was trying to protect her daughter. And you think she's going to thank you for bringing her the truth about what happened to Pearl? No, probably not, Hippolyta acknowledged. But it doesn't seem right to just leave her out there. Maybe, Letitia said. She glanced at the other papers on the table, brochures and application forms for the University of Chicago and two other schools farther afield that offered courses on astronomy. Tell me something, though. How much of this is just you wanting another crack at that machine? Hippolyta smiled. If I could have that portal here in the house with no guards around it? She paused, recalling a harsh red alien sunrise. And Scylla. Well, I'd still need to be careful, but in that case, sure, I'd love to do some exploring. As it is, I can't see making a habit of it. Just one more time. Letitia was skeptical, having heard those words on other people's lips. But, she said, all right. I'll talk to Mr. Winthrop, see if he'll give me the combination. Thank you, Hippolyta said. I'd appreciate it if you didn't mention it to George. Yeah, I figured. Don't worry. Hippolyta got up to pour herself more coffee. So how's Ruby doing? If you see her, maybe you can tell me, Letitia said. She hasn't been around? 
She was in church last Sunday, but she ran out at the end of the service before I could talk to her. I think she's mad at me. What about? Letitia shrugged. She's feeling sorry for herself, I guess. Getting rid of Mr. Braithwaite cost her another job, so it's like she got punished for doing what had to be done. She got punished, and you got the Winthrop house. I told her I'd share it with her, Letitia said, but Ruby didn't want that. Ruby doesn't know what she wants. That's the real problem. But that's not my fault. Life's just not fair sometimes, you know? It's not fair. But what are you going to do? She waited in the building lobby at noon, her red hair freshly cut in a modified Amelia Earhart style. She wore stockings this time, along with a new dress and shoes bought specially for the occasion, and her purse was a new set of ID that she'd obtained, at no small expense, through a former business associate of her father's. Miss Lightbridge, she said, as the woman stepped off the elevator. Excuse me, Miss Lightbridge? Joanna Lightbridge looked warily at this stranger, smiling at her like an old friend. I'm sorry, have we met, Miss Hyde? Hillary Hyde. And no, you don't know me. I'm sorry to ambush you like this. I tried to make a regular appointment, but your receptionist told me I'd have to meet with one of your assistants. And while I'm sure they're very good, it's you I wanted to talk to. She opened her purse and brought out a folded newspaper clipping. I read the interview you did with the Tribune last month. It's very inspiring. I certainly wouldn't call it that, Miss Lightbridge said, her expression sour. I'm not sure I'd even called it an interview. The reporter was very rude to you. Those questions about why you weren't married, I thought that was inappropriate. But your answers were good, and I could tell there was more you were trying to say. Maybe more that you did say, that he just didn't write down. A postman entered the lobby from the street, pushing a hand truck loaded with packages. The two women moved aside to make way for him and ended up standing closer together. Miss Lightbridge, I lost my mother a little over a year ago, she continued, and since then, I've been through some other changes. I won't bore you with the details, but it's made me realize I'm just not satisfied with the kind of work I've been doing. I'm not married, and I'm not looking to start a family anytime soon. I know a lot about what I don't want, but not much about what I do, and it seemed to me, reading your interview, that you've been through something similar in your life. Now I know you're very busy, but I was hoping you could spare me just a little time to maybe point me in the right direction. Give me a sense of how to start looking for what I'm looking for. Joanna Lightbridge was smiling now. Miss Hyde, is it? She said. Hillary, please. Hillary, have you eaten? No, I haven't. I'd be happy to buy you lunch. That's all right, Hillary. Lunch is on me. Georgia thought at first to go with something bulky and obvious, the kind of safe that takes a team of men to move, but Montrose pointed out that even inch-thick steel won't stop a thief from putting a gun to your head or your family's heads and demanding the combination. So Georgia let Montrose take one of his filing cabinets over to a machine shop and trick it out. The top two drawers still function normally. They contained the field reports for West Virginia, Wisconsin, and Wyoming. But the bottom two were a false front, a hinged panel that swung open to reveal a two-and-a-half-foot-tall safe bolted to the floor. Is that really $300,000? Horace said as he stared at the stacks of bills in the safe. Less than that now, George told him. But still, plenty to pay for your college and Ophelia's kids' college, too. And yours, Montrose said, looking pointedly at Atticus. And Mom's, Horace put in. Yeah, hers, too, said George. And whatever's left after that, well, we'll see. But if you still want to be a comics publisher when you get done with school, maybe we'll arrange a business loan. Really? We'll talk after you've got your diploma, George said. But until then, Horace. You can't tell a soul about this, understood? Understood, Horace said. George closed up the safe and the false panel, and the four of them returned to the front office. Cartons containing the spring 1955 edition of the Safe Negro Travel Guide were stacked up against the wall. George thumbed through a loose copy, inhaling fresh ink and wondering, as always, how much longer it would be before he could cease publication 
and changed the name of the business to the plain old Barry Travel Agency. A few more years, probably. Before you go, he said, turning to Atticus, I've got some new leads I'd like you to check out. Where at? Memphis, plus a tourist home across the river in Arkansas. Sure, Atticus said. I can take a run down this weekend. Can I come? Horace said. I don't think so, said George. You've got homework this weekend, don't you? I can do it in the car. Also, it's Jim Crow country. I know, Horace said. Jim Crow ain't an amusement park ride, Montrose said, recognizing the boy's tone. I know, Horace said. But I've got to see it sometime. He looked at his father. I'll be 13 next month. George and Montrose exchanged glances. Then Atticus spoke up. I'd be willing to take him, if you'll let me. And you could come too, Pop. Me, Montrose said. Yeah, you, said Atticus. You can make sure Horace draws the right lessons from what he sees, like you did for me. And I know I'd enjoy the company. Montrose scowled, but he didn't say no. I'd feel better if you did go, George offered. I'd come too if I weren't busy. Come on, Pop, Atticus said. Yeah, all right, Montrose said. But I'm driving. We hope you have enjoyed this unabridged production of Lovecraft Country, a novel by Matt Ruff. Performed by Kevin Kennerly. Presented by HarperCollins and Harper Audio. Executive producer, Iris McElroy. Text copyright 2016 by Matt Ruff. Production copyright 2021 by Blackstone Audio, Inc. All rights reserved. Thank you for listening.